Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Roger Moline. Preface my purpose in writing this book has been to make a clear statement of the exact present conditions and relationships of the negro in american life i am not vain enough to imagine that i have seen all the truth nor that i have always placed the proper emphasis upon the facts that i here present every investigator necessarily has his personal equation or point of view the best he can do is to set down the truth as he sees it, without baiting a jot or adding a tittle, and this I have done. I have endeavored to see every problem, not as a northerner, nor as a southerner, but as an American. And I have looked at the Negro not merely as a menial, as he is commonly regarded in the South, nor as a curiosity, as he is often seen in the North, but as a plain human being animated with his own hopes, depressed by his own fears, meeting his own problems with failure or success. I have accepted no statement of fact, however generally made, until I was fully persuaded from my own personal investigation that what I heard was really a fact and not a rumor. Wherever I have ventured upon conclusions, I claim for them neither infallibility nor originality. They are offered frankly as my own latest and clearest thoughts upon the various subjects discussed. If any man can give me better evidence for the error of my conclusions than I have for the truth of them, I am prepared to go with him, and gladly, as far as he can prove his way. And I have offered my conclusions not in a spirit of controversy, nor in behalf of any party or section of the country, but in the hope that, by inspiring a broader outlook, they may lead, finally, to other conclusions more nearly approximating the truth than mine. While these chapters were being published in the American magazine, one chapter, that on lynching, in McClure's magazine, I received many hundreds of letters from all parts of the country. I acknowledge them gratefully. Many of them contained friendly criticisms, suggestions, and corrections, which I have profited by in the revision of the chapters for book publication. Especially have the letters from the South, describing local conditions and expressing local points of view, been valuable to me. I wish here also to thank the many men and women, South and North, white and colored, who have given me personal assistance in my inquiries. End of Preface Chapter 1 of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, The Negro in the South. Chapter One, A Race Riot and After. Part One. Upon the ocean of antagonism between the white and Negro races in this country, there arises occasionally a wave, stormy in its appearance, but soon subsiding into quietude. Such a wave was the Atlanta riot. Its ominous size, greater by far than the ordinary race disturbances which express themselves in lynchings, alarmed the entire country and awakened in the South a new sense of the dangers which threatened it. A description of that spectacular, though superficial, disturbance, the disaster incident to its fury, and the remarkable efforts at reconstruction will lead the way, naturally, as human nature is best interpreted in moments of passion, to a clearer understanding, in future chapters, of the deep and complex race feeling which exists in this country. 
On the 22nd day of September, 1906, Atlanta had become a veritable social tinderbox. For months, the relation of the races had been growing more strained. The entire South had been sharply annoyed by a shortage of labor accompanied by high wages and, paradoxically, by an increasing number of idle Negroes. In Atlanta, the lower class, the worthless Negro, had been increasing in numbers. It showed itself too evidently among the swarming saloons, dives, and clubs which a complacent city administration allowed to exist in the very heart of the city. Crime had increased to an alarming extent. An insufficient and ineffective police force seemed unable to cope with it. With a population of 115,000, Atlanta had over 17,000 arrests in 1905. In 1906, the number increased to 21,602. Atlanta had many more arrests than New Orleans with nearly three times the population and twice as many Negroes, and almost four times as many as Milwaukee, Wisconsin a city nearly three times as large. Race feeling had been sharpened through a long and bitter political campaign. Negro disfranchisement being one of the chief issues under discussion. An inflammatory play called The Klansman, though forbidden by public sentiment in many southern cities, had been given in Atlanta and other places with the effect of increasing the prejudice of both races. Certain newspapers in Atlanta, taking advantage of popular feeling, kept the race issue constantly agitated, emphasizing Negro crimes with startling headlines. One newspaper even recommended the formation of organizations of citizens in imitation of the Ku Klux movement of Reconstruction days. In the clamor of this growing agitation, the voice of the right-minded white people and industrious, self-respecting Negroes was almost unheard. A few ministers of both races saw the impending storm and sounded a warning, to no effect and within the week before the riot the citizens the city administration and the courts all woke up together there were calls for mass meetings the police began to investigate the conditions of the low saloons and dives the country constabulary was increased in numbers the grand jury was called to meet in special session on monday the twenty fourth prosperity and lawlessness but the awakening of moral sentiment in the city unfortunately came too late crime made more lurid by agitation had so kindled the fires of hatred that they could not be extinguished by ordinary methods the best people of atlanta were like the citizens of prosperous northern cities too busy with money-making to pay attention to public affairs for Atlanta is growing rapidly. Its bank clearings jumped from 90 millions in 1900 to 222 millions in 1906. Its streets are well paved and well lighted. Its streetcar service is good. Its skyscrapers are comparable with the best in the North. In other words, it was progressive. Few cities I know of more so but it had forgotten its public duties. Within a few months before the riot, there had been a number of crimes of worthless Negroes against white women. Leading Negroes, while not one of them with whom I talked wished to protect any Negro who was really guilty, asserted that the number of these crimes had been greatly exaggerated, and that in special instances the details had been overemphasized because the criminal was black, that they had been used to further inflame race hatred. I had a personal investigation made of every crime against a white woman committed in the few months before and after the riot. Three, charged to white men, attracted comparatively little attention in the newspapers, 
although one, the offense of a white man named Turnage, was shocking in its details. Of twelve such charges against Negroes in the six months preceding the riot, two were cases of rape, horrible in their details, three were aggravated attempts at rape, three may have been attempts, three were pure cases of fright on the part of the white woman, and in one the white woman, first asserting that a negro had assaulted her, finally confessed attempted suicide. The facts of two of these cases I will narrate, and without excuse for the horror of the details. If we are to understand the true conditions in the South, these things must be told. STORY OF ONE NEGRO'S CRIME One of the cases was that of Mrs. Knowles Ethelene Kimmel, twenty-five years old, wife of a farmer living near Atlanta. A mile beyond the end of the streetcar line stands a small green bungalow-like house, in a lonely spot near the edge of the pine woods. The Kimmels who lived there were not Southerners by birth, but of Pennsylvania Dutch stock. They had been in the South four or five years, renting their lonesome farm, raising cotton and corn, and hopefully getting a little ahead. On the day before the riot, a strange rough-looking Negro called at the back door of the Kimmel home. He wore a soldier's cast-off khaki uniform. He asked a foolish question and went away. Mrs. Kimmel was worried and told her husband. He, too, was worried. The fear of this crime is everywhere present in the South. And when he went away in the afternoon, he asked his nearest neighbor to look out for the strange Negro. When he came back a few hours later, he found fifty white men in his yard. He knew what had happened without being told. His wife was under medical attendance in the house. She had been able to give a clear description of the Negro. Bloodhounds were brought, but the pursuing white men had so obliterated the criminal's tracks that he could not be traced. Through information given by a Negro, a suspect was arrested and nearly lynched before he could be brought to Mrs. Kimmel for identification. When she saw him, she said, he is not the man. The real criminal was never apprehended. One day, weeks afterward, I found the husband working alone in his field. His wife, to whom the surroundings had become unbearable, had gone away to visit friends. He told me the story hesitatingly. His prospects, he said, were ruined. His neighbors had been sympathetic, but he could not continue to live there with the feeling that they all knew. He was preparing to give up his home and lose himself where people did not know his story. I asked him if he favored lynching, and his answer surprised me. "'I've thought about that,' he said. "'You see, I'm a Christian man, or I try to be. My wife is a Christian woman. We've talked about it. What good would it do? We should make criminals of ourselves, shouldn't we? No. Let the law take its course. When I came here, I tried to help the Negroes as much as I could. But many of them won't work, even when the wages are high. They won't come when they agree to, and when they get a few dollars ahead, they go down to the saloons in Atlanta. Everyone is troubled about getting labor, and everyone is afraid of prowling idle Negroes. Now the thing has come to me, and it's just about ruined my life. When I came away, the poor lonesome fellow followed me halfway up the hill, asking, Now what would you do? One more case. One of the prominent florists in Atlanta is W. C. Lawrence. He is an Englishman whose home is in the outskirts of the city. On the morning of August 20th, his daughter Mabel, 14 years old, and his sister Ethel, 25 years old, a trained nurse who had recently come from England, 
went out into the nearby woods to pick ferns. Being in broad daylight and within sight of houses, they had no fear. Returning along an old Confederate breastworks, they were met by a brutal-looking negro with a club in one hand and a stone in the other. He first knocked the little girl down, then her aunt. When the child came to, she found herself partially bound with a rope. "'Honey,' said the negro, "'I want you to come with me.' With remarkable presence of mind, the child said, "'I can't. My leg is broken.' and she let it swing limp from the knee. Deceived, the negro went back to bind the aunt. Mabel, instantly untying the rope, jumped up and ran for help. When he saw the child escaping, the negro ran off. "'When I got there,' said Mr. Lawrence, "'my sister was lying against the bank, face down. The back of her head had been beaten bloody.' The bridge of her nose was cut open. One eye had been gouged out of its socket. My daughter had three bad cuts on her head. Thank God nothing worse to either. But my sister, who is just beginning her life, will be totally blind in one eye, probably in both. Her life is ruined. About a month later, through the information of a negro, the criminal was caught identified by the Mrs. Lawrence, and sent to the penitentiary for forty years, two cases, the limit of punishment for attempted criminal assault. In both of these cases, arrests were made on the information of Negroes. Terror of both white and colored people. The effect of a few such crimes as these may be more easily imagined than described. They produced a feeling of alarm, which no one who has not lived in such a community can in any wise appreciate. I was astonished in traveling in the South to discover how widely prevalent this dread has become. Many white women in Atlanta dare not leave their homes alone after dark. Many white men carry arms to protect themselves and their families and even these precautions do not always prevent attacks. But this is not the whole story. Everywhere I went in Atlanta, I heard of the fear of the white people, but not much was said of the terror which the Negroes also felt. And yet every Negro I met voiced in some way that fear. It is difficult here in the North for us to understand what such a condition means a whole community namelessly afraid. The better-class Negroes have two sources of fear, one of the criminals of their own race. Such attacks are rarely given much space in the newspapers. And the other, the fear of the white people. My very first impression of what this fear of the Negroes might be came, curiously enough, not from Negroes, but from a fine white woman on whom I called shortly after going south. She told this story. I had a really terrible experience one evening a few days ago. I was walking along such and such a street when I saw a rather good-looking young negro come out of a hallway to the sidewalk. He was in a great hurry, and in turning suddenly, as a person sometimes will do, he accidentally brushed my shoulder with his arm. He had not seen me before. When he turned and found it was a white woman he had touched, such a look of abject terror and fear came into his face as I hope never again to see on a human countenance. He knew what it meant if I was frightened, called for help, and accused him of insulting or attacking me. He stood still a moment, then turned and ran down the street, dodging into the first alley he came to. It shows, doesn't it, how little it might take to bring punishment upon an innocent man? The next view I got was through the eyes of one of the able Negroes of the South, Bishop Gaines of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. 
he is now an old man but of imposing presence of wide attainments he has travelled in europe he owns much property and rents houses to white tenants he told me of services he had held some time before in south georgia approaching the church one day through the trees he suddenly encountered a white woman carrying water from a spring she dropped her pail instantly screamed and ran up the path toward her house if i had been some negroes said bishop gaines i should have turned and fled in terror the alarm would have been given and it is not unlikely that i should have had a posse of white men with bloodhounds on my trail if i had been caught what would my life have been worth the woman would have identified me and what could i have said but i did not run i stepped out in the path held up one hand and said don't worry madam i am bishop gaines and i am holding services here in this church so she stopped running and i apologized for having startled her the negro knows he has little chance to explain if by accident or ignorance he insults a white woman or offends a white man an educated negro one of the ablest of his race telling me of how a friend of his who by merest chance had provoked a number of half-drunken white men had been set upon and frightenedly beaten remarked it might have been me now i am telling these things just as they look to the negro it is quite as important as a problem in human nature to know how the negro feels and what he says as it is to know how the white man feels how the newspapers fomented the riot on the afternoon of the riot the newspapers in flaming headlines chronicled four assaults by negroes on white women i had a personal investigation made of each of those cases two of them may have been attempts at assaults but two palpably were nothing more than fright on the part of both the white woman and the negro as an instance in one case an elderly woman mrs martha holcomb going to close her blinds in the evening saw a negro on the sidewalk in a terrible fright she screamed the news was telephoned to the police station but before the officials could respond mrs holcomb telephoned them not to come out and yet this was one of the assaults chronicled in letters five inches high in a newspaper extra and finally on this hot saturday half holiday when the country people had come in by hundreds when everyone was out of doors when the streets were crowded when the saloons had been filled since early morning with white men and negroes both drinking certain newspapers in atlanta began to print extras with big headings announcing new assaults on white women by negroes the atlanta news published five such extras and newsboys cried them through the city third assault fourth assault the whole city already deeply agitated was thrown into a veritable state of panic the news in the extras was taken as truthful for the city was not in a mood then for a cool investigation calls began to come in from every direction for police protection a loafing negro in a back yard who in ordinary times would not have been noticed became an object of real terror the police force too small at best was thus distracted and separated in atlanta the proportion of men who go armed continually is very large the pawn shops of decatur and peters streets with windows like arsenals furnish the low class of negroes and whites with cheap revolvers and knives every possible element was here then for a murderous outbreak the good citizens white and black were far away in their homes the bad men had been drinking in the dives permitted to exist by the respectable people of atlanta 
and here they were gathered by night in the heart of the city. The mob gathers. And finally, a trivial incident fired the tinder. Fear and vengeance generated it. It was marked at first by a sort of rough, half-drunken horseplay, but when once blood was shed, the brute, which is none too well controlled in the best city, came out and gorged itself. Once permit the shackles of law and order to be cast off, and men, white or black, Christian or pagan, revert to primordial savagery. There is no such thing as an orderly mob. Crime had been committed by Negroes, but this mob made no attempt to find the criminals. It expressed its blind, unreasoning, uncontrolled race hatred by attacking every man, woman, or boy it saw who had a black face. A lame boot black, an inoffensive industrious Negro boy, at that moment actually at work shining a man's shoes, was dragged out and cuffed, kicked and beaten to death in the street. Another young Negro was chased and stabbed to death with jackknives in the most unspeakably horrible manner. The mob entered barber shops where respectable Negro men were at work shaving white customers, pulled them away from their chairs and beat them. Cars were stopped, and inoffensive Negroes were thrown through the windows or dragged out and beaten. They did not stop with killing and maiming. They broke into hardware stores and armed themselves. They demolished not only Negro barber shops and restaurants, but they robbed stores kept by white men. Of course, the mayor came out, and the police force and the fire department, and finally the governor ordered out the militia to apply that pound of cure which should have been an ounce of prevention. It is highly significant of southern conditions, which the North does not understand, that the first instinct of thousands of Negroes in Atlanta, when the riot broke out, was not to run away from the white people, but to run to them. The white man who takes the most radical position in opposition of the Negro race will often be found loaning money to individual Negroes, feeding them and their families from his kitchen, or defending his Negroes in court or elsewhere. All of the more prominent white citizens of Atlanta, during the riot, protected and fed many colored families who ran to them in their terror. Even Hoke Smith, governor-elect of Georgia, who was more distrusted by the Negroes as a race, probably than any other white man in Georgia, protected many Negroes in his house during the disturbance. In many cases, white friends armed Negroes and told them to protect themselves. One widow I know of, who had a single black servant, placed a shotgun in his hands and told him to fire on any mob that tried to get him. She trusted him absolutely. Southern people possess a real liking, wholly unknown in the North, for individual Negroes whom they know. So much for Saturday night. Sunday was quiescent but nervous, the atmosphere full of the electricity of apprehension. Monday night, after a day of alarm and of prowling crowds of men, which might at any moment develop into mobs, the riot broke forth again in a suburb of Atlanta called Brownsville. STORY OF THE MOB'S WORK IN A SOUTHERN NEGRO TOWN When I went out to Brownsville, knowing of its bloody part in the riot, I expected to find a typical Negro slum. I looked for squalor, ignorance, vice, and I was surprised to find a large settlement of Negroes, practically every one of whom owned his own home, some of the houses being as attractive without, and as well furnished within, as the ordinary homes of middle-class white people. Near at hand, surrounded by beautiful grounds, were two Negro colleges, Clark University and Gammon Theological Seminary. 
The post office was kept by a Negro. There were several stores owned by Negroes. The schoolhouse, though supplied with teachers by the county, was built wholly with money personally contributed by the Negroes of the neighborhood, in order that there might be adequate educational facilities for their children. They had three churches and not a saloon. The residents were all of the industrious, property-owning sort, bearing the best reputation among white people who knew them. Think, then, of the situation in Brownsville during the riot in Atlanta. All sorts of exaggerated rumors came from the city. The Negroes of Atlanta were being slaughtered wholesale. A condition of panic fear developed. Many of the people of the little town sought refuge in Gammon Theological Seminary, where, packed together, they sat up all night praying. President Bowen did not have his clothes off for days, expecting the mob every moment. He telephoned for police protection on Sunday, but none was provided. Terror also existed among the families which remained in Brownsville. Most of the men were armed, and they had decided, should the mob appear, to make a stand in defense of their homes. At last, on Monday evening, just at dark, a squad of the county police, led by Officer Poole, marched into the settlement at Brownsville. Here, although there had not been the slightest sign of disturbance, they began arresting Negroes for being armed. Several armed white citizens, who were not officers, joined them. Finally, looking up a little street, they saw dimly in the next block a group of Negro men. Part of the officers were left with the prisoners, and part went up the street. As they approached the group of Negroes, the officers began firing. The Negroes responded. Officer Hurd was shot dead. Another officer was wounded, and several Negroes were killed or injured. The police went back to town with their prisoners. On the way, two of the Negroes in their charge were shot. A white man's wife, who saw the outrage, being with child, dropped dead of fright. The Negroes, all of this is now a matter of court record, declared that they were expecting the mob, that the police, not mounted as usual, not armed as usual, and accompanied by citizens, looked to them in the darkness like a mob. In their fright, the firing began. The wildest reports, of course, were circulated. One sent broadcast was that 500 students of Clark University, all armed, had decoyed the police in order to shoot them down. As a matter of fact, the university did not open its fall session until October 3rd, over a week later, and on this night there were just two students on the grounds. The next morning, the police and the troops appeared and arrested a very large proportion of the male inhabitants of the town. Police officers, accompanied by white citizens, entered one Negro home, where lay a man named Lewis, badly wounded, the night before. He was in bed. They opened his shirt, placed their revolvers at his breast, and in cold blood shot him through the body several times in the presence of his relatives. They left him for dead, but he has since recovered. President Bowen of Gammon Theological Seminary, one of the able Negroes in Atlanta, who had nothing whatever to do with the riot, was beaten over the head by one of the police with his rifle butt. The Negroes were all disarmed, and about sixty of them were finally taken to Atlanta and locked up, charged with the murder of Officer Hurd. In the Brownsville riot, four Negroes were killed. One was a decent, industrious, though loud-talking, citizen named Fambro, who kept a small grocery store and owned two houses besides, which he rented. He had a comfortable home, a wife, and one child. Another was an inoffensive Negro named Wilder, seventy years old, 
a pensioner as a soldier of the Civil War, who was well spoken of by all who knew him. He was found, not shot, but murdered by a knife cut in the abdomen, lying in a woodshed back of Fambro's store. Magruder, a brick mason, who earned four dollars a day at his trade, and who had laid aside enough to earn his own home, was killed while under arrest by the police. And Robinson, an industrious Negro carpenter, was shot to death on his way to work Tuesday morning after the riot. End of Chapter 1, Part 1《Part Two of Chapter One of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Results of the Riot And after the riot in Brownsville, what? Here was a self respecting community of hard working Negroes, disturbing no one, getting an honest living. How did the riot affect them? Well, it demoralized them, set them back for years. Not only were four men killed and several wounded, but sixty of their citizens were in jail. Nearly every family had to go to the lawyers, who would not take their cases without money in hand. Hence the little homes had to be sold or mortgaged, or money borrowed in some other way to defend those arrested, doctor's bills were to be paid the undertaker must be settled with a riot is not over when the shooting stops and when the cases finally came up in court and all the evidence was brought out every negro went free but two of the county policemen who had taken part in the shooting were punished george muse one of the foremost merchants of atlanta who was foreman of the jury which tried the Brownsville Negroes, said, We think the Negroes were gathered just as white people were in other parts of the town for the purpose of defending their homes. We were shocked by the conduct which the evidence showed some of the county police had been guilty of. After the riot was over, many Negro families, terrified and feeling themselves unprotected, sold out for what they could get. I heard a good many pitiful stories of such sudden and costly sacrifices, and left the country, some going to California, some to northern cities. The best and most enterprising are those who go. The worst remain. Not only did the Negroes leave Brownsville, but they left the city itself in considerable numbers. Labor was thus still scarcer and wages higher in Atlanta because of the riot. Report of a White Committee on the Riot It is significant that not one of the Negroes killed and wounded in the riot was of the criminal class. Every one was industrious, respectable, and law-abiding. A White Committee, composed of W. G. Cooper, Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce, and George Muse, a prominent merchant, backed by the sober citizenship of the town, made an honest investigation and issued a brave and truthful report. Here are a few of its conclusions. 1. Among the victims of the mob there was not a single vagrant. 2. They were earning wages in useful work up to the time of the riot. 3. They were supporting themselves and their families or dependent relatives. 4. Most of the dead left small children and widows, mothers or sisters with practically no means and very small earning capacity. 5. The wounded lost from one to eight weeks' time at fifty cents to four dollars a day each. 6. About seventy persons were wounded, and among these there was an immense amount of suffering. In some cases it was prolonged and excruciating pain. 7. 
Many of the wounded are disfigured, and several are permanently disabled. 8. Most of them were in humble circumstances, but they were honest, industrious, and law-abiding citizens and useful members of society. 9. These statements are true of both white and colored. 10. Of the wounded, ten are white and sixty are colored. Of the dead, two are white and ten are colored, two female and ten male. This includes three killed at Brownsville. 11. Wild rumors of a larger number killed have no foundation that we can discover. As the city was paying the funeral expenses of victims and relief was given their families, they had every motive to make known their loss. In one case, relatives of a man killed in a broil made fruitless efforts to secure relief. 12. Two persons reported as victims of the riot had no connection with it. One, a Negro man, was killed in a broil over a crap game, and another, a Negro woman, was killed by her paramour. Both homicides occurred at some distance from the scene of the riot. The men who made this brave report did not mince matters. They called murder, murder, and robbery, robbery. Read this. 13. As twelve persons were killed and seventy were murderously assaulted, and as, by all accounts, a number took part in each assault, it is clear that several hundred murderers, or would-be murderers, are at large in this community. At first, after the riot, there was an inclination in some quarters to say, Well, at any rate, the riot cleared the atmosphere. The Negroes have had their lesson. There won't be any more trouble soon. But read the sober conclusions in the committee's report. The riot did not prevent further crime. 14. Although less than three months have passed since the riot, events have already demonstrated that the slaughter of the innocent does not deter the criminal class from committing more crimes. Rapes and robbery have been committed in the city during that time. 15. The slaughter of the innocent does drive away good citizens. From one small neighborhood twenty-five families have gone. A great many of them were buying homes on the installment plan. 16. The crimes of the mob include robbery as well as murder. In a number of cases, the property of innocent and unoffending people was taken. Furniture was destroyed. Small shops were looted. Windows were smashed. Trunks were burst open. Money was taken from the small hoard and articles of value were appropriated. In the commission of these crimes, the victims, both men and women, were treated with unspeakable brutality. 17. As a result of four days of lawlessness, there are in this glad Christmas time widows of both races mourning their husbands, and husbands of both races mourning for their wives. There are orphan children of both races who cry out in vain for faces they will see no more. There are grown men of both races disabled for life. And all this sorrow has come to people who are absolutely innocent of any wrongdoing. In trying to find out exactly the point of view and the feeling of the Negroes, which is most important in any honest consideration of conditions, I was handed the following letter written by a young colored man, a former resident in Atlanta, now a student in the North. He is writing frankly to a friend. It is valuable as showing a real point of view, the bitterness, the hopelessness, the distrust. It is possible that you have formed at least a good idea of how we feel as the result of the horrible eruption in Georgia. I have not spoken to a Caucasian on the subject since then. But listen. 
how would you feel if with our history there came a time when after speeches and papers and teachings you acquired property and were educated and were a fairly good man it were impossible for you to walk the street for whose maintenance you were taxed with your sister without being in mortal fear of death if you resented any insult offered to her how would you feel if you saw a governor a mayor a sheriff whom you could not oppose at the polls encouraged by deed or word or both a mob of best and worst citizens to slaughter your people in the streets and in their own homes and in their places of business do you think that you could resist the same wrath that caused god to slay the philistines and the russians to throw bombs i can resist it but with each new outrage i am less able to resist it and yet if i gave way to my feelings i should become just like other men of the mob but i do not not quite and i must hurry through the only life i shall live on earth tortured by these experiences and these horrible impulses with no hope of ever getting away from them they are ever present like the just god the devil and my conscience if there were no such thing as christianity we should be hopeless besides this effect on the negroes the riot for a week or more practically paralyzed the city of atlanta factories were closed railroad cars were left unloaded in the yards the streetcar system was crippled and there was no cab service cab drivers being negroes hundreds of servants deserted their places the bank clearing slumped by hundreds of thousands of dollars the state fair then just opening was a failure it was indeed weeks before confidence was fully restored and the city returned to its normal condition who made up the mob one more point i wish to make before taking up the extraordinary reconstructive work which followed the riot i have not spoken of the men who made up the mob we know the dangerous negro class after all a very small proportion of the entire negro population there is a corresponding low class of whites quite as illiterate as the negroes the poor white hates the negro and the negro dislikes the poor white it is in these lower strata of society where the races rub together in unclean streets that the fire is generated decatur and peters streets with their swarming saloons and dives furnish the point of contact i talked with many people who saw the mobs at different times and the universal testimony was that it was made up largely of boys and young men and of the low criminal and semi-criminal class the ignorant negro and the uneducated white there lies the trouble this idea that a hundred and fifteen thousand people of atlanta respectable law-abiding good citizens white and black should be disgraced before the world by a few hundred criminals was what aroused the strong honest citizenship of atlanta to vigorous action the riot brought out all that was worst in human nature the reconstruction brought out all that was best and finest almost the first act of the authorities was to close every saloon in the city afterward revoking all the licenses and for two weeks no liquor was sold in the city the police at first accused of not having done their best in dealing with the mob arrested a good many white rioters and judge broyles to show that the authorities had no sympathy with such disturbers of the peace sent every man brought before him twenty-four in all to the chain gang for the largest possible sentence without the alternative of a fine the grand jury met and boldly denounced the mob its report said in part that the sensationalism of the afternoon papers in the presentation of the criminal news to the public prior to the riots of saturday night 
especially in the case of the Atlanta News, deserves our severest condemnation. But the most important and far-reaching effect of the riot was in arousing the strong men of the city. It struck at the pride of those men of the South. It struck at their sense of law and order. It struck at their business interests. On Sunday following the first riot, a number of prominent men gathered at the Piedmont Hotel and had a brief discussion. But it was not until Tuesday afternoon, when the worst of the news from Brownsville had come in, that they gathered in the courthouse with the serious intent of stopping the riot at all costs. Most of the prominent men of Atlanta were present. Sam D. Jones, president of the Chamber of Commerce, presided. One of the first speeches was made by Charles T. Hopkins, who had been the leading spirit in the meetings on Sunday and Monday. He expressed with eloquence the humiliation which Atlanta felt. "'Saturday evening at eight o'clock,' he said, "'the credit of Atlanta was good for any number of millions of dollars in New York or Boston or any financial center. Today we couldn't borrow fifty cents. The reputation we have been building up so arduously for years has been swept away in two short hours.' not by men who have made and make Atlanta, not by men who represent the character and strength of our city, but by hoodlums, understrappers, and white criminals. Innocent Negro men have been struck down for no crime whatever, while peacefully enjoying the life and liberty guaranteed to every American citizen. The Negro race is a child race. We are a strong race, their guardians. We have boasted of our superiority, and we have now sunk to this level. We have shed the blood of our helpless wards. Christianity and humanity demand that we treat the Negro fairly. He is here, and here to stay. He only knows how to do those things we teach him to do. It is our Christian duty to protect him. I, for one, and I believe I voice the best sentiment of this city, am willing to lay down my life rather than to have the scenes of the last few days repeated. THE PLEA OF A NEGRO PHYSICIAN In the midst of the meeting, a colored man arose rather doubtfully. He was, however, promptly recognized as Dr. W. F. Penn, one of the foremost colored physicians of Atlanta a graduate of Yale College, a man of much influence among his people. He said that he had come to ask the protection of the white men of Atlanta. He said that on the day before a mob had come to his home, that ten white men, some of whose families he knew and had treated professionally, had been sent into his house to look for concealed arms that his little girl had to run to them, one after another, and begged them not to shoot her father, that his life and the lives of his family had afterward been threatened, so that he had had to leave his home, that he had been saved from a gathering mob by a white man in an automobile. "'What shall we do?' he asked the meeting, and those who heard his speech said that the silence was profound." We have been disarmed. How shall we protect our lives and property? If living a sober, industrious, upright life, accumulating property and educating his children as best he knows how, is not the standard by which a colored man can live and be protected in the South, what is to become of him? If the kind of life I have lived isn't the kind you want, shall I leave and go north? When we aspire to be decent and industrious, we are told that we are bad examples to other colored men. Tell us what your standards are for colored men. What are the requirements under which we may live and be protected? What shall we do? When he had finished, Colonel A. J. McBride, a real estate owner and a Confederate veteran, arose and said with much feeling, that he knew Dr. Penn, and that he was a good man, and that Atlanta meant to protect such men. 
"'If necessary,' said Colonel McBride, "'I will go out and sit on his porch with a rifle.' Such was the spirit of this remarkable meeting. Mr. Hopkins proposed that the white people of the city express their deep regret for the riot and show their sympathy for the Negroes who had suffered at the hands of the mob by raising a fund of money for their assistance. Then and there, $4,423 was subscribed, to which the city afterward added $1,000. But this was not all. These men, once thoroughly aroused, began looking to the future to find some new way of preventing the recurrence of such disturbances. A committee of ten, appointed to work with the public officials in restoring order and confidence, consisted of some of the foremost citizens of Atlanta. Charles T. Hopkins, Sam D. Jones, President of the Chamber of Commerce, L. Z. Rosser, President of the Board of Education, J. W. English, President of the Fourth National Bank, Forrest Adair, a leading real estate owner, Captain W. D. Ellis, a prominent lawyer, A. B. Steele, a wealthy lumber merchant, M. L. Collier, a railroad man, John E. Murphy, capitalist, and H. Y. McCord, president of a wholesale grocery house. One of the first and most unexpected things that this committee did was to send for several of the leading Negro citizens of Atlanta, the Rev. H. H. Proctor, B. J. Davis, editor of The Independent, a Negro journal, the Rev. E. P. Johnson, the Rev. E. R. Carter, the Rev. J. A. Rush, and Bishop Halsey. Committees of the Two Races Meet this was the first important occasion in the South upon which an attempt was made to get the two races together for any serious consideration of their differences. They held a meeting. The white men asked the Negroes, "'What shall we do to relieve the irritation?' The Negroes said that they thought that colored men were treated with unnecessary roughness on the streetcars and by the police." the white members of the committee admitted that this was so and promised to take the matter up immediately with the streetcar company and the police department which was done the discussion was harmonious after the meeting mr hopkins said i believe those negroes understood the situation better than we did i was astonished at their intelligence and diplomacy they never referred to the riot they were looking to the future. I didn't know that there were such Negroes in Atlanta. Out of this beginning grew the Atlanta Civic League. Knowing that race prejudice was strong, Mr. Hopkins sent out 2,000 cards inviting the most prominent men in the city to become members. To his surprise, 1,500 immediately accepted. Only two refused and those anonymously. Five hundred men not formally invited were also taken as members. The League thus had the great body of the best citizens of Atlanta behind it. At the same time, Mr. Proctor and his committee of Negroes had organized a colored cooperative Civic League, which secured a membership of fifteen hundred of the best colored men in the city. A small committee of Negroes met a small committee of the White League. Fear was expressed that there would be another riotous outbreak during the Christmas holidays, and the League proceeded with vigor to prevent it. New policemen were put on, and the committee worked with Judge Broyles and Judge Roan in issuing statements warning the people against lawlessness. They secured an agreement among the newspapers not to publish sensational news. The sheriff agreed, if necessary, to swear in some of the best men in town as extra deputies. They asked that saloons be closed at four o'clock on Christmas Eve, and through the Negro Committee, 
they brought influence to bear to keep all colored people off the streets. When two county police got drunk at Brownsville and threatened Mrs. Fambro, the wife of one of the Negroes killed in the riot, a member of the committee, Mr. Seeley, publisher of the Georgian, informed the sheriff and sent his automobile to Brownsville, where the policemen were arrested and afterwards discharged from the force. As a result, it was the quietest Christmas Atlanta had had in years. But the most important of all the work done, because of the spectacular interest it aroused, was the defense of a Negro charged with an assault upon a white woman. It is an extraordinary and dramatic story. Does a riot prevent further crime? Although many people said that the riot would prevent any more Negro crime, several attacks on white women occurred within a few weeks afterward. On November 13th, Mrs. J. D. Camp, living in the suburbs of Atlanta, was attacked in broad daylight in her home and brutally assaulted by a Negro, who afterward robbed the house and escaped. Though the crime was treated with great moderation by the newspapers, public feeling was intense. A Negro was arrested, charged with the crime. Mr. Hopkins and his associates believed that the best way to secure justice and prevent lynchings was to have a prompt trial. Accordingly, they held a conference with Judge Roan, a result of which three lawyers in the city, Mr. Hopkins, L. Z. Rosser, and J. E. McClelland, were appointed to defend the accused Negro, serving without pay. A trial jury, composed of twelve citizens, among the most prominent in Atlanta, was called, one of the ablest juries ever drawn in Georgia. There was a determination to have immediate and complete justice. The Negro arrested, one Joe Glenn, had been completely identified by Mrs. Camp as her assailant. Although having no doubt of his guilt, the attorneys went at the case thoroughly. The first thing they did was to call in two members of the Negro Committee, Mr. Davis and Mr. Carter. These men went to the jail and talked with Glenn, and afterward they all visited the scene of the crime. They found that Glenn, who was a man fifty years old with grandchildren, bore an excellent reputation. He rented a small farm about two miles from Mrs. Camp's home and had some property. He was sober and industrious. After making a thorough examination and getting all the evidence they could, they came back to Atlanta, persuaded, in spite of the fact that the Negro had been positively identified by Mrs. Camp, which in these cases is usually considered conclusive, that Glenn was not guilty. It was a most dramatic trial. At first, when Mrs. Camp was placed on the stand, she failed to identify Glenn. Afterward, reversing herself, she broke forth into a passionate denunciation of him. But after the evidence was all in, the jury retired and reported two minutes later with a verdict not guilty. Remarkably enough, just before the trial was over, the police informed the court that another Negro, named Will Johnson, answering Mrs. Camp's description, had been arrested, charged with the crime. He was subsequently identified by Mrs. Camp. Without this energetic defense, an innocent, industrious Negro would certainly have been hanged, or if the mob had been ahead of the police, as it usually is, he would have been lynched. But what of Glenn afterward? When the jury left the box, Mr. Hopkins turned to Glenn and said, Well, Joe, what do you think of the case? He replied, Boss, I specs they will hang me, for that lady said I was the man. But they won't hang me, will they, for I sees my wife and chillins again? 
he was kept in the tower that night and the following day for protection against a possible lynching. Plans were made by his attorneys to send him secretly out of the city to the home of a farmer in Alabama whom they could trust with the story. Glenn's wife was brought to visit the jail, and Glenn was told of the plans for his safety and instructed to change his name and keep quiet until the feeling of the community could be ascertained. A ticket was purchased by his attorneys with a new suit of clothes, hat, and shoes. He was taken out of jail about midnight under a strong guard and safely placed on the train. From that day to this, he has never been heard of. He did not go to Alabama. The poor creature, with the instinct of a hunted animal, did not dare after all to trust the white men who had befriended him. He is a fugitive, away from his family, not daring, though innocent, to return to his home. OTHER RECONSTRUCTION MOVEMENTS Another strong movement also sprung into existence. Its inspiration was religious. Ministers wrote a series of letters to the Atlanta Constitution. Clark Howell, its editor, responded with an editorial entitled, Shall We Blaze the Trail? W. J. Northern, ex-governor of Georgia, and one of the most highly respected men in the state, took up the work, asking himself, as he says, What am I to do who have to pray every night? He answered that question by calling a meeting at the colored YMCA building, where some twenty white men met an equal number of Negroes, mostly preachers, and held a prayer meeting. The South still looks to its ministers for leadership, and they really lead. The sermons of men like the Rev. John E. White, the Rev. C. B. Wilmer, the Rev. W. W. Landrum, who have spoken with power and ability against lawlessness and injustice to the Negro, have had a large influence in the Reconstruction movement. Ex-Governor Northern traveled through the state of Georgia, made a notable series of speeches, urged the establishment of law and order organizations, and met support wherever he went. He talked against mob law and lynching in plain language. Here are some of the things he said. We shall never settle this until we give absolute justice to the Negro. We are not now doing justice to the Negro in Georgia. Get into contact with the best Negroes, there are plenty of good Negroes in Georgia. What we must do is to get the good white folks to leaven the bad white folks and the good Negroes to leaven the bad Negroes. There must be no aristocracy of crime. A white fiend is as much to be dreaded as a black brute. These movements did not cover specifically, it will be observed, the enormously difficult problems of politics and the political relationships of the races, nor the subject of Negro education, nor the most exasperating of all the provocatives, those problems which arise from human contact in street cars, railroad trains, and in life generally. That they had to meet the greatest difficulties in their work is shown by such an editorial as the following published December 12th by the Atlanta Evening News. No law of God or man can hold back the vengeance of our white men upon such a criminal, the Negro who attacks a white woman. If necessary, we will double and triple and quadruple the law of Moses and hang offhand the criminal, or failing to find a remedy, we will hang two, three, or four of the Negroes nearest to the crime, until the crime is no longer done, or feared, in all this southern land that we inhabit and love. On January 31, 1907, the newspaper which published this editorial went into the hands of a receiver, 
its failure being due largely to the strong public sentiment against its course before and during the riot. After the excitement of the riot and the evil results which followed it began to disappear, it was natural that the Reconstruction movements should quiet down. Ex-Governor Northern continued his work for many months and is indeed still continuing it, and there is no doubt that his campaign have had a wide influence. The feeling that the saloons and dives of Atlanta were partly responsible for the riot was a powerful factor in the anti-saloon campaign which took place in 1907 and resulted in closing every saloon in the state of Georgia on January 1, 1908. And the riot and the revulsion which followed it will combine to make a recurrence of such a disturbance next to impossible. End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of Following the Color Line, an account of Negro citizenship in the American democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Following the Color Line in the South. Before entering upon a discussion of the more serious aspects of the Negro question in the South, it may prove illuminating if I set down briefly some of the more superficial evidences of color line distinctions in the south as they impress the investigator the present chapter consists of a series of sketches from my notebooks giving the earliest and freshest impressions of my studies in the south when i first went south i expected to find people talking about the negro but I was not at all prepared to find the subject occupying such an overshadowing place in Southern affairs. In the North we have nothing at all like it. No question which so touches every act of life, in which everyone, white or black, is so profoundly interested. In the North we are mildly concerned in many things. The South is overwhelmingly concerned in this one thing. And this is not surprising, for the Negro in the South is both the labor problem and the servant question. He is preeminently the political issue, and his place, socially, is of daily and hourly discussion. A Negro minister I met told me a story of a boy who went as a sort of butler's assistant in the home of a prominent family in Atlanta. His people were naturally curious about what went on in the white man's house. One day they asked him, "'What do they talk about when they're eating?' The boy thought a moment, then he said, "'Mostly they discusses us colored folks.' What Negroes Talk About The same consuming interest exists among the Negroes. A very large part of their conversation deals with the race question. I had been at the Piedmont Hotel only a day or two when my Negro waiter began to take especially good care of me. He flecked off imaginary crumbs and gave me unnecessary spoons. Finally, when no one was at hand, he leaned over and said, I understand you're down here to study the Negro problem. "'Yes,' I said, a good deal surprised. "'How did you know it?' "'Well, sir,' he replied, "'we've got ways of knowing things.' He told me that the Negroes had been much disturbed ever since the riot, and that he knew many of them who wanted to go north. "'The South,' he said, "'is getting to be too dangerous for colored people.' His language and pronunciation were surprisingly good. I found that he was a college student, and that he expected to study for the ministry. "'Do you talk much about these things among yourselves?' I asked. "'We don't talk about much else,' he said. "'It's sort of life and death with us.' Another curious thing happened not long afterward. 
I was lunching with several fine southern men, and they talked, as usual, with the greatest freedom in the full hearing of the Negro waiters. Somehow I could not help watching to see if the Negroes took any notice of what was said. I wondered if they were sensitive. Finally I put the question to one of my friends. Oh, he said, we never mind them, they don't care. One of the waiters instantly spoke up. No, don't mind me, I'm only a block of wood. FIRST VIEWS OF THE NEGROES I set out from the hotel on the morning of my arrival to trace the color line as it appears, outwardly, in the life of such a town. Atlanta is a singularly attractive place, as bright and new as any western city. Sherman left it in ashes at the close of the war. The old buildings and narrow streets were swept away, and a new city was built which is now growing in a manner not short of astonishing. It has 115,000 to 125,000 inhabitants, about a third of whom are Negroes, living in more or less detached quarters in various parts of the city, and giving an individuality to the life interesting enough to the unfamiliar northerner. A great many of them are always on the streets far better dressed and better appearing than I had expected to see, having in mind, perhaps, the tattered country specimens of the penny postal cards. Crowds of Negroes were at work mending the pavement, for the Italian and Slav had not yet appeared in Atlanta, nor, indeed, to any extent anywhere in the South. I stopped to watch a group of them, a good deal of conversation was going on. Here and there a negro would laugh with great good humor, and several times I heard a snatch of a song. Much jollier workers than our grim foreigners, but evidently not working so hard. A fire had been built to heat some of the tools, and a black circle of negroes were gathered around it, like flies around a drop of molasses and they were all talking while they warmed their shins, evidently having plenty of leisure. As I continued down the street, I found that all the drivers of wagons and cabs were Negroes. I saw Negro newsboys, Negro porters, Negro barbers, and it being a bright day, many of them were in the street, on the sunny side. I commented that evening to some southern people I met on the impression, almost of jollity, given by the Negro workers I had seen. One of the older ladies made what seemed to me a very significant remark. "'They don't sing as they used to,' she said. "'You should have known the old darkies of the plantation. Every year, it seems to me, they have been losing more and more of their carefree good humor. I sometimes feel that I don't know them any more. Since the riot, they have grown so glum and serious that I'm free to say I'm scared of them. One of my early errands that morning led me into several of the great new office buildings, which bear testimony to the extraordinary progress of the city. And here I found one of the first evidences of the color line for which I was looking. In both buildings I found a separate elevator for colored people. In one building signs were placed reading, For Whites Only. In another I copied this sign. This car for colored passengers, freight, express, and packages. Curiously enough, as giving an interesting point of view, an intelligent negro with whom I was talking a few days later asked me, "'Have you seen the elevator sign in the Century Building?' I said I had. "'How would you like to be classed with freight, express, and packages?' I found that no negro ever went into an elevator devoted to white people, but that white people often rode in cars set apart for colored people. In some cases, 
the car for negroes is operated by a white man and in other cases all the elevators in a building are operated by colored men this is one of the curious points of industrial contact in the south which somewhat surprised the northern visitor in the north a white workman will often refuse to work with a negro in the south while the social prejudice is strong negroes and whites work together side by side in many kinds of employment i had an illustration in point not long afterward passing the post office i saw several mail carriers coming out some white some black talking and laughing with no evidence at first of the existence of any color line interested to see what the real condition was i went in and made inquiries a most interesting and significant condition developed i found that the postmaster who was a wise man sent negro carriers up peach tree and other fashionable streets occupied by wealthy white people while white carriers were assigned to beats in the mill districts and other parts of town inhabited by the poorer classes of white people you see said my informant the peach tree people know how to treat negroes they really prefer a negro carrier to a white one it's natural for them to have a negro doing such service but if we sent negro carriers down into the mill district they might get their heads knocked off then he made a philosophical observation if we had only the best class of white folks down here and the industrious negroes there wouldn't be any trouble the jim crow car one of the points in which i was especially interested was the jim crow regulations that is the system of separation of the races in the streetcars and railroad trains next to the question of negro suffrage i think the people of the north have heard more of the jim crow legislation than of anything else connected with the negro problem the street car is an excellent place for observing the points of human contact between the races betraying as it does every shade of feeling upon the part of both in almost no other relationship do the races come together physically on anything like a common footing in their homes and in ordinary employment they meet as master and servant but in the street cars they touch as free citizens each paying for the right to ride the white not in place of command the negro without an obligation of servitude street car relationships are therefore symbolic of the new conditions a few years ago the negro came and went in the street cars in most cities and sat where he pleased but gradually jim crow laws or local regulations were passed forcing him into certain seats at the back of the car while i was in atlanta the newspapers reported two significant new developments in the policy of separation in savannah jim crow ordinances have gone into effect for the first time causing violent protestations on the part of the negroes and a refusal by many of them to use the cars at all montgomery alabama about the same time went one step further and demanded not separate seats in the same car but entirely separate cars for whites and blacks there could be no better visible evidence of the increasing separation of the races and of the determination of the white man to make the negro keep his place than the evolution of the jim crow regulations i was curious to see how the system worked out in atlanta over the door of each car i found this sign white people will seat from front of car toward the back and colored people from rear toward front sure enough i found the white people in front and the negroes behind as the sign indicates there is no definite line of division between the white seats and the black seats as in many other southern cities 
this very absence of a clear demarcation is significant of many relationships in the south the color line is drawn but neither race knows just where it is indeed it can hardly be definitely drawn in many relationships because it is constantly changing this uncertainty is a fertile source of friction and bitterness the very first time i was on a car in atlanta i saw the conductor all conductors are white ask a negro woman to get up and take a seat farther back in order to make a place for a white man i have also seen white men requested to leave the negro section of the car at one time when i was on a car the conductor shouted hey you nigger get back there which the negro who had taken a seat too far forward proceeded hastily to do no other one point of race contact is so much and so bitterly discussed among the negroes as the jim crow car i don't know how many negroes replied to my question what is the chief cause of friction down here with a complaint of their treatment on street cars and in railroad trains why the negro objects to the jim crow car fundamentally of course they object to any separation which gives them inferior accommodations. This point of view, and I am trying to set down every point of view, both colored and white, exactly as I find it, is expressed in many ways. "'We pay first-class fare,' said one of the leading Negroes in Atlanta, "'exactly as the white man does, but we don't get first-class service. I say it isn't fair.' In answer to this complaint, the white man says, The Negro is inferior. He must be made to keep his place. Give him a chance, and he assumes social equality, and that will lead to an effort at intermarriage and amalgamation of the races. The Anglo-Saxon will never stand for that. One of the first complaints made by the Negroes after the riot was of rough and unfair treatment on the street cars the committee admitted that the negroes were not always well treated on the cars and promised to improve conditions charles t hopkins a leader in the civic league and one of the prominent lawyers of the city told me that he believed the negroes should be given their definite seats in every car he said that he personally made it a practice to stand up rather than to take any one of the four back seats which he considered as belonging to the negroes two other leading men on a different occasion told me the same thing one result of the friction over the jim crow regulations is that many negroes ride on the cars as little as possible one prominent negro i met said he never entered a car and that he had many friends who pursued the same policy he said that negro streetcar excursions familiar a few years ago had entirely ceased it is significant of the feeling that one of the features of the atlanta riot was an attack on the streetcars in which all negroes were driven out of their seats one negro woman was pushed through an open window and after falling to the pavement she was dragged by the leg across the sidewalk and thrown through a shop window in another case when the mob stopped a car the motorman instead of protecting his passengers went inside and beat down a negro with his brass control lever story of an encounter on a street car i heard innumerable stories from both white people and negroes of encounters in the street cars Dr. W. F. Penn, one of the foremost Negro physicians of the city, himself partly white, a graduate of Yale College, told me of one occasion in which he entered a car and found there Mrs. Krogman, wife of the colored president of Clark University. Mrs. Krogman is a mulatto so light of complexion as to be practically undistinguishable from white people dr penn who knew her well 
sat down beside her and began talking. A white man who occupied a seat in front with his wife turned and said, "'Here, you nigger, get out of that seat. What do you mean by sitting down with a white woman?' Dr. Penn replied somewhat angrily, "'It's come to a pretty pass when a colored man cannot sit with a woman of his own race in his own part of the car.' The white man turned to his wife and said, "'Here, take these bundles. I'm going to thrash that nigger.' In half a minute the car was in an uproar, the two men struggling. Fortunately the conductor and motorman were quickly at hand, and Dr. Penn slipped off the car. Conditions on the railroad trains, while not resulting so often in personal encounters, are also the cause of constant irritation. When I came south, I took particular pains to observe the arrangements on the trains. In some cases, Negroes are given entire cars at the front of the train. At other times, they occupy the rear end of a combination coach and baggage car, which is used in the north as a smoking compartment. The complaint here is that, while the Negro is required to pay first-class fare, he is provided with second-class accommodations. Well-to-do Negroes who can afford to travel also complain that they are not permitted to engage sleeping car berths. Booker T. Washington usually takes a compartment where he is entirely cut off from the white passengers. Some other Negroes do the same thing, although they are often refused even this expensive privilege. Railroad officials with whom I talked, and it is important to hear what they say, said that it was not only a question of public opinion, which was absolutely opposed to any intermingling of the races in the cars, but that Negro travel in most places was small compared to white travel, that the ordinary Negro was unclean and careless, and that it was impractical to furnish them the same accommodations, even though it did come hard on a few educated Negroes. They said that when there was a delegation of Negroes, enough to fill an entire sleeping car, they could always get accommodations. All of which gives a glimpse of the enormous difficulties accompanying the separation of the races in the South. Another interesting point, significant of tendencies, came early to my attention. They had recently finished at Atlanta one of the finest railroad stations in this country. The ordinary depot in the South has two waiting rooms of about the same size, one for whites and one for Negroes. But when this new station was built, the whole front was given up to white people, and the Negroes were assigned a side entrance and a small waiting room. Prominent colored men regarded it as a new evidence of the crowding out of the Negro, the further attempt to give him unequal accommodations, to handicap him in his struggle for survival. A delegation was sent to the railroad people to protest, but to no purpose. Result? Further bitterness. There are in the station two lunchrooms, one for whites, one for Negroes. A leading colored man said to me, No Negro goes to the lunchroom in the station who can help it. We don't like the way we have been treated. End of chapter 2, part 1Part 2 of Chapter 2 of Following the Color Line, an account of Negro citizenship in the American democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Negro Boycott Of course, this was an unusually intelligent colored man, and he spoke for his own sort. How far the same feeling of a race consciousness strong enough to carry out such a boycott as this, and it is like the boycott of a labor union, actuates the masses of ignorant Negroes, 
is a question upon which I hope to get more light as I proceed. I have already heard more than one colored leader complain that Negroes do not stand together, and a white planter whom I met in the hotel said a significant thing along this very line. If once the Negroes got together and saved their money, they'd soon own the country, but they can't do it, and they never will. After I had begun to trace the color line, I found evidences of it everywhere, literally in every department of life. In the theaters, Negroes never sit downstairs, but the galleries are black with them. Of course, white hotels and restaurants are entirely barred to Negroes, with the result that colored people have their own eating and sleeping places, many of them inexpressibly dilapidated and unclean. Sleepers Wanted is a familiar sign in Atlanta, giving notice of places where for a few cents a Negro can find a bed or a mattress on the floor, often in a room where there are many other sleepers, sometimes both men and women in the same room crowded together in a manner both unsanitary and immoral. No good public accommodations exist for the educated or well-to-do Negro in Atlanta, although other cities are developing good Negro hotels. Indeed, one cannot long remain in the South without being impressed with extreme difficulties which beset the exceptional colored man. In slavery time, many Negroes attended white churches, and Negro children were often taught by white women. Now a Negro is never, or very rarely, seen in a white man's church. Once, since I have been in the South, I saw a very old Negro woman, some much-loved mammy, perhaps, sitting down in front near the pulpit. But that is the only exception to the rule that has come to my attention. Negroes are not wanted in white churches. Consequently, the colored people have some sixty churches of their own in Atlanta. Of course, the schools are separate, and have been ever since the Civil War. In one of the parks of Atlanta, I saw this sign. No Negroes allowed in this park. Color line in the public library. A story significant of the growing separation of the races is told about the public library at Atlanta, which no Negro is permitted to enter. Carnegie gave the money for building it, and when the question came up as to the support of it by the city, the inevitable color question arose. Leading Negroes asserted that their people should be allowed admittance, that they needed such an educational advantage even more than white people, and that they were led to be taxed their share, even though it was small, for buying the books and maintaining the building. They did not win their point, of course, but Mr. Carnegie proposed a solution of the difficulty by offering more money to build a Negro branch library, provided the city would give the land and provide for its support. The city said to the Negroes, You contribute the land, and we will support the library. Influential Negroes at once arranged for buying and contributing a site for the library. Then the question of control arose, the Negroes thought that inasmuch as they gave the land and the building was to be used entirely for colored people, they should have one or two members on the board of control. This the city officials, who had charge of the matter, would not hear of. Result? The Negroes would not give the land, and the branch library has never been built. Right in this connection, while I was in Atlanta, the art school, which in the past has often used Negro models, decided to draw the color line there too, and no longer employ them. Formerly Negroes and white men went to the same saloons, and drank at the same bars, as they do now, I am told, in some parts of the South. In a few instances, in Atlanta, 
there were negro saloon keepers and many negro bartenders the first step toward separation was to divide the bar the upper end for white men the lower for negroes after the riot by a new ordinance no saloon was permitted to serve both white and colored men consequently going along decatur street one sees the saloons designated by conspicuous signs whites only colored only and when the negro suffers the ordinary consequences of a prolonged visit to decatur street and finds himself in the city prison he is separated there too from the whites and afterward in court if he comes to trial two bibles are provided he may take his oath on one the other is for the white man when he dies he is buried in a separate cemetery one curious and enlightening example of the infinite ramifications of the color line was given me by mr logan secretary of the atlanta associated charities which is supported by voluntary contributions one day after the riot a subscriber called mr logan on the telephone and said do you help negroes in your society why yes occasionally said mr logan what do you do that for a negro gets hungry and cold like everybody else answered mr logan well you can strike my name from your subscription list i won't give any of my money to a society that helps negroes psychology of the south now this sounds rather brutal but behind it lies the peculiar psychology of the south this very man who refused to contribute to the associated charities may have fed several negroes from his kitchen and had a number of negro pensioners who came to him regularly for help it was simply amazing to me considering the bitterness of racial feeling to see how lavish many white families are in giving food clothing and money to individual negroes whom they know a negro cook often supports her whole family including a lazy husband on what she gets daily from the white man's kitchen in some old families the basket habit of the negroes is taken for granted in the newer ones it is significantly beginning to be called stealing showing that the old order is passing and that the negro is being held more and more strictly to account not as a dependent vassal but as a moral being who must rest upon his own responsibility and often a negro of the old sort will literally bulldoze his hereditary white protector into the loan of quarters and half dollars which both know will never be paid back mr britton superintendent of schools in fulton county gave me an incident in point a big negro with whom he was wholly unacquainted came to his office one day and demanded he did not ask but demanded a job what's your name asked the superintendent marion luther britton was the reply that sounds familiar said mr britton it being indeed his own name yes sir i'm the son of your old mammy in short marion luther had grown up on the old plantation it was the spirit of the hereditary vassal demanding the protection and support of the hereditary baron and he got it of course the negro who makes his appeal on the basis of this old relationship finds no more indulgent or generous friend than the southern white man indulgent to the point of excusing thievery and other petty offenses but the moment he assumes or demands any other relationship or stands up as an independent citizen the white men at least some white men turn upon him with the fiercest hostility the incident of the associated charities may now be understood it was not necessarily cruelty to a cold or hungry negro 
that inspired the demand of the irate subscriber, but the feeling that the associated charities helped Negroes and whites on the same basis, as men, that, therefore, it encouraged social equality, and that, therefore, it was to be stopped. Most of the examples so far given are along the line of social contact, where, of course, the repulsion is intense. Negroes and whites can go to different schools, churches, and saloons, and sit in different street cars, and still live pretty comfortably. But the longer I remain in the South, the more clearly I come to understand how wide and deep, in other less easily discernible ways, the chasm between the races is becoming. THE NEW RACIAL CONSCIOUSNESS AMONG NEGROES One of the natural and inevitable results of the effort of the white man to set the Negro off, as a race by himself, is to awaken in him a new consciousness, a sort of racial consciousness. It drives the Negroes together for defense and offense. Many able Negroes, some largely of white blood, cut off from all opportunity of success in the greater life of the white man, becomes of necessity leaders of their own people. And one of their chief efforts consists in urging Negroes to work together and to stand together. In this they are only developing the instinct of defense against the white man which has always been latent in the race. This instinct exhibits itself in the way in which the mass of Negroes sometimes refuse to turn over a criminal of their color to white justice. It is like the instinctive clannishness of the Highland Scotch or the peasant Irish. I don't know how many Southern people have told me in different ways of how extremely difficult it is to get at the real feeling of a Negro to make him tell what goes on in his clubs and churches or in his innumerable societies. A southern woman told me of a cook who had been in her service for nineteen years. The whole family really loved the old servant. Her mistress made her a confidant, in the way of the old South, in the most intimate private and family matters. The daughters told her their love affairs. They all petted her, and even submitted to many small tyrannies upon her part. "'But do you know,' said my hostess, "'Susie never tells us a thing about her life or her friends, and we couldn't, if we tried, make her tell what goes on in the society she belongs to.' The Negro has long been defensively secretive. Slavery made him that. In the past, the instinct was passive and defensive, but with growing education and intelligent leadership, it is rapidly becoming conscious, self-directive, and offensive. And right there, it seems to me, lies the great cause of the increased strain in the South. Let me illustrate. In the People's Tabernacle in Atlanta, where thousands of Negroes meet every Sunday, I saw this sign in huge letters. For photographs, go to Auburn Photo Gallery, operated by colored men. The old-fashioned Negro preferred to go to the white man for everything. He didn't trust his own people. The new Negro, with growing race consciousness, and feeling that the white man is against him, urges his friends to patronize Negro doctors and dentists and to trade with Negro storekeepers. The extent to which this movement has gone was one of the most surprising things that I, as an unfamiliar northerner, found in Atlanta. In other words, the struggle of the races is becoming more and more rapidly economic. STORY OF A NEGRO SHOE STORE One day, walking in Broad Street, I passed a Negro shoe store. I did not know that there was such a thing in the country. I went in to make inquiries. It was neat, well-kept, and evidently prosperous. 
I found that it was owned by a stock company, organized and controlled wholly by Negroes. The manager was a brisk young mulatto named Harper, a graduate of Atlanta University. I found him dictating to a Negro girl stenographer. There were two reasons, he said, why the store had been opened. One was because the promoters thought it a good business opportunity, and the other was because many Negroes of the better class felt that they did not get fair treatment at white stores. At some places, not all, he said, when a Negro woman went to buy a pair of shoes, the clerk would hand them to her without offering to help her try them on and a negro was always kept waiting until all the white people in the store had been served. Since the new business was opened, he said, it had attracted much of the negro trade, all the leaders advising their people to patronize him. I was much interested to find out how this young man looked upon the race question. His first answer struck me forcibly for it was the universal and typical answer of the businessman the world over, whether white, yellow, or black. "'All I want,' he said, "'is to be protected and let alone so that I can build up this business.' "'What do you mean by protection?' I asked. "'Well, justice between the races. That doesn't mean social equality.' We have a society of our own, and that is all we want. If he can have justice in the courts and fair protection, we can learn to compete with the white stores and get along all right. Such an enterprise as this indicates the new economic separation between the races. Here is business, says the Negro, which I am going to do. Considering the fact that only a few years ago the Negro did no business at all and had no professional men, it is really surprising to a Northerner to see what progress he has made. One of the first lines he took up was, not unnaturally, the undertaking business. Some of the most prosperous Negroes in every southern city are undertakers doing work exclusively, of course, for colored people. Other early enterprises, growing naturally out of a history of personal service, were barbering and tailoring. Atlanta has many small Negro tailor and clothes cleaning shops. Wealthiest Negro in Atlanta The wealthiest Negro in Atlanta, A. F. Herndon, operates the largest barber shop in the city. He is the president of a Negro insurance company, of which there are four in the city, and he owns and rents some fifty dwelling houses. He is said to be worth eighty thousand dollars, all made, of course, since slavery. Another occupation developing naturally from the industrial training of slavery was the business of the building contractor. Several such Negroes, notably Alexander Hamilton, do a considerable business in Atlanta and have made money. They are employed by white men and they hire for their jobs both white and Negro workmen. Small groceries and other stores are of later appearance. I saw at least a score of them in various parts of Atlanta. For the most part they are very small. Many are exceedingly dirty and ill-kept, usually much poorer than corresponding places kept by foreigners, indiscriminately called dagos down here, who are in reality mostly Russian Jews and Greeks. But there are a few Negro grocery stores in Atlanta which are highly creditable. Other business enterprises, including restaurants for Negroes, printing establishments, two newspapers, and several drug stores. In other words, the Negro is rapidly building up his own business enterprises, tending to make himself independent as a race. The appearance of Negro drug stores was the natural result of the increasing practice of Negro doctors and dentists. 
time was when all negroes preferred to go to white practitioners but since educated colored doctors became common they have taken a very large part practically all i am told of the practice in atlanta several of them have had degrees from northern universities two from yale and one of them at least has some little practice among white people the doctors are leaders among their people naturally they give prescriptions to be filled by druggists of their own race hence the growth of the drug business among negroes everywhere in the south the first store to be established in atlanta occupies an old wooden building in auburn avenue it is operated by moses amos a mulatto and enjoys i understand a high degree of prosperity i visited it a post office occupies one corner of the room and it is a familiar gathering place for colored men moses amos told me his story and i found it so interesting and so significant of the way in which negro businessmen have come up that i am setting it down briefly here rise of a negro druggist i shall never forget he said my first day in the drug business it was in eighteen seventy six i remember i was with a crowd of boys in peach tree street where dr huss a southern white man kept a drug store the old doctor was sitting out in front smoking his pipe he called one little negro after another and finally chose me he said i want you to live with me work in the store and look after my horse he sent me to his house and told me to tell his wife to give me some breakfast and i certainly delivered the first message correctly his wife who was a noble lady not only fed me but made me take a bath in a sure enough porcelain tub the first i had ever seen when i went back to the store i was so regenerated that the doctor had to adjust his spectacles before he knew me he said to me you can wash bottles put up castor oil salts and turpentine sell anything you know and put the money in the drawer he showed me how to work the keys of the cash drawer i am going to trust you he said don't steal from me if you want anything ask for it and you can have it and don't lie i hate a liar a boy who will lie will steal too i remained with dr huss thirteen years he sent me to school and paid my tuition out of his own pocket he trusted me fully often leaving me in charge of his business for weeks at a time when he died i formed a partnership with dr butler dr slater and others and bought the store our business grew and prospered so that within a few years we had a stock worth three thousand dollars and a cash of eight hundred dollars that made us ambitious we bought land built a new store and went into debt to do it we didn't know much about business that's the negro's chief trouble and we lost trade by changing our location so that in spite of all we could do we failed and lost everything though we finally paid our creditors every cent after many trials we started again in eighteen ninety six in our present store today we are doing a good business we can get all the credit we want from wholesale houses we employ six clerks and pay good interest on the capital invested greatest difficulties met by negro businessmen i asked him what was the greatest difficulty he had to meet he said it was the credit system the fact that many negroes have not learned financial responsibility once he said he nearly stopped business on this account i remember he said the last time we got into trouble we needed four hundred dollars to pay our bills i picked out some of our best customers and gave them a heart-to-heart -heart talk 
and told them what trouble we were in. They all promised to pay, but on the day set for payment, out of $1,680 which they owed us, we collected just $8.25. After that experience we came down to a cash basis. We trust no one, and since then we have been doing well. He said he thought the best opportunity for Negro development was in the South, where he had his whole race behind him. He said he had once been tempted to go north looking for an opening. "'How did you make out?' I asked. "'Well, I'll tell you,' he said. "'When I got there I wanted a shave. I walked the streets two hours visiting barber shops, and they all turned me away with some excuse. I finally had to buy a razor and shave myself. That was just a sample.' I came home disgusted and decided to fight it out down here where I understood conditions. Of course, only a comparatively few Negroes are able to get ahead in business. They must depend almost exclusively on the trade of their own race, and they must meet the highly organized competition of white men. But it is certainly significant that even a few are able to make progress along these unfamiliar lines. Many southern men I met had little or no idea of the remarkable extent of this advancement among the better class of Negroes. Here is a strange thing. I don't know how many southern men have prefaced their talks with me with words something like this. You can't expect to know the Negro after a short visit. You must live down here like we do. Now, I know the Negroes like a book. I was brought up with them. I know what they'll do and what they won't do. I have had Negroes in my house all my life. But curiously enough, I found that these men rarely knew anything about the better class of Negroes. Those who were in business or in independent occupations, those who owned their own homes. They did come into contact with the servant negro, the field hand, the common laborer, who make up, of course, the great mass of the race. On the other hand, the best class of negroes did not know the higher class of white people, and based their suspicion and hatred upon the acts of the poorer sort of whites, with whom they naturally came into contact. The best elements of the two races are as far apart as though they lived in different continents, and that is one of the chief causes of the growing danger of the southern situation. It is a striking fact that one of the first, almost instinctive, efforts at reconstruction after the Atlanta riot was to bring the best elements of both races together so that they might, by becoming acquainted and gaining confidence in each other, allay suspicion and bring influence to bear upon the lawless elements of both white people and colored. Many Southerners look back wistfully to the faithful, simple, ignorant, obedient, cheerful, old plantation negro and deplore his disappearance. They want the new South, but the old negro that negro is disappearing forever along with the old feudalism and the old-time exclusively agricultural life a new negro is not less inevitable than a new white man and a new south and the new negro as my clever friend says doesn't laugh as much as the old one it is grim business he is in this being free this new fierce struggle in the open competitive field for the daily loaf? Many go down to vagrancy and crime in that struggle. A few will rise. The more rapid the progress, with the trained white man setting the pace, the more frightful the mortality. End of chapter 2 
Chapter 3 of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Southern City Negro. After my arrival in Atlanta, and when I had begun to understand some of the more superficial ramifications of the color line, as I related in the last chapter, I asked several southern men whose acquaintance I had made where I could see the poorest or criminal class of Negroes. So much has been said of the danger arising from this element of southern population, and it plays such a part in every discussion of the race question, that I was anxious to learn all I could about it. "'Go down any morning to Judge Broyles's court,' they said to me, "'and you'll see the lowest of the low.' So I went down, the first of many visits I made to police and justice courts. I chose a Monday morning that I might see to the best advantage the accumulation of the arrests of Saturday and Sunday. The police station stands in Decatur Street, in the midst of the very worst section of the city, surrounded by low saloons, dives, and pawn shops. The court occupies a great room upstairs and it was crowded that morning to its capacity. Besides the police, lawyers, court officers, and white witnesses, at least one hundred and fifty spectators filled the seats behind the rail, nearly all of them Negroes. The ordinary Negro loves nothing better than to sit and watch the proceedings of a court. Judge Broyles kindly invited me to a seat on the platform at his side, where I could look into the faces of the prisoners and hear all that was said. In a Southern Police Court It was a profoundly interesting and significant spectacle. In the first place, the very number of cases was staggering. The docket that morning carried over one hundred names, men, women, and children, white and black. The court worked hard but it was nearly two o'clock in the afternoon before the room was cleared. Atlanta, as I showed in a former chapter, has the largest number of arrests, considering the population, of any important city in the United States. I found that 13,511 of the total of 21,702 persons arrested in 1906 were Negroes, or sixty-two per cent, whereas the colored population of the city is only forty per cent of the total. A very large proportion of the arrests that Monday morning were Negroes, with a surprising proportion of women and of mere children. In 1906, 3,194 Negro women were arrested in Atlanta. It was altogether a pitiful and disheartening exhibition a spectacle of sodden ignorance, reckless vice, dissipation. Most of the cases, raveled out, led back to the saloon. "'Where's your home?' the judge would ask, and in a number of cases the answer was, "'I come here from the country.' Over and over again it was the story of the country negro, or the negro who had been working on the railroad, in the cotton fields or in the sawmills who had entered upon the more complex life of the city most of the country districts of the south prohibit the sale of liquor and negroes especially have comparatively little temptation of this nature nor are they subjected to the many other glittering pitfalls of city life but of late years the opportunities of the city have attracted the black people just as they have the whites, in large numbers. Atlanta had many saloons and other places of vice, and the results are to be seen in Judge Broyles's court any morning. And not only Negroes, but the poor whites who have come in from the mountains and the small farms to work in the mills. They, too, suffer fully as much as the Negroes. Negro Cocaine Victims not a few of the cases, both black and white, showed evidence of cocaine or morphine poisoning, 
the blear eyes, the unsteady nerves. "'What's the trouble here?' asked the judge. "'Coke,' said the officer. Ten seventy five, said the judge, naming the amount of the fine. They buy the coke in the form of a powder and snuff it up the nose. A certain patent catar medicine, which is nearly all cocaine, is sometimes used. Ten cents will purchase enough to make a man wholly irresponsible for his acts and capable of any crime. The cocaine habit which seems to be spreading, for there are always druggists who will break the law, has been a curse to the Negro, and has resulted directly, as the police told me, in much crime. I was told of two cases in particular of offenses against women in which the Negro was a victim of the drug habit. So society, in pursuit of wealth, south and north, preys upon the ignorant and weak, and then wonders why crime is prevalent. One has only to visit police courts in the South to see in how many curious ways the contact of the races generates fire. "'What's the trouble here?' inquires the judge. The white complainant, a boy, says, "'This nigger insulted me,' and he tells the epithet the negro applied." Did you call him that? No, sir, never called him no such name. 375. You mustn't insult white people. And here is the report of the case of a six-year-old Negro boy from the Georgian. Because Robert Lee Buster, a six-year-old Negro boy, insulted Maggie McDermott, a little girl, who lives at 507 Simpson Street Wednesday afternoon, he was given a whipping in the police station Thursday morning that will make him remember to be good. The case was heard in the juvenile court before Judge Broyles. It was shown that the little Negro had made an insulting remark to the little girl. STORY OF A NEGRO ARREST The very suspicion and fear that exist give rise to many difficulties, one illuminating case came up that morning. A strapping Negro man was brought before the judge. He showed no marks of dissipation and was respectfully dressed. Confronting him were two plain-clothes policemen, one with his neck wrapped up, one with a bandage around his arm. Both said that they had been stabbed by the Negro with a jackknife. The Negro said he was a hotel porter, and he had the white manager of the hotel and court to testify to his good character, sobriety, and industry. It seems that he was going home from work at nine o'clock in the evening, and it was dark. He said he was afraid, and had been afraid since the riot. At the same time, the two policemen were looking for a burglar. They saw the Negro porter and ordered him to stop. Not being in uniform, the Negro said he thought the officers were just plain white men who were going to attack him. When he started to run, the officers tried to arrest him, and he drew his jackknife and began to fight. And here he was in court. The judge said, You mustn't attack officers, and bound him over to trial in the higher court. A White Man and a Negro Woman Another case shows one of the strange relationships which grow out of southern conditions. An old white man, much agitated and very pale, was brought before the judge. With him came a much younger, comely-appearing woman. Both were well-dressed and looked respectable, so much so, indeed, that there was a stir of interest and curiosity among the spectators. Why had they been arrested? As they stood in front of the judge's desk, the old man hung his head, but the woman looked up with such an expression, tearless and tragic, as I hope I shall not have to see again. "'What's the charge?' asked the judge. "'Adultery,' said the officer. The woman winced. The old man did not look up. 
the judge glanced from one to the other in surprise. "'Why don't you get married?' he asked. "'The woman,' said the officer, "'is a nigger.' "'She was as white as I am, probably an octoroon. I could not have distinguished her from a white person, and she deceived even the experienced eye of the judge.' "'Is that so?' asked the judge. The man continued to hang his head. The woman looked up. Neither said a word. It then came out that they had lived together as man and wife for many years, and that they had children nearly grown. One of the girls, and a very bright ambitious girl, as I learned later, was a student in Atlanta University, a Negro college, where she was supported by her father, who made good wages as a telegraph operator. Some neighbor had complained, and the man and woman were arrested. "'Is all this true?' asked the judge. Neither said a word. "'You can't marry under the Georgia law,' said the judge. "'I'll have to bind you over for trial in the county court.' They were led back to the prisoners' rooms. A few minutes later the bailiff came out quickly and said to the judge, the old man has fallen in a faint. Not long afterward, they half led, half carried him out across the courtroom. One thing impressed me especially, not only in this court, but in all others I have visited. A Negro brought in for drunkenness, for example, was punished much more severely than a white man arrested for the same offense. The injustice which the weak everywhere suffer north and south, is in the south visited upon the negro. The white man sometimes escaped with a reprimand. He was sometimes fined three dollars and costs. But the negro, especially if he had no white man to intercede for him, was usually punished with a ten or fifteen dollar fine, which often meant that he must go to the chain gang. One of the chief causes of complaint by the Negroes of Atlanta has been of the rough treatment of the police and of unjust arrests. After the riot, when the Civic League, composed of the foremost white citizens of Atlanta, was organized, one of the first subjects that came up was that of injustice to the Negro. Mr. Hopkins, the leader of the League, said to me, we complain that the Negroes will not help to bring the criminals of their race to justice. One reason for that is that the Negro has too little confidence in our courts. We must give him that above all things. In accordance with this plan, the Civic League, heartily supported by Judge Broyles, employed a young lawyer, Mr. Underwood, to appear regularly in court and look after the interests of Negroes. CONVICTS MAKING A PROFIT FOR GEORGIA One reason for the very large number of arrests, in Georgia particularly, lies in the fact that the state and the counties make a profit out of their prison system. No attempt is ever made to reform a criminal, either white or colored. Convicts are hired out to private contractors or worked on the public roads. Last year the net profit to Georgia from its chain gangs, to which the prison commission refers with pride, reached the great sum of $354,853.55. Of course a very large proportion of the prisoners are Negroes. The demand for convicts by rich sawmill operators, owners of brickyards, large farmers, and others is far in advance of the supply. The natural tendency is to convict as many men as possible. It furnishes steady, cheap labor to the contractors and a profit to the state. Undoubtedly, this explains, in some degree, the very large number of criminals, especially Negroes, in Georgia. One of the leading political forces in Atlanta is a very prominent banker, who is a dominant member of the city police board. He is also the owner of extensive brickyards near Atlanta, where many convicts are employed. 
some of the large fortunes in atlanta have come chiefly from the labor of chain gangs of convicts leased from the state fate of the black boy as i have already suggested one of the things that impressed me strongly in visiting judge broyles's court and others like it was the astonishing number of children especially negroes arrested some of them were very young and often exceedingly bright looking from the records i find that in 1906 one boy six years old seven of seven years thirty-three of eight years sixty-nine of nine years a hundred and seven of ten years a hundred and forty-two of eleven years and two hundred and nineteen of twelve years were arrested and brought into court in other words five hundred and seventy-eight boys and girls mostly negroes under twelve years of age i should think i said to a police officer you would have trouble in taking care of all these children in your reformatories reformatories he said there aren't any what do you do with them well if they're bad we put them in the stockade or the chain gang otherwise they're turned loose i found however that a new state juvenile reformatory was just being opened in milledgeville which may accommodate a few negro boys an attempt is also being made in atlanta to get hold of some of the children through a new probation system i talked with the excellent officer mr glower who works in conjunction with judge broyles he reaches a good many white boys but very few negroes of one thousand and eleven boys and girls under sixteen arrested in nineteen o five eight hundred and nineteen were black but of those given the advantage of the probation system fifty were white and only seven colored in other words out of eight hundred and nineteen arrests of negro children only seven enjoyed the benefits of the probation system mr glower has endeavored to secure a colored assistant who would help look after the swarming negro children who are becoming criminals the city refused to appropriate money for that purpose but some of the leading colored citizens agreed to contribute one dollar a month each and a negro woman was employed to help with the colored children brought into court excellent work was done but owing to the feeling after the riot the negro assistant discontinued her work care of negro orphans with many hundreds of negro orphans waifs and foundlings the state or city does very little to help them if it were not for the fact that the negroes something like the jews are wonderfully helpful to one another adopting orphan children with the greatest willingness there would be much suffering several orphanages in the state are conducted by the colored people themselves either through their churches or by private subscription in atlanta the cary steel orphanage which is managed by negroes has received an appropriation yearly from the city and has taken children sent by the city charities department after the riot the appropriation was suddenly cut off without explanation but through the activities of the new civic league it was i understand restored without proper reformatories or asylums with small advantage of the probation system hundreds of negro children are on the streets of atlanta every day shooting craps stealing learning to drink a few shut up in the stockade or in chain gangs without any attempt to reform them or teach them take lessons in crime from older offenders and come out worse than they went in they spread abroad the lawlessness they learn and finally commit some frightful crime and get back into the chain gang for life where they make a profit for the state every child white or colored is getting an education somewhere 
if that education is not in schools or at home or in case of incorrigibility in proper reformatories then it is on the streets or in chain gangs why negro children are not in school my curiosity aroused by the very large number of young prisoners led me next to inquire why these children were not in school i visited a number of schools and i talked with l m landrum the assistant superintendent compulsory education is not enforced anywhere in the south so the children may run the streets unless their parents insist upon sending them to school i found more than this however that atlanta did not begin to have enough school facilities for the children who wanted to go like many rapidly growing cities both south and north it has been difficult to keep up with the demand just as in the north the tenement classes are often neglected so in the south the lower class which is the negro is neglected several new schools have been built for white children but there has been no new school for colored children in fifteen or twenty years though one negro private school has been taken over within the last few years by the city so crowded are the colored schools that they have two sessions a day one squad of children coming in the forenoon another in the afternoon the colored teachers therefore do double work for which they receive about two-thirds as much salary as the white teachers though many southern cities have instituted industrial training in the public schools atlanta so far has done nothing the president of the board of education in his last published report nineteen o three calls attention to this fact and says also while on the subject of negro schools permit me to call your attention to their overcrowded condition in every negro school many teachers teach two sets of pupils each set for one half of a school day the last bond election was carried by a majority of only thirty-three votes to my personal knowledge more than thirty-three negroes voted for the bonds on the solemn assurance that by the passage of the bonds the negro children would receive more school accommodations the eagerness of the colored people for a chance to send their children to school is something astonishing and pathetic they will submit to all sorts of inconveniences in order that their children may get an education one day i visited the mill neighborhood of atlanta to see how the poorer classes of white people lived i found one very comfortable home occupied by a family of mill employees they hired a negro woman to cook for them and while they sent their children to the mill to work the cook sent her children to school how negroes educate themselves here is a curious and significant thing i found in atlanta because there is not enough room for negro children in public schools the colored people maintain many private schools the largest of these called morris brown college has nearly a thousand pupils some of them are boarders from the country but the greater proportion are day pupils from seven years old up who come in from the neighborhood this college in reality a grammar school is managed and largely supported by tuition and contributions from negroes though some subscriptions are obtained in the north besides this college there are many small private schools conducted by negro women and supported wholly by the tuition paid the negroes thus voluntarily taxing themselves heavily for their educational opportunities one afternoon in atlanta i passed a small rather dilapidated home just as i reached the gate i heard a great cackling of voices and much laughter colored children began to pour out of the house what's this i said and i turned in to see I found a negro woman, the teacher, standing in the doorway. 
she had just dismissed her pupils for recess. She was holding school in two little rooms where some fifty children must have been crowded to suffocation. Everything was very primitive and inconvenient, but it was a school. She collected, she told me, a dollar a month tuition for each child. Molly McHugh's school, perhaps the best-known private school for Negroes in the city, has 250 pupils. Many children also find educational opportunities in the Negro colleges of the city, Clark University, Atlanta University, and Spelman Seminary, which are supported partly by the Negroes themselves, but mostly by Northern philanthropy. Mr. Landrum gave me a copy of the last statistical report of the school board, 1903, from which these facts appear. School population, white, 14,465, colored, 8,118. Number of schools, white, 20, colored, 5. Teachers, white, 200, colored, 49. With seats, white, 10,052, colored, 2,445. Without seats, white, 4,413, colored, 5,673. Even with a double daily session for colored pupils, nearly half of the Negro children in Atlanta, even in 1903, were barred from the public schools from lack of facilities, and the number has increased largely in the last four years. Some of these are accommodated in the private schools and colleges which I have mentioned, but there still remains hundreds, even thousands, who are getting no schooling of any kind, but who are nevertheless being educated on the streets and for criminal lives white instruction for black children i made a good many inquiries to find out what was being done outside of the public schools by the white people toward training the negro either morally industrially or intellectually and i was astonished to find that it was next to nothing the Negro is, of course, not welcome at the white churches or Sunday schools, and the sentiment is so strong against teaching the Negro that it is a brave Southern man or woman indeed who dares attempt anything of the sort. I did find, however, that the Central Presbyterian Church of Atlanta conducted a Negro Sunday school. Of this, Dr. Theron H. Rice, the pastor, said, the Sunday school conducted in Atlanta by my church is the outcome of the effort of some of the most earnest and thoughtful of our people to give careful religious training to the Negroes of this generation and thus to conserve the influence begun with the fathers and mothers and the grandfathers and grandmothers of these colored children when they were taught personally by their devoted Christian masters and mistresses. The work is small in point of the number reached, but it has been productive of sturdy character and law-abiding citizenship. A white man or woman, and especially a northern white man or woman, in Atlanta who teaches Negroes is rigorously ostracized by white society. I visited one of the Negro colleges where there are a number of white teachers from the north, we had quite a talk. When I came to leave, one of the teachers said to me, You don't know how good it seems to talk with someone from the outside world. We work here year in and year out without a white visitor, except those who have some necessary business with the institution. Explaining the attitude toward these northern teachers, and we must understand just how the southern people feel in this matter, a prominent clergyman said that a lady who made a social call upon a teacher in that institution would not feel secure against having to meet Negroes socially, and that when the call was returned, a similar embarrassing situation might be created. 
apologizing for helping Negroes. Just in this connection, I found a very remarkable and significant letter published in the Orangeburg, South Carolina News, signed by a well-to-do white citizen who thus apologizes for a kind act to a Negro school. I had left my place of business here on a business trip a few miles below. On returning, I came by the above-mentioned school, the Prince Institute, colored, and was held up by the teacher and begged to make a few remarks to the children. Very reluctantly I did so, not thinking that publicity would be given to it, or that I was doing anything that would offend anyone. I wish to say here and now that I am heartily sorry for what I did, and I hope after this humble confession and expression of regret that all whom I have offended will forgive me. The sentiment indicated by this letter, while widely prevalent, is by no means universal. I have seen Southern white men address Negro schools and Negro gatherings many times since I have been down here. Some of the foremost men in the South have accepted Booker T. Washington's invitations to speak at Tuskegee. And concerning the very letter that I reproduce above, the Charlotte Observer, a strong Southern newspaper, which copied it, said, A man would better be dead than to thus abase himself. This man did right to address the pupils of a colored school, but has spoiled all by apologizing for it. Few people have conceived that race prejudice went so far, even in South Carolina, as is here indicated. Logically, it is to be assumed that this jellyfish was about to be put under the ban, and to secure exemption from this, published this abject card. To it was appended a certificate from certain citizens saying they are as anxious to see the colored race elevated as any people, but by all means let it be done inside the color line. The narrowness and malignity betrayed by this Orangeburg incident is exceedingly unworthy, and those guilty of it should be ashamed of themselves. The Rev. H. S. Bradley, for a long time one of the leading clergymen of Atlanta, now of St. Louis, said in a sermon published in the Atlanta Constitution, We have not been wholly lacking in our effort to help. There are few schools and churches supported by Southern whites for the Negroes. Here and there a man like George Williams Walker, of the aristocracy of South Carolina, and a woman like Miss Bell H. Bennett, one of the blue blood of Kentucky, goes as teacher to the Negro youth and seeks, in a Christly spirit of fraternity, to bring them to a higher plane of civil and moral manhood, but the number like them can almost be counted on fingers of both hands. Our southern churches have spent probably a hundred times as much money since the Civil War in an effort to evangelize the people of China, Japan, india south america africa mexico and cuba as they have spent to give the gospel to the negroes at our doors it is often true that opportunity is overlooked because it lies at our feet end of chapter three part one Part two of chapter three of Following the Color Line, an account of Negro citizenship in the American democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning the Vagrant Negro Before I get away from observations of the low-class Negro, I must speak of the subject of vagrancy. Many white men have told me with impatience of the great number of idle or partly idle Negroes, idle while every industry and most of the farming districts of Georgia are crying for more labor. And from my observation in Atlanta, I should say that there were a good many idle or partly idle Negroes, 
even after the riot which served i understand to drive many of them away five days before the riot of last september a committee of the city council visited some forty saloons one afternoon and by actual count found two thousand four hundred and fifty five negroes and a hundred and fifty two white men drinking at the bars or lounging around the doorways in some of these saloons conducted by white men and permitted to exist by the city authorities pictures of nude white women were displayed as an added attraction has this anything to do with negro crimes against white women after the riot these conditions in atlanta were much improved and in january nineteen o eight all the saloons were closed increased negro idleness is the result in large measure of the marvelous and rapid changes in southern conditions the south has been and is today dependent on a single labor supply the negro now negroes though recruited by a high birth rate have not been increasing in any degree as rapid as the demand for labor incident to the development of every sort of industry railroads lumbering mines to say nothing of the increased farm area and the added requirements of growing cities with this enormous increased demand for labor the negro supply has relatively been decreasing many have gone north and west many have bought farms of their own thousands by education have became professional men teachers preachers and even merchants and bankers always draining away the best and most industrious men of the race and reducing by so much the available supply of common labor in short those negroes who were capable have been going the same way as the unskilled irishman and german in the north upward through the door of education but unlike the north there have been no other laborers coming in to take their places what has been the result naturally a fierce contest between agriculture and industry for the limited and dwindling supply of the only labor they had negro monopoly on labor so they bid against one another it was as though the negro had a monopoly on labor and within the last few years day wages for negro workers have jumped from fifty or sixty cents to a dollar twenty five and a dollar fifty often more a pure matter of competition a similar advance has affected all sorts of servant labor cooks waiters maids porters high wages scarcity of labor and the consequent loss of opportunity for taking advantage of the prevailing prosperity would in any community south or north whether the labor was white or black produce a spirit of impatience and annoyance on the part of the employing class i found it evident enough last summer in kansas where the farmers were unable to get workers to save their crops and the servant problem is not more provoking certainly in the south than in the north and west indeed it is the labor problems more than any other one cause that has held the south back and is holding it back today but the south has an added cause of annoyance higher wages instead of producing more and better labor as they would naturally be expected to do have actually served to reduce the supply this may at first seem paradoxical but it is easily explainable and it lies deep down beneath many of the perplexities which surround the race problem most negroes as i have said were and still are of course farm dwellers and farm dwellers in the hitherto wasteful southern way their living is easy to get and very simple in that warm climate they need few clothes a shack for a home their living standards are low 
they have not learned to save. There has not been time since slavery for them to attain the sense of responsibility which would encourage them to get ahead. And moreover, they have been and are today largely under the discipline of white landowners. What was the effect then of rapid advance in wages? The poorer class of Negroes, naturally indolent and happy-go-lucky, found that they could make as much money in two or three days as they had formerly earned in a whole week. It was enough to live on as well as they had ever lived. Why, then, work more than two days a week? It was the logic of a child, but it was the logic used. Everywhere I went in the South I heard the same story. High wages, coupled with the difficulty of getting anything like continuous work from this class of colored men. On the other hand, the better and more industrious Negroes, who would work continuously, and there are unnumbered thousands of them, as faithful as any workers, occasionally saved their surplus, bought little farms or businesses of their own, and began to live on a better scale. One of the first things they did after getting their footing was to take their wives and daughters out to the white man's kitchen and to send their children from the cotton fields, where the white man needed them, to the schoolhouse, where the tendency, exactly as with white children, was to educate them away from farm employment. With the development of ambition and a higher standard of living, the Negro follows the steps of the rising Irishman or Italian. He has a better home. He wants his wife to take care of it, and he insists upon the education of his children. In this way, higher wages have tended to cut down the already limited supply of labor, producing annoyance, placing greater obstacles in the way of that material development of which the Southerner is so justly proud. And this, not at all unnaturally, has given rise on the one hand to complaints against the lazy Negro who will work only two days in the week, that he may loaf the other five. And on the other hand, it has found expression in blind and bitter hostility to the education which enables the better sort of Negro to rise above the unskilled employment and the domestic service of which the South is so keenly in need. It is human nature to blame men, not conditions. Here is unlimited work to do. Here is the Negro who has been for centuries, and is today, depended upon to do it. It is not done. The natural result is to throw the blame wholly upon the Negro, and not upon the deep economic conditions and tendencies which have actually caused the scarcity of labor. Immigrants to Take the Negroes' Places But within the last year or two, thinking men in the South have begun to see this particular root of the difficulty, and a great new movement looking to the encouragement of immigration from foreign countries has been started. In November 1906, the first shipload of immigrants ever brought from Europe directly to a South Carolina port were landed at Charleston with great ceremony and rejoicing. If a steady stream of immigrants can be secured, and if they can be employed on satisfactory terms with the Negro, it will go far toward relieving race tension in the South. Of course idleness leads to crime and one of the present efforts in the South is toward a more rigid enforcement of laws against vagrancy. In this the white people have the sympathy of the leading Negroes. I was struck with one passage in the discussion at the last workers' conference at Tuskegee. William E. Holmes, president of a colored college at Macon, Georgia, was speaking. Someone interrupted him. I would like to ask if you think the Negro is any more disposed to become loafer or vagrant than any other people under the same conditions? Well, 
said Mr. Holmes, taking a deep breath. We cannot afford to do what other races do. We haven't a single solitary man or woman among us we can afford to support as an idler. It may be that other races have made so much progress that they can afford to support loafers, but we are not yet in that condition. Some of us have the impression that the world owes us a living. That is a misfortune. I must confess that I have become convinced that at the present time we furnish a larger number of loafers than any other race of people on this continent. These frank remarks did not meet with the entire approval of the members of the conference, but the discussion seemed to indicate that there was a great deal more of truth in them than the leaders and teachers of the Negro are disposed to admit. THE WORTHLESS NEGRO I tried to see as much as I could of this worthless Negro, who is about the lowest stratum of humanity, it seems to me, of any in our American life. He is usually densely ignorant, often a wanderer, working today with a railroad gang, tomorrow on some city works, the next day picking cotton. He has lost his white friends, his white folks, as he calls them, and he has not attained the training or self-direction to stand alone. He works only when he is hungry, and he is as much a criminal as he dares to be. Many such Negroes are supported by their wives or by women with whom they live, for morality and the home virtues among this class are unknown. A woman who works as a cook in a white family will often take enough from the kitchen to feed a worthless vagabond of a man and keep him in idleness, or worse. A Negro song exactly expresses this state of beatitude. I done has to work so hard, I's got a gal in a white man's yard. Every night, about half past eight, I goes around to the white man's gate. She brings me butter and she brings me lard. I don't has to work so hard. This worthless Negro, without training or education, grown up from the neglected children I have already spoken of, evident in his idleness around saloons and depots, this Negro provokes the just wrath of the people and gives a bad name to the entire Negro race. In numbers he is, of course, small, compared with the eight million Negroes in the South who perform the enormous bulk of hard manual labor upon which rests Southern prosperity. HOW THE WORKING NEGRO LIVES Above this low stratum of criminal or semi-criminal Negroes is a middle class, comprising the great body of the race, the workers. They are crowded into straggling settlements like Darktown and Jackson Row, a few owning their homes, but the majority renting precariously, earning good wages, harmless for the most part, but often falling into petty crime. Poverty here, however, lacks the tragic note that it strikes in the crowded sections of northern cities. The temperament of the Negro is irrepressibly cheerful. He overflows from his small home and sings and laughs in his streets. No matter how ragged or forlorn he may be, good humor sits upon his countenance, and his squalor is not unpicturesque. A banjo, a mullet supper from time to time, an exciting revival give him real joys. Most of the families of this middle class, some of whom are deserted wives with children, have their white folks for whom they do washing, cooking, gardening, or other service, and all have church connections, so that they have a real place in the social fabric and a certain code of self-respect. I tried to see all I could of this phase of life. I visited many of the poorer Negro homes, and I was often received in squalid rooms with a dignity of politeness which would have done credit to a society woman. For the Negro, naturally, is a sort of Frenchman. 
and if I can sum up the many visits I made in a single conclusion, I should say, I think, that I was chiefly impressed by the tragic punishment meted out to ignorance and weakness by our complex society. I would find a home of one or two rooms meanly furnished, but having in one corner a glittering cottage organ, or on the mantel shelf a glorified gilt clock. Crayon portraits, inexpressibly crude and ugly, but framed gorgeously, are not uncommon. The first uncertain primitive, not unpitiful, reachings out after some of the graces of a broader life. Many of these things are brought from agents, and the prices paid are extortionate. Often a Negro family will pay monthly for a year or so on some showy clock or chromo or music box or decorated mirror, paying the value of it a dozen times a year, only to have it seized when through sickness or lack of foresight they fail to meet a single note. Installment houses prey upon them. Pawnbrokers suck their blood, and they are infinitely the victims of patent medicines. It is rare indeed that I entered a negro cabin, even the poorest, without seeing one or more bottles of some abominable cure-all. The amount yearly expended by negroes for patent medicines, which are glaringly advertised in all southern newspapers, must be enormous, millions of dollars. I had an interesting sidelight on conditions one day while walking in one of the most fashionable residence districts of Atlanta. I saw a magnificent gray stone residence standing somewhat back from the street. I said to my companion, who was a resident of the city, "'That's a fine home.' "'Yes, stop a minute,' he said. "'I want to tell you about that. The anti-kink man lives there.' "'Anti-kink?' I asked in surprise. "'Yes. The man who occupies that house is one of the wealthiest men here.' He made his money by selling to Negroes a preparation to smooth the kinks out of their wool. They're simply crazy on that subject. Does it work? You haven't seen any straight-haired Negroes, have you? he asked. Ignorance carries a big burden and climbs a rocky road. Old Mammies and Nurses the mass of colored people still maintain, as I have said, a more or less intimate connection with white families, frequently a very beautiful and sympathetic relationship, like that of the mammies or nurses. To one who has heard so much of racial hatred as I have since I have been down here, a little incident that I observed the other day comes with a charm hardly describable. I saw a carriage stop in front of a home. The expected daughter had arrived, a very pretty girl indeed. She stepped out eagerly. Her father was halfway down to the gate, but ahead of him was a very old negro woman in the cleanest of clean starched dresses. Honey, she said eagerly. Mammy, exclaimed the girl and the two rushed into each other's arms, clasping and kissing, the white girl and the old black woman. I thought to myself, there's no Negro problem there. That's just plain human love. Master superseded by Boss Often I have heard Negroes refer to my white folks, and similarly the white man still speaks of my Negroes. The old term of slavery, the use of the word master, has wholly disappeared, and in its place has arisen, not without significance, the round term boss, or sometimes cap, or cap'n. To this the white man responds with the first name of the Negro, Jim, or Susie, or if the Negro is old or especially respected, Uncle Jim, or Aunt Susan. 
to an unfamiliar northerner one of the very interesting and somewhat amusing phases of conditions down here is the panic fear displayed over the use of the word mr or mrs no negro is ever called mr or mrs by a white man that would indicate social equality a southern white man told me with humor of his difficulties now i admire booker washington i regard him as a great man and yet i couldn't call him mr washington we were all in a quandary until a doctor's degree was given him that saved our lives we all call him dr washington now sure enough i don't think i have heard him called mr washington since i came down here it is always doctor or just booker they are ready to call a negro professor or bishop or the reverend but not mr in the same way a negro may call miss mary smith by the familiar miss mary but if he called her miss smith she would be deeply incensed the formal miss smith would imply social equality i digress but i have wanted to impress these relationships there are all gradations of negroes between the wholly dependent old family servant and the new educated negro professional or business man and correspondingly every degree of treatment from indulgence to intense hostility i must tell in spite of lack of room one beautiful story i heard at atlanta which so well illustrates the old relationship there is in the family of dr j s todd a well-known citizen of atlanta an old old servant called affectionately uncle billy he has been so long in the family that in reality he is served as much as he serves during the riot last september he was terrified he did not dare to go home at night so miss louise the doctor's daughter took uncle billy home through the dark streets when she was returning one of her friends met her and was much alarmed that she should venture out in a time of so much danger what are you doing out here this time of night he asked why she replied as if it were the most natural answer in the world i had to take uncle billy safely home over against this story i want to reproduce a report from a kentucky newspaper which will show quite the other extreme tennessee farmer has negro bishop and his wife ejected from a sleeping car irvine mcgraw a tennessee farmer brought kentucky's jim crow law into prominent notice yesterday on an illinois central pullman car when mcgraw entered the car he saw the colored divine rev dr c h phillips bishop of the colored methodist episcopal churches in tennessee north carolina texas and a portion of arizona and new mexico and his wife preparing to retire for the night he demanded that the conductor order them out of the car but the conductor refused after he entered kentucky he hunted for an officer at every station and finally at hopkinsville policeman bryant baker agreed to undertake the task of ejecting the negroes from the car the train was held nine minutes while they dressed and repaired to the colored compartment i have now described two of the three great classes of negroes first the worthless and idle negro often a criminal comparatively small in numbers but perniciously evident second the great middle class of negroes who do the manual work of the south above these a third class few in numbers but most influential in their race are the progressive property-owning negroes who have wholly severed their old intimate ties with the white people and who have been getting further and further away from them a white man's problem 
It keeps coming to me that this is more a white man's problem than it is a Negro problem. The white man, as well as the black, is being tried by fire. The white man is in full control of the South, politically, socially, industrially. The Negro, as ex-Governor Northern points out, is his helpless ward. What will he do with him? Speaking of the education of the Negro, and in direct reference to the conditions in Atlanta which I have already described, many men have said to me, Think of the large sums that the South has spent and is spending on the education of the Negro. The Negro does not begin to pay for his education and taxes. Neither do the swarming Slavs, Italians, and Poles in our northern cities. They pay little in taxes, and yet enormous sums are expended in their improvement. For their benefit? Of course, but chiefly for ours. It is better to educate men in school than to let them so educate themselves as to become a menace to society. The present kind of education in the South may possibly be wrong, but for the protection of society it is as necessary to train every Negro as it is every white man. When I saw the crowds of young Negroes being made criminal through lack of proper training, I could not help thinking how pitilessly ignorance finally revenges itself upon that society which neglects or exploits it. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 In the Black Belt, the Negro Farmer The cotton-picking season was drawing to its close when I left for the Black Belt of Georgia. So many friends in Atlanta had said, The city Negro isn't the real Negro. You must go out on the cotton plantations in the country. There you'll see the genuine black African in all his primitive glory. It is quite true that the typical Negro is a farmer. The great mass of the race in the South dwells in the country. According to the last census, out of eight million Negroes in the southern states, Six million five hundred and fifty eight thousand one hundred and seventy three or eighty three per cent lived on the farms or in rural villages. The crowded city life which I have already described represents not the common condition of the masses of the negro race but the newer development which accompanies the growth of industrial and urban life. In the city, the races are forced more violently together, socially and economically, than in the country, producing acute crises, but it is in the old agricultural regions where the Negro is in such masses, where ideas change slowly, and old institutions persist, that the problem really presents the greatest difficulties. There is no better time of year to see the South than November for then it wears the smile of abundance. The country I went through, rolling red hills, or black bottoms, pine-clad in places, with pleasant farm openings dotted with cabins, often dilapidated but picturesque, and the busy little towns, wore somehow an air of brisk comfort. The fields were lively with negro cotton-pickers, I saw bursting loads of the new lint drawn by mules or oxen, trailing along the country roads. All the gins were puffing busily. At each station, platform cotton bales by scores or hundreds stood ready for shipment, and the towns were cheerful with farmers, white and black, who now had money to spend. The heat of the summer had gone. The air bore the tang of a brisk autumn coolness. It was a good time of the year, 
and everybody seemed to feel it. Many Negroes got on or off at every station with laughter and snouted goodbyes. And so, just at evening, after a really interesting journey, I reached Hawkinsville, a thriving town of some three thousand people just south of the center of Georgia. Pulaski County, of which Hawkinsville is the seat, with an ambitious new courthouse, is a typical county of the Black Belt. A census map which is here produced well shows the region of largest proportionate Negro population, extending from South Carolina through central Georgia and Alabama to Mississippi. More than half the inhabitants of all this broad belt, including also the Atlantic coastal counties and the lower Mississippi Valley, as shaded on the map, are Negroes, chiefly farm Negroes. There the race question, though perhaps not so immediately difficult as the cities like Atlanta, is with both white and colored people the imminent problem of daily existence. Several times while in the black belt I was amused at the ardent response of people to whom I mentioned the fact that I had already seen something of conditions in Kentucky, Maryland, and Virginia. Why, they haven't any Negro problem. They're North. In Maryland, Kentucky, and Texas, the problem is a sharp irritant, as it is, for that matter, in Ohio, in Indianapolis, and on the west side of New York City. But it is not the life and death question that it is in the Black Belt or in the Yazoo Delta. All the country of central Georgia has been long settled. Pulaski County was laid out in 1808, and yet the population today may be considered sparse. The entire county has only 8,000 white people, a large proportion of whom live in the towns of Hawkinsville and Cochrane, and 12,000 Negroes, leaving not inconsiderable areas of forest and uncultivated land which will some day become immensely valuable. A SOUTHERN COUNTRY GENTLEMAN At Hawkinsville I met J. Pope Brown, the leading citizen of the county. In many ways he is an example of the best type of the new Southerner. In every way open to him, and with energy, he is devoting himself to the improvement of his community. For five years he was president of the State Agricultural Society. He has been a member of the legislature and chairman of the Georgia Railroad Commission, and he represents all that is best in the new progressive movement in the South. One of the unpleasant features of the villages in the South are the poor hotels. In accounting for this condition, I heard a story illustrating the attitude of the Old South toward public accommodations. A number of years ago, before the death of Robert Toombs, who, as a member of Jefferson Davis's cabinet, was called the backbone of the Confederacy, the spirit of progress reached the town where Toombs lived. The thing most needed was a new hotel. The businessmen got together and subscribed money with enthusiasm, counting upon Toombs, who was their richest man, for the largest subscription but when they finally went to him he said what do we want of a hotel when a gentleman comes to town i will entertain him myself those who are not gentlemen we don't want that was the old spirit of aristocratic individualism the town did not get its hotel one of the public enterprises of mr brown at hawkinsville is a good hotel and what is rarer still, north and south, he has made his hotel building really worthy architecturally. Mr. Brown took me out to his plantation, a drive of some eight miles. In common with most of the larger plantation owners, as I found not only in Georgia, but in other southern states which I afterward visited, Mr. Brown makes his home in the city. After a while I came to feel a reasonable confidence in assuming that almost any prominent merchant, 
banker, lawyer, or politician whom I met in the towns owned a plantation in the country. From a great many stories of the fortunes of families that I heard, I concluded that the movement of white owners from the land to nearby towns was increasing every year. High prices for cotton and consequent prosperity seemed to have accelerated rather than retarded the movement. White planters can now afford to live in town where they can have the comforts and conveniences, where the servant question is not impossibly difficult, and where there are good schools for the children. Another potent reason for the movement is the growing fear of the whites, and especially the women and children, at living alone on great farms where white neighbors are distant. Statistics show that less crime is committed in the black belt than in other parts of the South. I found that the fear was not absent even among these people. I have a letter from a white man, P. S. George of Greenwood, Mississippi, which expresses the country white point of view with singular earnestness. I live in a country of large plantations. If there are forty thousand people in that country, at least thirty thousand are Negroes, and we never have any friction between the races. I have been here as a man for twenty years and I never heard of but one case of attempted assault by a negro on a white woman. That negro was taken out and hanged. I said that we never had any trouble with negroes, but it's because we never take our eyes off the gun. You may wager that I never leave my wife and daughter at home without a man in the house after ten o'clock at night because I am afraid. As a result of these various influences, a traveler in the Black Belt sees many plantation houses, even those built in recent years, standing vacant and forlorn, or else occupied by white overseers, who are in many parts of the South almost as difficult to keep as the Negro tenants. Thousands of small white farmers, both owners and renters, of course remain, but when the leading planters leave the country, these men too grow discontented and get away at the first opportunity. Going to town, they find ready employment for the whole family in the cotton mill or in other industries where they make more money and live with a degree of comfort that they never before imagined possible. Story of the Mill People Many cotton mills, indeed, employ agents whose business it is to go out through the country urging the white farmers to come to town and painting glowing pictures of the possibilities of life there. I have visited a number of mill neighborhoods and talked with the operatives. I found the older men sometimes homesick for free life of the farm. One lanky old fellow said rather pathetically, when it comes to cotton-picking time, and I know that they are grinding cane and hunting possums, I just naturally get lonesome for the country. But nothing would persuade the women and children to go back to the old hard life. Hawkinsville has a small cotton mill and just such a community of white workers around it. Owing to the scarcity of labor, Wages in the mills have been going up rapidly all over the South during the last two or three years, furnishing a still more potent attraction for country people. All these various tendencies are uniting to produce some very remarkable conditions in the South. A natural segregation of the races is apparently taking place. I saw it everywhere I went in the Black Belt. The white people were gravitating toward the towns or into white neighborhoods and leaving the land, even though still owned by white men, more and more to the exclusive occupation of Negroes. Many black counties are growing blacker, while not a few white counties are growing whiter. 
Take, for example, Pulaski County, through which I drove that November morning with Mr. Brown. In 1870, the colored and white population were almost exactly equal, about 6,000 for each. In 1880, the Negroes had increased to 8,225, while the whites showed a loss. By 1890, the towns had begun to improve, and the white population grew by about 700, but the Negroes increased nearly 2,000. And finally, here are the figures for 1900. Negroes, 11,029. Whites, 7,460. I have not wished to darken our observations with too many statistics, but this tendency is so remarkable that I wish to set down for comparison the figures of a white county in northern Georgia, Polk County, which is growing whiter every year. 1880, 4,147 Negroes, 7,805 whites. 1890, 4,654 Negroes, 10,289 whites. 1900, 4,916 Negroes, 12,940 whites. Driving Out Negroes One of the most active causes of this movement is downright fear, or race repulsion expressing itself in fear. White people dislike and fear to live in dense, colored neighborhoods, while Negroes are often terrorized in white neighborhoods, and not in the South only, but in parts of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, as I shall show when I come to treat of Northern race conditions. I have accumulated many instances showing how Negroes are expelled from white neighborhoods. There is a significant report from Little Rock, Arkansas. Special to the Georgian Little Rock, Arkansas, January 1st. Practically every Negro in Evening Shade, Sharp County, in this state, has left town as the result of threats which have been made against the Negroes. For several years a small colony of Negroes has lived just on the outskirts of the town. A short time ago, notices were posted warning the Negroes to leave the town at once. About the same time, Joe Brooks, a Negro who lived with his family two miles north of town, was called to his door and fired upon by unknown persons. A load of shot struck the house close by his side, and some of the shot entered his arm. Brooks and his family have left the country, and practically every member of the Negro colony is gone. They have abandoned their property or disposed of it for whatever they could get. From the New Orleans Times Democrat of March 20, 1907, I cut the following dispatch showing one method pursued by the whites of Oklahoma. Blacks ordered out. Lawton, Oklahoma, March 20th. Negroes, beware the cappers. We, the sixty sons of Warica, demand the Negroes to leave here at once. We mean go. Leave in twenty-four hours, or after that your life is uncertain. These were the words on placards which the eighty Negroes of the town of Warica, forty miles south of Lawton, saw posted conspicuously in a number of public places this morning. Dispatches from here tonight stated that the whites are in earnest, and that the Negroes will be killed if they do not leave town. Not a few students of southern conditions like John Temple Graves among the whites and Bishop Turner among the colored people have argued that actual physical separation of the races, either by deportation of the Negroes to Africa or elsewhere, or by giving them certain reservation-like parts of the South to live in, is the only solution. But here is, in actuality, 
a natural segregation going forward in certain parts of the South, though in a very different way from that recommended by Mr. Graves and Bishop Turner. For even in the blackest counties, the white people own most of the land, occupy the towns, and dominate everywhere politically, socially, and industrially. Mr. Brown's plantation contains about 5,000 acres, of which some 3,500 acres are in cultivation, a beautiful rolling country, well watered, with here and there clumps of pines, and dotted with the small homes of the tenantry. As we drove along the country road, we met or passed many Negroes who bowed with the greatest deference. Some were walking, but many drove horses or mules, and rode not infrequently in top buggies, looking most prosperous, as indeed Mr. Brown informed me that they were. He knew them well, and sometimes stopped to ask them how they were getting along. The outward relationships between the races in the country seem to me to be smoother than it is in the city. Cotton, as in all this country, is almost the exclusive crop. In spite of the constant preaching of agricultural reformers, like Mr. Brown himself, hardly enough corn is raised to supply the people with food, and I was surprised here and elsewhere at seeing so few cattle and hogs. Sheep are non-existent. In Hawkinsville, though the country round about raises excellent grass, I saw in front of a supply store bales of hay which had been shipped in four hundred miles from Tennessee. Enough sugar cane is raised, mostly in small patches, to supply syrup for domestic uses. At the time of my visit, the Negroes were in the cane fields with their long knives, getting in the crop. We saw several little one-horse grinding mills pressing the juice from the cane, while near at hand, sheltered by a shanty-like roof, was the great simmering syrup kettle, with an expert Negro at work stirring and skimming. And always there were Negroes round about all the boys and girls with jolly smeared faces, and the older ones peeling and sucking the fresh cane. It was a great time of year. How does the landlord, and a lord he is in every true sense, manage his great estate? The same system is in use with slight variations elsewhere in the cotton country, and a description of Mr. Brown's methods with references here and there to what I have seen or heard elsewhere, will give an excellent idea of the common procedure. A Country of Great Plantations The Black Belt is a country of great plantations, some owners having as high as 30,000 acres, interspersed with smaller farms owned by the poorer white families or Negroes. In one way the conditions are similar to those prevailing in Ireland, great landlords and a poor tenantry or peasantry, the tenants here being very largely black. It requires about a hundred families, or six hundred people, to operate Mr. Brown's plantation. Of these, ninety percent are colored and ten percent white. I was much interested in what Mr. Brown said about his Negro tenants, which varies somewhat from the impression I had in the city of the younger Negro generation. "'I would much rather have young Negroes for tenants,' he said, "'because they work better and seem more disposed to take care of their farms. The old Negroes ordinarily will shirk a habit of slavery.' Besides the residence of the overseer and the homes of the tenants, there is on the plantation a supply store owned by Mr. Brown, a blacksmith shop, and a negro church, which is also used as a schoolhouse. This is, I found all through the black belt, a common equipment. Three different methods are pursued by the landlord in getting his land cultivated. First, 
the better class of tenants rent the land for cash, a standing rent of some three dollars an acre, though in many places in Mississippi it ranges as high as six dollars and eight dollars an acre. Second, a share crop rental, in which the landlord and the tenant divide the cotton and corn produced. Third, the ordinary wage system. That is, the landlord hires workers at so much a month and puts in his own crop. All three of these methods are usually employed on the larger plantations. Mr. Brown rents 2,500 acres for cash, 400 on shares, and farms 600 himself with wage workers. All the methods of land measurement are very different here from what they are in the north. The plantation is irregularly divided up into what are called one mule or one plow farms, just that amount of land which a family can cultivate with one mule, usually about 30 acres. Some ambitious tenants will take a two-mule or even a four-mule farm. THE NEGRO TENANT Most of the tenants, especially the Negroes, are very poor and wholly dependent upon the landlord. Many Negro families possess practically nothing of their own, save their ragged clothing and a few dollars' worth of household furniture, cooking utensils, and a gun. The landlord must therefore supply them not only with enough to live on while they are making their crop, but with the entire farming outfit. Let us say that a negro comes in November to rent a one-mule farm from the landlord for the coming year. "'What have you got?' asks the landlord. "'Nothing, boss,' he is quite likely to say. The boss furnishes him with a cabin to live in, which goes with the land rented. A mule, a plow, possibly a one-horse wagon, and a few tools. He is often given a few dollars in cash near Christmas time, which ordinarily he immediately spends, wastes. He is then allowed to draw upon the plantation supply store a regular amount of corn to feed his mule and meat, bread, and tobacco, and some clothing for his family. The cost of the entire outfit and supplies for a year is in the neighborhood of three hundred dollars, upon which the tenant pays interest at from ten to thirty per cent, from the time of signing the contract in November, although most of the supplies are not taken out until the next summer. Besides this interest, the planter also makes a large profit on all the groceries and other necessities furnished by his supply store. Having made his contract, the Negro goes to work with his whole family and keeps at it until the next fall when the cotton is all picked and ginned. Then he comes in for his settlement, a great time of year. The settlements were going forward while I was in the black belt. The Negro is credited with the amount of cotton he brings in, and he is charged with all the supplies he has had, and interest, together with the rent of his thirty acres of land. If the season has been good and he has been industrious, he will often have a nice profit in cash, but sometimes he not only does not come out even, but closes his year of work actually in deeper debt to the landlord. Some Negroes, nowadays usually of the poorer sort, work for wages. They get from $12 to $15 a month, against $5 to $8 a few years ago, with a cabin to live in. They are allowed a garden patch, where they can, if they are industrious and their families help, raise enough vegetables to feed them comfortably, or part of the bale of cotton, which is their own. But it is sadly to be commented upon that few Negro tenants, or whites either, as far as I could see, do anything with their gardens, save perhaps to raise a few collards, peanuts, and peppers, 
and possibly a few sweet potatoes. This is due in part to indolence and lack of ambition, and, in part, to the steady work required by the planter. The wife and children of an industrious wage-working Negro nearly always help in the fields, earning an additional income from chopping cotton in spring and picking the lint in the fall. This is the system as it is in theory, but the interest for us lies not in the plan, but in the actual practice. How does it all work out for good or for evil, for landlord and for tenant? Tenantry in the South is a very different thing from what it is in the North. In the North, a man who rents a farm is nearly as free to do as he pleases as if he were the owner. But in the South, the present tenant system is much nearer the condition that prevailed in slavery times than it is to the present Northern tenant system. This grows naturally out of slavery. The white man had learned to operate big plantations with ignorant help, and the Negro, on his part, had no training for any other system. The white man was the natural master, and the negro the natural dependent, and a mere emancipation proclamation did not at once change the spirit of the relationship. Today a white overseer resides on every large plantation, and he or the owner himself looks after and disciplines the tenants. The tenant is in debt to him, in some cases reaching a veritable condition of debt slavery or peonage, and he must see that the crop is made. Hence he watches the work of every negro, and indeed that of the white tenants as well, sees that the land is properly fertilized, and that the dikes, to prevent washing, are kept up that the cotton is properly chopped or thinned and regularly cultivated. Some of the greater landowners employ assistant overseers or riders who are constantly traveling from farm to farm. On one plantation I saw four such riders start out one day, each with a rifle on his saddle. And on a South Carolina plantation I had a glimpse of one method of discipline. A planter was telling me of his difficulties, how a spirit of unruliness sometimes swept abroad through a plantation, inspired by some bigoty nigger. "'Do you know what I do with such cases?' he said. "'Come with me. I'll show you.' He took me back through his house to the broad porch and reaching up to a shelf over the door, he took down a hickory wagon spoke, as long as my arm. "'When there's trouble,' he said, "'I just go down with that and lay one or two of em out. That ends the trouble. We've got to do it. They're like children, and once in a while they simply have to be punished.' "'It's far better for them to take it this way, from a white man who is their friend,' than to be arrested and taken to court and sent to the chain gang. End of Part 1 of Chapter 4《Part 2 of Chapter 4 of Following the Color Line, an Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Troubles of the Landlord Planters told me of all sorts of difficulties they had to meet with their tenants. One of them, after he had spent a whole evening telling me of the troubles which confronted any man who tried to work Negroes, summed it all up with the remark, You've just got to make up your mind that you are dealing with children and handle them as firmly and kindly as you know how. He told me how hard it was to get a Negro tenant, even in the busy season, to work a full week, and it was often only by withholding the weekly food allowance that it could be done. Saturday afternoon, 
or evening, as they say in the South, the Negro goes to town or visits his friends. Often he spends all day Sunday driving about the country, and his mule comes back so worn out that it cannot be used on Monday. There are often furious religious revivals, which break into the work, to say nothing of frolics and fish suppers at which the Negroes often remain all night long. Many of them are careless with their tools, wasteful of supplies, irresponsible in their promises. One planter told me how he had built neat fences around the homes of his Negroes, and fixed up their houses to encourage them in thrift and give them more comfort, only to have the fences and even parts of the houses used for firewood. Toward fall, if the season had been bad, and the crop of cotton is short, so short that a negro knows that he will not be able to pay out and have anything left for himself, he will sometimes desert the plantation entirely leaving the cotton unpicked and a large debt to the landlord. If he attempts that, however, he must get entirely away, else the planter will chase him down and bring him back to his work. Illiterate, without discipline or training, with little ambition and much indolence, a large proportion of Negro tenants are looked after and driven like children or slaves. I say a large proportion, but there are thousands of industrious Negro landowners and tenants who are rapidly getting ahead, as I shall show in my next chapter. In this connection, it is a noteworthy fact that a considerable number of the white tenants require almost as much attention as the Negroes, though they are, of course, treated in an entirely different way. One planter in Alabama said to me, "'Give me Negroes every time. I wouldn't have a low-down white tenant on my place. You can get work out of any Negro if you know how to handle him, but there are some white men who won't work and can't be driven because they are white.'" RACE TROUBLES IN THE COUNTRY In short, when slavery was abolished, it gave place to a sort of feudal tenantry system which continues widely today. And it has worked with comparative satisfaction, at least to the landlords, until within the last few years, when the next step in the usual evolution of human society, industrial and urban development, began seriously to disturb the feudal equilibrium of the cotton country. It was a curious idea, human enough, that men should attempt to legislate slaves immediately into freedom. But nature takes her own methods of freeing slaves. They are slower than men's ways, but more certain. The change now going on in the South from the feudal agricultural life to sharpened modern conditions has brought difficulties for the planter, compared with which all others pale into insignificance. I mean the scarcity of labor. Industry is competing with agriculture for the limited supply of Negro workers. Negroes, responding to exactly the same natural laws that control the white farmers, have been moving cityward, entering other occupations, migrating west or north, where more money is to be made. Agricultural wages have therefore gone up, and rents, relatively, have gone down. And had the South not been blessed for several years with wonderful returns from its monopoly crop, there might have been a more serious crisis. CRY OF THE SOUTH MORE LABOR If the South today could articulate its chief need, we should hear a single great shout. MORE LABOR out of this struggle for tenants, servants, and workers has grown the chief complications of the Negro problem, and I am not forgetting race prejudice or the crimes against women. Indeed, it has seemed to me that the chief difficulty in understanding the Negro problem 
lies in showing how much of the complication in the South is due to economic readjustments, and how much to instinctive race repulsion or race prejudice. A Tenant Stealer In one town I visited, not Hawkinsville, I was standing talking with some gentlemen in the street when I saw a man drive by in a buggy. "'Do you see that man?' they asked me. I nodded. "'Well, he is the greatest tenant-stealer in this country.' I heard a good deal about these tenant-stealers. A whole neighborhood will execrate one planter who, to keep his land cultivated, will lure away his neighbor's negroes. Sometimes he will offer more wages, sometimes he will give the tenants better houses to live in, and sometimes he succeeds by that sheer force of a masterful personality which easily controls an ignorant tenantry. I found, moreover, that there was not only a struggle between individual planters for Negro tenants, but between states and sections. Many of the old farms in South Carolina and Alabama have been used so long that they require a steady and heavy annual treatment of fertilizer, with the result that cotton growing costs more than it does in the rich alluvial lands of Mississippi or the newer regions of Arkansas and Texas. The result is that the planters of the West being able to pay more wages and give the tenants better terms, lure away the Negroes of the East. Georgia and other states have met this competitive disadvantage in the usual way in which such disadvantages, when first felt but not fully understood, are met by counteracting legislation. Georgia has made the most stringent laws to keep her Negroes on the land. The Georgia Code, section 601, says, Any person who shall solicit or procure emigrants, or shall attempt to do so, without first procuring a license as required by law, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Ex-Congressman William H. Fleming, one of the ablest statesmen of Georgia, said, Land and other forms of capital cannot spare the Negro, and will not give him up until a substitute is found. His labor is worth millions upon millions. In Georgia, we now make it a crime for anyone to solicit emigrants without taking out a license, and then we make the license as nearly prohibitive as possible. One of the most dangerous occupations for anyone to follow in this state would be that of an emigrant agent as some have found by experience. In this connection, I have an account published in April 1907 in an Augusta newspaper of just such a case. The heaviest fine given in the city court of Richmond County within the last two years was imposed upon E. F. Arnett yesterday morning. He was sentenced to pay a fine of $1,000 or serve six months in the county jail. Arnett was convicted of violating the state emigration laws regarding the carrying of labor out of the state. He was alleged to have employed thirteen Negroes to work on the Georgia and Atlantic Railroad, which operates in this state and Alabama. The jury on the case returned a verdict of guilty when court convened yesterday although it had been reported that a mistrial was probable. Peg Leg Williams A famous railroad emigration agent called Peg Leg Williams, who promoted Negro emigration from Georgia to Mississippi and Texas a few years ago, was repeatedly prosecuted and finally driven out of business. In a letter which he wrote some time ago to the Atlanta Constitution, he said, I know of several counties not a hundred miles from Atlanta where it's more than a man's life is worth to go in to get Negroes to move to some other state. 
there are farmers that would not hesitate to shoot their brother were he to come from mississippi to get his niggers as he calls them even though he had no contract with them i know personally numbers of negro men who have moved west and after accumulating a little returned to get a brother sister or an old father or mother and they were compelled to return without them their lives being imperiled they had to leave and leave quick in view of such a feeling it may be imagined how futile is the talk of the deportation of the negro race what the southern planter wants today is not fewer negroes but more negroes negroes who will keep their place laws to make the negro work many other laws have been passed in the southern states which are designed to keep the negro on the land and having him there to make him work the contract law the abuses of which lead to peonage and debt slavery is an excellent example which i shall discuss more fully in the next chapter the criminal laws the chain gang system and the hiring of negro convicts to private individuals are all in one way or another devices to keep the negro at work on farms in brickyards and in mines the vagrancy laws not unlike those of the north and excellent in their purpose are here sometimes executed with great severity in alabama the last legislature passed a law under which a negro arrested for vagrancy must prove that he is not a vagrant in short the old rule of law that a man is innocent until proven guilty is here reversed for the negro so that the burden of proving that he is not guilty of vagrancy rests upon him not upon the state the last alabama legislature also passed a stringent game law one argument in its favor being that by preventing the negro from pot hunting it would force him to work more steadily in the cotton fields race hatred versus economic necessity one of the most significant things i saw in the south and i saw it everywhere was the way in which the white people were torn between their feeling of race prejudice and their downright economic needs hating and fearing the negro as a race though often loving individual negroes they yet want him to work for them they can't get along without him in one impulse a community will rise to mob negroes or to drive them out of the country because of negro crime or negro vagrancy or because the negro is becoming educated acquiring property and getting out of his place and in the next impulse laws are passed or other remarkable measures taken to keep him at work because the south can't get along without him from the atlanta georgian i cut recently a letter which well illustrates the way in which racial hatred clashes with economic necessity troubles of country folk but aren't there two sides to every question here we are out here in the country right in the midst of hundreds of negroes and do you know sir that all this talk about lynching and ku kluxing is frightening the farm hands to such an extent we begin to fear that soon the farmers will sustain a great loss of labor by their running away already it is beginning to have its effect after night the negroes are afraid to leave their farm to go anywhere on errands of business why sir two miles from this town the negroes are afraid to come here to trade at night the country merchants are feeling the force of it very sorely and if this foolishness isn't stopped their losses in fall trade will be very heavy even some of the ladies of our community are complaining of this rashness that it is demoralizing the labor in the home department so in conclusion 
in behalf of my community and other country communities, I feel it my duty to raise a warning voice against all such new foolish Ku Kluxism. T. J. Lowe, Mableton, Georgia While I was in Georgia, a case came up which threw a flood of light upon the inner complexities of this problem. In the county of Habersham in North Georgia, the population is largely of the type known as poor white, the famous mountain folk who were never slave owners, and many of whom fought in the Union Army during the Civil War. Habersham is one of the white counties, which is growing whiter. It has about 2,000 Negroes and 12,000 whites, many of the latter having come in from the north to grow peaches and raise sheep. One of the Negroes in Habersham County was Frank Grant, described by a white neighbor as a Negro of good character, a property owner, setting an example of thrift and honesty that ought to have made his example a benefit to any community. Grant had saved money from his labor and bought a home. He was such a good worker that people were willing sometimes to pay him twice the wages of the average laborer, white or black. On the night of December 16, 1906, the Negro's house was fired into by a party of white men who then went to the house of his tenant, Henry Sism, also a Negro, and shot promiscuously around Sism's house and wanted him to leave the country in one week threatening him with severe penalties if he did not go. As a result, Grant had to sell out his little home, one after such hard work, and he and his tenant Schism, with their families, both fled the county. "'In Grant,' said his white neighbor, "'the county lost a capable laborer, in its present situation a most valuable asset, and a good citizen.' Here, then, we have race hatred versus economic necessity. The important citizens and employees of Habersham County came to Atlanta and presented a petition to Governor Terrell, January 18, 1907, as follows. To His Excellency J. M. Terrell, Governor of Georgia, Atlanta. Whereas, on the night of December 16, 1906, Parties unknown came to the quiet home of one Frank Grant, colored, a citizen of this county, and shot into his residence, and then went to the home of Henry Schism, colored, a tenant of said Frank Grant, and shot promiscuously around his, the said Schism's, house, and demanded of him to leave the county under severe penalty. This has caused the tenant Henry Schism to leave, and Frank Grant to sell his little house at a sacrifice and leave. It comes to us that Frank Grant is a quiet, innocent, hard-working citizen. Therefore we, the undersigned officers and citizens of Habersham County, Georgia, pray you to offer a liberal reward for the arrest and conviction of these unknown parties, say one hundred dollars for the first and fifty dollars for each succeeding one signed c w grant county school commissioner j a irwin clerk s c m franklin ordinary j d hill t c h c but of course nothing could be done that would keep the negroes on the land under such conditions why Negroes are driven out. What does it all mean? Listen to the explanation given by a prominent white man of Habersham County, not to me, but to the Atlanta Georgian, where it was published. It is not a problem of Negro labor, because there is little of that kind here. The white labor will not work for the fruit growers at prices they can afford even when it is a good fruit year. Often they decline to work at any price. They have many admirable qualities, 
among them is a spirit of pride and independence which rightly directed would uplift and make them prosperous but which misguided and blind as it sometimes is keeps them in poverty and puts the region in which they live at great disadvantage landowners and employers native and new are indignant but helpless they are in the power of the shiftless element of the whites who say i will work or not as i please and when i please and at my own price and i will not have negroes taking my work away from me this is not a race question pure and simple it is an industrial question a labor issue not confined to one part of the country here it will be observed the same complaint is made against the poor white as against the negro that he is shiftless and that he won't work even for high wages generally speaking the race hatred in the south comes chiefly from the poorer classes of whites who either own land which they work themselves or are tenant farmers in competition with negroes and from politicians who seek to win the votes of this class of white men the larger landowners and employers of labor while they do not love the negro want him to work and work steadily and will do almost anything to keep him on the land so long as he is a faithful obedient unambitious worker when he becomes prosperous or educated or owns land many white people no longer have any use for him and turn upon him with hostility but the best type of the southern white men is not only glad to see the negro become a prosperous and independent farmer but will do much to help him vivid illustration of race feeling i have had innumerable illustrations of the extremes of which race feeling reaches among a certain class of southerners in a letter to the Atlanta Constitution, November 5, 1906, a writer who signs himself Mark Johnson says, The only use we have for the Negro is as a laborer. It is only as such that we need him. It is only as such that we can use him. If the North wants to take him and educate him, we will bid him Godspeed and contribute to his education if schools are located on the other side of the line and here are extracts from a remarkable letter from a southern white working man signing himself forrest pope and published in the atlanta georgian october twenty second nineteen o six when the skilled negro appears and begins to elbow the white man in the struggle for existence don't you know the white man rebels and won't have it so if you don't it won't take you long to find it out just go out and ask a few of them those who will tell you the whole truth and see what you will find out about it what is the negro's place all the genuine southern people like the negro as a servant and so long as he remains the hewer of wood and carrier of water and remains strictly in what we choose to call his place everything is all right but when ambition prompted by real education causes the negro to grow restless and he bestir himself to get out of that servile condition then there is or at least there will be trouble sure enough trouble that all the great editors, parsons, and philosophers can no more check than they can now state the whole truth and nothing but the truth about this all-absorbing, far-reaching, miserable race question. There are those among southern editors and other public men who have been shouting into the ears of the North for twenty-five years that education would solve the Negro question, there is not an honest, fearless, thinking man in the South but who knows that to be a barefaced lie. Take a young Negro of little more than ordinary intelligence even, get hold of him in time, train him thoroughly as to books, and finish him up with a good industrial education, 
send him out into the south with ever so good intentions both on the part of his benefactor and himself send him away to take my work away from me and i will kill him the writer says in another part of this remarkable letter giving as it does a glimpse of the bare bones of the economic struggle for existence i am i believe a typical southern white working man of the skilled variety and i'll tell the whole world including doctors abbott and elliot that i don't want any educated property-owning negro around me the negro would be desirable to me for what i could get out of him in the way of labor that i don't want to have to perform myself and i have no other uses for him who will do the dirty work one illustration more and i am through i met at montgomery alabama a lawyer named gustav frederick mertens we were discussing the problem and mr mertens finally made a striking remark not at all expressing the view that i heard from some of the strongest citizens of montgomery but excellently voicing the position of many southerners it's a question he said who will do the dirty work in this country the white man won't the negro must there's got to be a mudsill somewhere if you educate the negroes they won't stay where they belong and you must consider them as a race because if you let a few rise it makes the others discontented mr mertens presented me with a copy of his novel called the storm signal in which he further develops the idea page 342 the negro is the mudsill of the social and industrial south today upon his labor in the field in the forest and in the mine the whole structure rests slip the mudsill out and the system must be reorganized educate him and he quits the field instruct him in the trades and sciences and he enters into active competition with the white man in what are called the higher planes of life that competition brings on friction and that friction in the end means the negro's undoing is not this mud sill stirring today and is not that the deep reason for many of the troubles in the south and in the north as well where the negro has appeared in large numbers the friction of competition has arrived and despite the demand for justice by many of the best class of the southern whites the struggle is certainly of growing intensity and out of this economic struggle of whites and blacks grows an ethical struggle far more significant it is the struggle of the white man with himself how shall he who is supreme in the south as in the north treat the negro that is the real struggle end of chapter four chapter five of following the color line an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray standard baker this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five race relationships in the south generally speaking the sharpest race prejudice in the south is exhibited by the poorer class of white people whether farmers artisans or unskilled workers who come into active competition with the negroes or from politicians who are seeking the votes of this class of people it is this element which has driven the negroes out of more than one community in the south and it commonly forms the lynching mobs a similar antagonism of the working classes exists in the north wherever the negro has appeared in large numbers as i shall show when i come to write of the treatment of the northern negro on the other hand the larger landowners and employers of the south and all professional and businessmen who hire servants while they dislike and fear the negro as a race 
though often loving and protecting individual negroes want the black man to work for them more than that they must have him for he has a practical monopoly on labor in the south white men of the employing class will do almost anything to keep the negro on the land and his wife in the kitchen so long as they are obedient and unambitious workers good and bad landlords but i had not been very long in the black belt before i began to see that the large planters the big employers of labor often pursued very different methods in dealing with the negro in the feudal middle ages there were good and bad barons so in the south today there are good and bad landlords for lack of a better designation and every gradation between them the good landlord generally speaking is the one who knows by inheritance how a feudal system should be operated in other words he is the old slave owner or his descendant who not only feels the ancient responsibility of slavery times but believes that the good treatment of tenants as a policy will produce better results than harshness and force the bad landlord represents the degeneration of the feudal system he is in farming to make all he can out of it this year and next without reference to human life i have already told something of j pope brown's plantation near hawkinsville on the november day when we drove out through it i was impressed with the fact that nearly all the houses used by the negro tenants were new and much superior to the old log cabins built either before or after the war some of which i saw still standing vacant and dilapidated in various parts of the plantation i asked the reason why he had built new houses well he answered i find i can keep a better class of tenants if the accommodations are good liquor and the resulting trouble mr brown has other methods for keeping the tenantry of his plantation satisfied every year he gives a barbecue and frolic for his negroes with music and speaking and plenty to eat a big watermelon patch is also a feature of the plantation and during all the year the tenants are looked after not only to see that the work is properly done but in more intimate and sympathetic ways on one trip through the plantation we stopped in front of a negro cabin inside lay a negro boy close to death from a bullet wound in the head he had been at a negro party a few nights before where there was liquor someone had overturned the lamp shooting began and the young fellow was taken out for dead such accidents or crimes are all too familiar in the plantation country although pulaski county georgia prohibits the sale or purchase of liquor most of the south indeed is prohibition in its sentiment the negroes are able from time to time to get jugs of liquor and as one southerner puts it to me enjoy the resulting trouble the boy's father came out of the field and told us with real eloquence of sorrow of the patient's condition last night he said we done thought he was across in the river mr brown had already sent the doctor out from the city he now made arrangements to transport the boy to a hospital in macon where he could be properly treated use of cocaine among negroes as i have said before the white landlord who really tries to treat his negroes well often has a hard time of it many of those not all he deals with are densely ignorant irresponsible indolent and often rendered more careless from knowing that the white man must have labor many of them will not keep up the fences or take care of their tools or pick the cotton even after it is ready without steady attention a prominent mississippi planter gave me an illustration of one of the troubles he just then had to meet an eighteen-year-old negro left his plantation to work in a railroad camp 
there he learned to use cocaine, and when he came back to the plantation, he taught the habit to a dozen of the best Negroes there, to their complete ruin. The planter had the entire crowd arrested, searched for cocaine, and kept in jail until the habit was broken. Then he prosecuted the white druggist who sold the cocaine. Some southern planters, to prevent the Negroes from leaving, have built churches for them, and in one instance I heard of a schoolhouse as well. Another point of the utmost importance, for it strikes at the selfish interest of the landlord, lies in the treatment of the Negro who, by industry or ability, can get ahead. A good landlord not only places no obstacles in the way of such tenants, but takes a real pride in their successes. Mr. Brown said, If a tenant sees that other Negroes on the same plantation have been able to save money and get land of their own, it tends to make them more industrious. It pays the planter to treat his tenants well. Negro with a thousand dollars in the bank. The result is that a number of Mr. Brown's tenants have bought and owned good farms near the greater plantation. The plantation indeed becomes a sort of central sun around which revolves like planets the lesser life of the Negro landowner. Mr. Brown told me with no little pride of the successes of several Negroes. We met one farmer driving to town in a top buggy with a Negro school teacher. His name was Robert Polhill, a good type of the self-respecting, vigorous, industrious Negro. Afterward, we visited his farm. He had an excellent house with four rooms. In front there were vines and decorative chicken corn. A fence surrounded the place, and it was really in good repair. Inside the house everything was scrupulously neat, from the clean rag rugs to the huge post beds with their gay coverlets. The wife evidently had some Indian blood in her veins. She could read and write, but Paul Hill himself was a full black negro, intelligent but illiterate. The children, and there were a lot of them, are growing up practically without opportunity for education because the school held in the Negro church is not only very poor, but it is in session only a short time every year. Near the house was a one-horse syrup mill then in operation, grinding cane brought in by neighboring farmers, white as well as black, the whites thus patronizing the enterprise of their energetic Negro neighbor. I first noticed Paul Hill when he began work on the plantation, said Mr. Brown, because he was the only Negro on the place whom I could depend upon to stop hog cracks in the fences. His history is the common history of the Negro farmer who gets ahead. Starting as a wages hand, he worked hard and steadily, saving enough finally to buy a mule, the Negro's first purchase. Then he rented land, and by hard work and close calculating, made money steadily. With his first seventy-five dollars, he started out to see the world, traveling by railroad to Florida, and finally back home again. The moving about instinct is strong in all Negroes, sometimes to their destruction. Then he bought a hundred acres of land on credit, and having good crops, paid for it in six or seven years. Now he has a comfortable home, he is out of debt, and has money in the bank, a painted house, a top buggy, and a cabinet organ. These are the values of his property. His farm is worth two thousand dollars, two mules three hundred dollars, a horse a hundred and fifty dollars, other equipment five hundred and fifty dollars money in the bank a thousand dollars total four thousand dollars negro who owns a thousand acres of land all of this shows what a negro who is industrious 
and who comes up on a plantation where the landlord is not oppressive can do and despite the fact that much is heard on the one hand of the lazy and worthless negro and on the other of the landlord who holds his negroes in practical slavery it is significant that many negroes are able to get ahead in pulaski county there are negroes who own as high as a thousand acres of land ben gordon is one of them his brother charles has five hundred acres john nelson has four hundred acres worth twenty dollars an acre the miller family has a thousand acres january lawson another of mr brown's former tenants has five hundred acres jack daniel two hundred acres tom whalen six hundred acres a mulatto merchant in hawkinsville whose creditable store i visited also owns his plantation in the county and rents it to negro tenants on the same system employed by the white landowners indeed a few negroes in the south are coming to be not inconsiderable landlords and have many tenants hawkinsville also has a negro blacksmith negro barbers and negro builders and like the white man the negro also develops his own financial sharks one educated colored man in hawkinsville is a note shaver he stands for other negroes and signs their notes at a frightful commission statistics will give some idea of how the industrious negro in a black belt county like pulaski has been succeeding eighteen seventy five four thousand four hundred and ninety acres of land owned total assessed value of property forty three thousand two hundred and thirty dollars eighteen eighty five thousand nine hundred and eighty eight acres of land owned total assessed value of property sixty thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars eighteen eighty five six thousand nine hundred and one acres of land owned total assessed value of property fifty nine thousand and twenty two dollars in eighteen ninety twelve thousand two hundred and ninety four acres of land owned total assessed value of property one hundred and twenty two thousand nine hundred and twenty six dollars in eighteen ninety five fourteen thousand one hundred and forty five acres of land owned total assessed value of property one hundred and forty four thousand one hundred and fifty eight dollars nineteen hundred thirteen thousand two hundred and five acres of land owned total assessed value of property a hundred and thirty eight thousand eight hundred dollars it is surprising to an unfamiliar visitor to find out that the negroes in the south have acquired so much land in georgia alone in nineteen o six colored people owned one million four hundred thousand acres and were assessed for over twenty eight million dollars worth of property practically all of which of course has been acquired in the forty years since slavery negro farmers in some instances have made a genuine reputation for ability john roberts a richmond county negro won first prize over many white exhibitors in the fall of nineteen o six at the georgia carolina fair at augusta for the best bale of cotton raised little colored boys famous speech i was at macon while the first state fair ever held by negroes in georgia was in progress in spite of the fact that racial relationships owing to the recent riot at atlanta were acute the fair was largely attended and not only by negroes but by many white visitors this brunt of the work of organization fell upon r r wright president of the georgia state industrial college colored of savannah president wright is of full-blooded african descent his grandmother who reared him being an african negro of the mandingo tribe just at the close of the war he was a boy in a freedman school in atlanta 
one Sunday General O. O. Howard came to address the pupils. When he had finished, he expressed a desire to take a message back to the people of the North. "'What shall I tell them for you?' he asked. A little black boy in front stood up quickly and said, "'Tell em, Massa, we is risin.' Upon this incident, John Greenleaf Whittier wrote a famous poem, and at the Negro Fair, crowning the charts which had been prepared to show the progress of the Negroes of Georgia, I saw this motto, We are rising. The little black boy grew up, was graduated at Atlanta University, studied at Harvard, traveled in Europe, served in the Spanish-American War, and is now seeking to help his race to get an industrial training in the college which he organized in 1891. The attendance at the fair in Macon was between 25,000 and 30,000. The Negroes raised $11,000 and spent $7,000 and planned for a greater fair the next year. In this enterprise, they had the sympathy and approval of the best white people. A vivid glimpse of what the fair meant is given by the Daily News of Macon, a white newspaper. The fair shows what progress can be accomplished by the industrious and thrifty Negro, who casts aside the belief that he is a dependent, and sails right in to make a living and a home for himself. Some of the agricultural exhibits of black farmers have never been surpassed in Macon. On the whole, the exposition just simply astounded folks who did not know what the Negro was doing for himself. Another significant feature about the fair was the excellent behavior of the great throngs of colored people who poured into the city during its progress. There was not an arrest on the fairgrounds, and very few in the city. The better class of Negro farmers, indeed, have shown not only a capacity for getting ahead individually, but for organizing for self-advancement, and even for working with corresponding associations of white farmers. The great cotton and tobacco associations of the South, which aim to direct the marketing of the product of the farms, have found it not only wise but necessary to enlist the cooperation of Negro farmers. At the annual rally of the dark tobacco growers at Guthrie, Kentucky, last September, many Negro planters were in the line of parade with the whites. The farmers' conferences held at Hampton, Tuskegee, Calhoun, and at similar schools illustrate in other ways the possibilities of advancement which grow out of land ownership by the Negroes. THE PENALTIES OF BEING FREE So much for the sunny side of the picture. The broad-gauge landlord and the prosperous tenantry. Conditions in the black belt are in one respect much as they were in slavery times, or as they would be under any feudal system. If the master or lord is good, the negro prospers. If he is harsh, grasping, unkind, the negro suffers bitterly. It gets back finally to the white man. In assuming supreme rights in the South, political, social, and industrial, the white man also assumes heavy duties and responsibilities. He cannot have the one without the other and he takes to himself the pain and suffering which goes with power and responsibility. Of course, scarcity of labor and high wages have given the really ambitious and industrious Negro his opportunity, and many thousands of them are becoming more and more independent by the favor or the ill will of the whites. And therein lies a profound danger, not only to the Negro, but to the South gradually losing the support and advice of the best type of white man the independent negro finds himself in competition with the poorer type of white man whose jealousy he must meet he takes the penalties of being really free 
escaping the exactions of a feudal life, he finds he must meet the sharper difficulties of a free industrial system, and being without the political rights of his poor white competitor, and wholly without social recognition, discredited by the bestial crimes of the lower class of his own race, he has, indeed, a hard struggle before him. In many neighborhoods he is peculiarly at the mercy of this lower-class white electorate, and the self-seeking politicians whose stock in trade consists in playing upon the passions of race hatred. 2. I come now to the reverse of the picture. When the Negro tenant takes up land, or hires out to the landlord, he ordinarily signs a contract, or if he cannot sign, about half the Negro tenants of the Black Belt are wholly illiterate, he makes his mark. He often has no way of knowing certainly what is in the contract, though the arrangement is usually clearly understood, and he must depend on the landlord to keep both the rent and the supply store accounts. In other words, he is wholly at the planter's mercy. A temptation is dangerous for the landlord as the possibilities which it presents are for the tenant. It is so easy to make large profits by charging immense interest percentages or outrageous prices for supplies to tenants who are too ignorant or too weak to protect themselves that the stories of the oppressive landlord in the South are scarcely surprising. It is easy when the tenant brings in his cotton in the fall not only to underweigh it, but to credit it at the lowest prices of the weak. And this dealing of the strong with the weak is not southern, it is human. Such a system has encouraged dishonesty and wastefulness. It has made many landlords cruel and greedy. It has increased the helplessness, hopelessness, and shiftlessness of the Negro. In many cases it has meant downright degeneration, not only to the Negro, but to the white man. These are strong words, but no one can travel in the black belt without seeing enough to convince him of the terrible consequences growing out of these relationships. THE STORY OF A NEGRO TENANT A case which came to my attention at Montgomery, Alabama, throws a vivid light on one method of dealing with the Negro tenant. Some nine miles from Montgomery lives a planter named T. L. McCullough. In December 1903, he made a contract with a Negro named Jim Thomas to work for him. According to this contract, a copy of which I have, the landlord agreed to furnish Jim the Negro with a ration of 14 pounds of meat and one bushel of meal a month, and to pay him besides ninety-six dollars for an entire year's labor. On his part, Jim agreed to do good and faithful labor for the said T. L. McCullough. Good and faithful labor means from sunrise to sunset every day but Sunday, and excepting Saturday afternoon. A payment of five dollars was made to bind the bargain just before Christmas. Jim probably spent it the next day. It is customary to furnish a cabin for the worker to live in. No such place was furnished, and Jim had to walk three or four miles morning and evening to a house on another plantation. He worked faithfully until May 15th. Then he ran away. But when he heard that the landlord was after him, threatening punishment, he came back and agreed to work twenty days for the ten he had been away. Jim stayed some time, but he was not only given no cabin and paid no money, but his food ration was cut off. So he ran away again, claiming that he could not work unless he had a place to live. The landlord went after him and had him arrested and although the Negro had worked nearly half a year, McCullough prosecuted him for fraud because he had got five dollars in cash at the signing of the contract. In such a case, the Alabama law gives the landlord every advantage. 
It says that when a person receives money under a contract and stops work, the presumption is that he intended to defraud the landowner, and that therefore he is criminally punishable. The practical effect of the law is to permit imprisonment for debt, for it places a burden of proof on the Negro that he can hardly overturn. The law is defended on the ground that Negroes will get money any way they can, sign any sort of paper for it, and then run off, if there is not a stringent law to punish them. But it may be imagined how this law could be used, and is used, in the hands of unscrupulous men to keep the Negro in a sort of debt slavery. When the case came up before Judge William H. Thomas of Montgomery, the constitutionality of the law was brought into question, and the Negro was finally discharged. Often an unscrupulous landlord will deliberately give a Negro a little money before Christmas, knowing that he will promptly waste it in a celebration, thus getting him into debt, so that he dare not leave the plantation for fear of arrest and criminal prosecution. If he attempts to leave, he is arrested and taken before a friendly justice of the peace, and fined or threatened with imprisonment. If he is not in debt, it sometimes happens that the landlord will have him arrested on the charge of stealing a bridle or a few potatoes, for it is easy to find something against almost any Negro, and he is brought into court. In several cases I know of, the escaping Negro has even been chased down with bloodhounds. On appearing in court, the Negro is naturally badly frightened. The white man is there and offers as a special favor to take him back and let him work out the fine, which sometimes requires six months, often a whole year. In this way, Negroes are kept in debt, so-called debt slavery or peonage, year after year, they and their whole family. One of the things that I couldn't at first understand in some of the courts I visited was the presence of so many white men to stand sponsor for Negroes who had committed various offenses. Often this grows out of the feudal protective instinct which the landlord feels for the tenant or servant of whom he is fond. But often it is merely the desire of the white man to get another Negro worker. In one case in particular, I saw a Negro brought into court charged with stealing cotton. "'Does anybody know this Negro?' asked the judge. Two white men stepped up, and both said they did. The judge fined the Negro twenty dollars and costs, and there was a real contest between the two white men as to who should pay it and get the Negro. They argued for some minutes but finally the judge said to the prisoner, "'Who do you want to work for, George?' The Negro chose his employer and agreed to work four months to pay off his twenty-dollar fine and costs. Sometimes a man who has a debt against a Negro will sell the claim, which is practically selling the Negro, to some farmer who wants more labor. A case of this sort came up in the winter of 1907 in Rankin County, Mississippi, the facts of which are all in testimony. A Negro named Dan January was in debt to a white farmer named Levi Carter. Carter agreed to sell the Negro and his entire family to another white farmer named Patrick. January refused to be sold. According to the testimony, Carter and some of his companions seized January, bound him hand and foot, and beat him most brutally, taking turns in doing the whipping until they were exhausted and the victim unconscious. January's children removed him to his home, but the white men returned the next day, produced a rope, and threatened to hang him unless he consented to go to the purchaser of the debt. The case came into court, but the white men were never punished. January was in Jackson, Mississippi, when I was there. He still showed the awful effects of his beating. End of Part 1 of Chapter 5
Part Two of Chapter Five of Following the Color Line: An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Keeping Negroes Poor. This system has many bad results. It encourages the Negro in crime. He knows that unless he does something pretty bad, he will not be prosecuted, because the landlord doesn't want to lose the work of a single hand. He knows that if he is prosecuted, the white man will, if possible, pay him out. It disorganizes justice and confuses the ignorant Negro mind as to what is a crime and what is not. A Negro will often do things that he would not do if he thought he were really to be punished. He comes to the belief that if the white man wants him arrested, he will be arrested, and if he protects him, he won't suffer, no matter what he does. Thousands of Negroes, ignorant, weak, indolent, today work under this system. There are even landlords and employers who will trade upon the Negro's worst instincts, his love for liquor, for example, in order to keep him at work. An instance of this sort came to my attention at Hawkinsville while I was there. The white people of the town were making a strong fight for prohibition. The women held meetings, and on the day of the election marched in the streets singing and speaking. But the largest employer of Negro labor in the county had registered several hundred of his Negroes and declared intention of voting them against prohibition. He said bluntly, If my niggers can't get whiskey, they won't stay with me. You've got to keep a nigger poor, or he won't work. This employer actually voted sixty of his negroes against prohibition, but the excitement was so great that he dared vote no more, and prohibition carried. A step further brings the negro to the chain gang. If there is no white man to pay him out, or if his crime is too serious to be paid out, he goes to the chain gang, and in several states he is then hired out to private contractors. The private employer thus gets him sooner or later. Some of the largest farms in the South are operated by chain gang labor. The demand for more convicts by white employers is exceedingly strong. In the Montgomery Advertiser for April 10th, 1907, I find an account of the sentencing of 54 prisoners in the city court, 52 of whom were Negroes. The Advertiser says, The demand for their labor is probably greater now than it ever has been before. Numerous labor agents of companies employing convict labor reached Montgomery yesterday, and were busily engaged in maneuvering to secure part or even all of the convicts for their respective companies. The competition for labor of all kinds, it seems, is keener than ever before known. The natural tendency of this demand, and from the further fact that the convict system makes yearly a huge profit for the state, is to convict as many Negroes as possible and to punish the offenses charged as severely as possible. From the Atlanta Constitution of October 13, 1906, I have this clipping. Six months for potato theft. Columbus, Georgia, October 12th, special. In the city court yesterday, Charlie Carter, a Negro, was sentenced to six months on the chain gang or to pay a fine of $25 for stealing a potato valued at five cents. Serious crimes are sometimes compromised. In a newspaper dispatch, October 6, 1906, from Eaton, Georgia, I find a report of the trial of six Negroes charged with assault with the intent to kill. All were found guilty, but upon a recommendation of mercy, they were sentenced as having committed misdemeanors rather than felonies. They could therefore have their fines paid, and five were immediately released by farmers who wanted their labor. 
the report says that of thirty-one misdemeanors during the month it is expected that none will reach the chain gang since there are three farmers to every convict ready to pay the fine still other methods are pursued by certain landlords to keep their tenants on the land in one extreme case a negro tenant after years of work decided to leave the planter he had had a place offered him where he could make more money there was nothing against him he simply wanted to move but the landlord informed him that no wagon would be permitted to cross his the planters land to get his household belongings the negro being ignorant supposed he could thus be prevented from moving and although the friend who was trying to help him assured him that the landlord could not prevent his moving he dared not go in another instance also extreme a planter refused to let his tenants raise hogs because he wanted them to buy salt pork at his store it is indeed through the plantation store which corresponds to the company or truck store of northern mining regions that the unscrupulous planter reaps his most exorbitant profits negroes on some plantations whether they work hard or not come out at the end of the year with nothing part of this is due of course to their own improvidence but part in too many cases is due to exploitation by the landlord one biscuit to eat and no place to sleep booker t washington in a letter to the montgomery advertiser on the negro labor problem tells this story i recall that some years ago a certain white farmer asked me to secure for him a young colored man to work about the house and to work in the field the young man was secured a bargain was entered into to the effect that he was to be paid a certain sum monthly and his board and lodging furnished as well at the end of the colored boy's first day on the farm he returned i asked the reason and he said that after working all the afternoon he was handed a buttered biscuit for his supper and no place was provided for him to sleep at night he was told he could find a place to sleep in the fodder loft this white farmer whom i know well is not a cruel man and seeks generally to do the right thing but in this case he simply overlooked the fact that it would have paid him in dollars and cents to give some thought and attention to the comfort of his helper this case is more or less typical had this boy been well cared for he would have advertised the place that others would have sought work there such methods mean of course the lowest possible efficiency of labor ignorant hopeless shiftless the harsh planter naturally opposes negro education in the bitterest terms and prevents it wherever possible for education means the doom of the system by which he thrives negro with nineteen children life for the tenants is often not a pleasant thing to contemplate i spent much time driving about on the great plantations and went into many of the cabins usually they were very poor of logs or shacks sometimes only one room sometimes a room and a sort of lean-to at one side there was a fireplace often two beds opposite with a few broken chairs or boxes and a table sometimes the cabin was set up on posts and had a floor sometimes it was on the ground and had no floor at all the people are usually densely ignorant and superstitious the preachers they follow are often the worst sort of characters dishonest and immoral the schools if there are any are practically worthless the whole family works from sunrise to sunset in the fields even children of six and seven years old will drop seed or carry water dr w e b dubois himself a negro 
who has made many valuable and scholarly studies of negro life gives this vivid glimpse into a home where the negro and his wife had nineteen children he says this family of twenty-one is a poverty-stricken reckless dirty set the children are stupid and repulsive and fight for their food at the table they are poorly dressed sickly and cross the table dishes stand from one meal to another unwashed and the house is in perpetual disorder now and then the father and mother engage in a hand-to-hand -a -hand fight never heard the name of roosevelt it would be impossible to overemphasize the ignorance of many negro farmers it seems almost believable but after some good-humored talk with a group of old negroes i tried to find out how much they knew of the outside world i finally asked them if they knew theodore roosevelt they looked puzzled and finally one old fellow scratched his head and said where you say this here man lives in washington i said you've heard of the president of the united states i reckon i don't know he said and yet this old man gave me a first-class religious exhortation and one in the group had heard of booker t washington whom he described as a powerful big nigger why negroes go to cities i made inquiries among the negroes as to why they wanted to leave the farm and go to cities the answer i got from all sorts of sources was first the lack of schooling in the country and second the lack of protection and i heard also many stories of ill treatment of various sorts the distrust of the tenant of the landlord in keeping his accounts all of which dimly recognized tends to make many negroes escape the country if they can indeed it is growing harder and harder on the great plantations especially where the management is by overseers to keep a sufficient labor supply in some places the white landlords have begun to break up their plantations selling small farms to ambitious negroes a significant sign indeed of the passing of the feudal system an instance of this is found near thomaston georgia where dr c b thomas has long been selling land to negroes and encouraging them to buy by offering easy terms near dayton messrs price and allen have broken up their lockhart plantation and are selling it out to negroes i found similar instances in many places i visited commenting on this tendency the thomaston post says this is in part a solution of the so-called negro problem for those of the race who have property interests at stake cannot afford to antagonize their white neighbors or transgress the laws the ownership of land tends to make them better citizens in every way more thoughtful of the right of others and more ambitious for their own advancement at this place a number of neat and comfortable homes a commodious high school and a large lodge building besides a number of churches testify to the enterprise and thrift the best class of our colored population the tendency towards cutting up the large plantations is beginning to show itself and when all of them are so divided there will be no agricultural labor problem except perhaps in the gathering of an especially large crop three i have endeavored thus to give a picture of both sides of conditions in the black belt exactly as i saw them i can now do no better in further illumination of the conditions i have described than by looking at them through the eyes and experiences of two exceptionally able white men of the south both leaders in their respective walks of life neither of them politicians and both incidentally planters at jackson mississippi i met major r w millsaps a leading citizen of the state 
he comes of a family with the best southern traditions behind it he was born in mississippi graduated before the war at harvard college and although his father a slave owner had opposed secession the son fought four years in the confederate army rising to the rank of major he came out of the war as he says with no earthly possessions but a jacket and a pair of pants with a hole in them but he was young and energetic he began hauling cotton from jackson to natchez when cotton was worth almost its weight in gold he received ten dollars a bale for doing it and made four thousand dollars in three months he is now the president of one of the leading banks in mississippi interested in many important southern enterprises and the founder of millsaps college at jackson a modest useful christian gentleman an experiment in trusting negroes near greenville mississippi major millsaps owns a plantation of five hundred acres occupied by twenty tenants some seventy-five people in all it is in one of the richest agricultural sections the mississippi bottoms in the united states up to eighteen ninety he had a white overseer and he was constantly in trouble of one kind or another with his tenants when the price of cotton dropped he decided to dispense with the overseer entirely and try a rather daring experiment in short he planned to trust the negroes he got them together and said i am going to try you i am going to give you every possible opportunity if you don't make out i will go back to the overseer system in the sixteen years since then no white man has been on that plantation except as a visitor the land was rented direct to the negroes on terms that would give both landlord and tenant a reasonable profit did it work i asked i have never lost one cent said major millsaps no negro has ever failed to pay up and you couldn't drive them off the place when other farmers complain of shortage of labor and tenants i never have had any trouble every negro on the place owns his own mules and wagons and is out of debt nearly every family has bought or is buying a home in the little town of leland near by some of which are comfortably furnished they are all prosperous and contented how do you do it i asked the secret he said is to treat the negro well and give him a chance i have found that a negro like a white man is most responsive to good treatment even a dog responds to kindness the trouble is that most planters want to make too much money out of the negro they charge him too much rent they make too large profits on the supplies they furnish i know merchants who expect a return of fifty per cent on supplies alone the best negroes i have known are those who are educated negroes need more education of the right kind not less and it will repay us well if we give it to them it makes better not worse workers i asked him about the servant problem we never have any trouble he said i apply the same rule to servants as to the farmers treat them well don't talk insultingly of their people before them don't expect them to do too much work i believe in treating a negro with respect that doesn't mean to make equals of them you people in the north don't make social equals of your white servants jefferson davis's way with negroes then he told a striking story of jefferson davis i got a lesson in the treatment of negroes when i was a young man returning south from harvard i stopped in washington and called on jefferson davis then united states senator from mississippi 
we walked down Pennsylvania Avenue. Many Negroes bowed to Mr. Davis, and he returned the bow. He was a very polite man. I finally said to him that I thought he must have a good many friends among the Negroes. He replied, I can't allow any Negro to outdo me in courtesy. Plain Words from a White Man a few days later, on my way north, I met at Clarksdale, Mississippi, Walter Clark, one of the well-known citizens of the state and president of the Mississippi Cotton Association. In the interests of his organization, he has been speaking in different parts of the state on court days and at fairs. And the burden of his talks has been not only organization by the farmers, but a more intelligent and progressive treatment of Negro labor. Recognizing the instability of the ordinary Negro, the crime he commits, the great difficulties which the best-intentioned Southern planters have to meet, Mr. Clark yet tells his Southern audiences some vigorous truths. He said in a recent speech, "'Every dollar I own those Negroes made for me.' Our ancestors chased them down and brought them here. They are just what we make them. By our own greed and extravagance, we have spoiled a good many of them. It has been popular here, now happily growing less so, to exploit the Negro by high store prices and by encouraging him to get into debt. It has often made him hopeless. We have a low element of white people who are largely responsible for the Negro's condition. They sell him whiskey and cocaine. They corrupt Negro women. A white man who shoots craps with Negroes or who consorts with Negro women is worse than the meanest Negro that ever lived. At Coffeeville, where Mr. Clark talked somewhat to this effect, an old man who sat in front suddenly jumped up and said, "'That's the truth. Bully for you. Bully for you.'" In his talk with me, Mr. Clark said other significant things. "'Our people have treated the Negroes as helpless children all their days. The Negro has not been encouraged to develop even the capacities he has. He must be made to use his own brains, not ours.' Put him on his responsibility, and he will become more efficient. A Negro came to me not long ago, complaining that the farmer for whom he worked would not give him an itemized account of his charges at the store. I met the planter and asked him about it. He said to me, "'The black nigger, what does he know about it? He can't read it.' "'But he is entitled to it, isn't he?' I asked him, and the Negro got it. The credit system has been the ruin of many Negroes. It keeps them in hopeless debt, and it encourages the planter to exploit them. That's the truth. My plan is to put the Negro on a strict cash basis, give him an idea of what money is by letting him use it. Three years ago I started it on my plantation, a Negro would come to me and say, "'Boss, I want a pair of shoes.' "'All right,' I'd say. "'I'll pay you spot cash every night, and you can buy your own shoes.' In the same way, I made up my mind that we must stop paying Negroes fines when they got into trouble. I know planters who expect regularly every Monday to come into court and pay out about so many Negroes. It encourages the Negroes to do things they would not think of doing if they knew that they would be regularly punished. I've quit paying fines. My Negroes, if they get into trouble, have got to recognize their own responsibility for it and take what follows. That's the only way to make men of them. What we need in the South is intelligent labor, more efficient labor, I believe in the education of the Negro. Industrial training is needed, not only for the Negro, but for the whites as well. 
the white people down here have simply got to take the negro and make a man of him in the long run it will make him more valuable to us end of chapter five end of part one the negro in the south Chapter 6 of Following the Color Line, An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. The Negro in the North. Chapter 6. Following the Color Line in the North. Having followed the color line in the South, it is of extraordinary interest and significance to learn how the Negro fares in the North. Is he treated better or worse? Is Boston a more favorable location for him than Atlanta or New Orleans? A comparison of the Southern attitude and the Northern attitude throws a flood of light upon the Negro as a national problem in this country. Most of the perplexing questions in the North pertain to the city, but in the South the great problems are still agricultural. In the South the masses of Negroes live on the land. They are a part of the cotton, sugar, lumber, and turpentine industries. But in the North the Negro is essentially a problem of the great cities. He has taken his place in the babble of the tenements. Already he occupies extensive neighborhoods like the San Juan Hill District in New York and Bucktown in Indianapolis, and by virtue of an increasing volume of immigration from the South, he is overflowing his boundaries in all directions, expanding more rapidly, perhaps, than any other single element of urban population. In every important northern city, a distinct race problem already exists which must, in a few years, assume serious proportions. Country districts and the smaller cities in the North, for the most part, have no Negro question. A few Negroes are found in almost all localities, but an examination of the statistics of rural counties and of the lesser cities shows that the Negro population is diminishing in some localities increasing slightly in others in distinctly agricultural districts in the north the census exhibits an actual falling off of negro population of ten per cent between eighteen eighty and nineteen hundred cass county in michigan which has a famous negro agricultural colony one of the few in the north shows a distinct loss in population from 1,837 inhabitants in 1880, it dropped to 1,568 in 1900. A few Negro farmers have done well in the North. At Wilberforce, Ohio, I met two or three who had fine large farms and were prosperous, but the rural population is so small as to be negligible. NEGROES OF SMALL NORTHERN TOWNS Most of the Negroes in the smaller towns and cities of the North are of the stock which came by way of the Underground Railroad just before the Civil War, or during the period of philanthropic enthusiasm which followed it. They have come to fit naturally into the life of the communities where they live, and no one thinks especially of their color. There is, indeed, no more a problem with the Negro than with the Greek or Italian. In one community, Lansing, Michigan, with which I have been long familiar, the Negroes are mostly mulattoes, and their numbers have remained practically stationary for thirty years, while the white population has increased rapidly. At present, there are only about five hundred Negroes in a city of twenty-five thousand people. As a whole, the colored people of Lansing are peaceful and industrious, a natural part of the wage-working population. Individuals have become highly prosperous and are much respected. A few of the younger generation are idle and worthless. 
So far as comfortable conditions of life are concerned, where there is little friction or discrimination and a good opportunity for earning a respectable livelihood, I have found no places anywhere which seemed so favorable to Negroes as these smaller towns and cities in the North and West where the colored population is not increasing. But the moment there is new immigration from the South, the conditions cease to be utopian, as I shall show. The great cities of the North present a wholly different aspect. The increases of population there are not short of extraordinary. In 1880, Chicago had only 6,480 colored people. At present, 1908, it has about 45,000, an increase of some 600 percent. The census of 1900 gives the Negro population of New York as 60,666. It is now, 1908, probably not less than 80,000. Between 1890 and 1900, the Negroes of Philadelphia increased by 59 percent, while the Caucasians added only 22 percent, and the growth since 1900 has been even more rapid, the colored population now exceeding 80,000. It is difficult to realize the significance of these masses of colored population. The city of Washington today has a greater community of Negroes, some 100,000, than were ever before gathered together in one community in any part of the world, so far as we know. New York and Philadelphia both now probably have as many Negroes as any southern city, except Washington, if that be called a southern city. Nor must it be forgotten that about a ninth of the Negro population of the United States is in the North and West. Crowded communities of Negroes in northern latitudes have never before existed anywhere. Northern city conditions, therefore, present unique and interesting problems. I went first to Indianapolis because I had heard so much of the political power of the Negroes there. Afterward, I visited Cincinnati, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, and several smaller cities and country neighborhoods. In every large city, both white and colored people told me that race feeling and discrimination were rapidly increasing, that new and more difficult problems were constantly arising. Generally speaking, the more Negroes, the sharper the expression of prejudice. While the Negroes were an inconsequential part of the population, they passed unnoticed, but with increasing numbers, especially of the lower sort of Negroes and black Negroes, accompanied by competition for the work of the city and active political power, they are inevitably kindling the fires of race feeling. Prejudice has been incited also by echoes of the constant agitation in the South, the hatred-breeding speeches of Tillman and Vardaman, the incendiary and cruel books and plays of Dixon, and by the increased immigration of Southern white people with their strong Southern point of view. Pathetic Expectations of the Negro one finds something unspeakably pathetic in the spectacle of these untold thousands of Negroes who are coming north. To many of them, oppressed within the limitations set up by the South, it is indeed the promised land. I shall never forget the wistful eagerness of a Negro I met in Mississippi. He told me he was planning to move to Indianapolis. I asked him why he wanted to leave the South. They're Jim Crow in us down here too much, he said. There's no chance for a colored man who has any self-respect. But, I said, do you know that you will be better off when you get to Indianapolis? I hear they don't make no difference up there between white folks and colored, and that a hard-working man can get two dollars a day. Is that all so? Yes, that's pretty nearly so. I said. 
but as I looked at the fairly comfortable home he lived in, among his own people, I felt somehow that he would not find the promised land all that he anticipated. And after that I visited Indianapolis and other cities, and saw hundreds of just such eager Negroes after they had reached the promised land. Two classes of colored people came north, the worthless, ignorant, semi-criminal sort, who find in the intermittent high-paid day labor in the north, accompanied by the glittering excitement of city life, just the conditions they love best. Two or three years ago, the governor of Arkansas, Jeff Davis, pardoned a Negro criminal on condition that he would go to Boston and stay there. The other class is composed of self-respecting, hard-working people who are really seeking better conditions of life, a better chance for their children. And what do Negroes find when they reach the promised land? In the first place, the poorer sort find in Indianapolis the alley home, in New York the deadly tenement. Landowners in Indianapolis have been building long rows of cheap one-story frame tenements in back streets and alleys. The apartments have two or three rooms each. When new, they are brightly painted and papered, and to many Negroes from the South, accustomed to the primitive cabin, they are beautiful indeed. Even the older buildings are more pretentious, if not really better than anything they have known in the rural South. And how the city life, nearly as free to the colored man as to the white, stirs their pulses. No people, either black or white, are really free until they feel free. And to many Negroes, the first few weeks in a northern city give them the first glimpses they have ever had of what they consider to be liberty. A striking illustration of this feeling came to my notice at Columbia, South Carolina. One of the most respected Negro men there, respected by both races, was a prosperous tailor who owned a building on the main street of the city. He was well-to-do, had a family, and his trade came from both races. I heard that he was planning to leave the South, and I went to see him. "'Yes,' he said, "'I am going away. It's getting to be too dangerous for a colored man down here.' It was just after the Atlanta riot." "'Where are you going?' I asked. "'I think I shall go to Washington,' he said. "'Why Washington?' "'Well, you see, I want to be as near the flag as I can.' What the Negro really finds in the promised land. But they soon begin to learn things. It is true that the working man can get high wages, and the domestic servant is paid an amount which astonishes her. But, on the other hand, a fact that somehow never occurs to many of these people, or indeed to the foreigners who come flocking to our shores, the living cost is higher. For his gaudy tenements, the landlord extorts exorbitant rentals. Ignorance is ever roundly and mercilessly taxed. I saw a double house built for white people just on the edge of a Negro neighborhood and held at a rental of eighteen dollars a month, but not being able to secure white tenants, the landlord rented to Negroes for twenty-five dollars a month. When he came north, the Negro, even though he had lived in cities in the south, as many of the immigrants have, never dreamed that it would require such an amount of fuel to keep him through the long northern winter, or that his bill for lights, water, and everything else would be so high. And in the South, many Negro families of the poorer sort are greatly assisted by baskets of food brought from the white man's kitchen, and the gift of cast-off clothes and shoes, to say nothing of tobacco and even money, a lingering, loose survival of the relationships of slavery. But in the North, the Negro finds himself in an intense industrial atmosphere 
where relationships are more strictly impersonal and businesslike. What he gets, he must pay for. Charity exists on a large scale, as I shall show later, but it is the sharp, inquiring, organized charity of the North. In short, coming North to find a place where he will be treated more like a man and less like a serf, the Negro discovers that he must meet the competitive struggle to which men of the working class are subjected in the highly developed industrial systems of the North. SUFFERINGS OF THE NORTHERN NEGRO In the South, the great mass of Negroes have lived with their doors open, fireplaces have kept their homes ventilated, they could leave the matter of sanitation to fresh air and sunshine, and the Negro's very lack of training for such an environment as that of the North causes him untold suffering. To save fuel, and because he loves to be warm and sociable, he and his family and friends crowd into one close room, which is kept at fever temperature, not by a healthful fireplace, but by a tight stove. This, with the lack of proper sanitary conveniences, often becomes a hotbed of disease. Even in mild weather, I have been in Negro houses in the north where the air was almost unendurably warm and impure. I know of nothing more tragic than the condition of the swarming newer Negro populations of northern cities. The more tragic, because the Negro is so cheerful and patient about it all. I looked into the statistics closely in several of them, and in no instance does the birth rate keep pace with the death rate. Even allowing for the fact that birth statistics are not very accurately kept in most cities, it is probable that if it were not for the immigration constantly rolling upward from the south, the Negro population in northern cities would show a falling off. Consumption and the diseases of vice ravage their numbers. One of the ablest Negro physicians I have met, Dr. S. A. Furness, who has practiced among his people in Indianapolis for many years, has made a careful study of conditions. In a paper read before a medical association, Dr. Furness says, The reports of the Indianapolis Board of Health show that for no month in the last ten years has the birth rate among Negroes equaled the death rate. Here are the statistics from 1901 to 1905. 1901, 332 deaths, 279 births. 1902, 329 deaths, 280 births. 1903, 448 deaths, 283 births. 1904, 399 deaths, 327 births. 1905. 443 deaths, 384 births. Race suicide among Negroes. From inquiries that I have made everywhere in the North, there would seem, indeed, to be a tendency to race suicide among Negroes, as among the old American white stock. Especially is this true among the better-class Negroes. The ignorant Negro in southern agricultural districts is exceedingly prolific, but his northern city brother has comparatively few children. I have saved the record from personal inquiry of perhaps two hundred northern Negro families of the better class. Many have no children at all, many have one or two, and the largest family I found, in Boston, was seven children. I found one Negro family in the South with twenty-one children. Industrialism, of course, is not favorable to a large birth rate. All Northern cities show a notable surplus, according to the statistics, of Negro women over Negro men. Many of these are house servants and 
like the large class of roving single men who do day labor on the streets and railroads, they are without family ties and have no children. Dr. Furness finds that the deaths of Negroes from tuberculosis constitute over half the total deaths from that cause in the city of Indianapolis, whereas in proportion to Negro population they should constitute only one-eighth. His observations upon these startling facts are of great interest. I believe the reason for these conditions is plain. First of all, it is due to Negroes leaving the country and crowding into the larger cities, especially in the North, where they live in a climate totally different from that with which they have been familiar. They occupy unsanitary homes. They are frequently compelled to labor with insufficient food and clothing, and without proper rest. Of necessity, they follow the hardest and most exposed occupations in order to make a livelihood. I regret to say that intemperance and immorality play a part in making these figures what they are. They easily fall victim to the unusual vices of the city. Another reason for increased mortality is improper medical attention. Not only among the ignorant, but among the intelligent, we find too much trust put in patent medicines. The belief, latent it is true in many cases, but still existing among the ignorant, in the hoodoo militates against the close following of the doctor's orders. "'What shall we do about it?' asks Dr. Furness. We must urge those around us to more personal cleanliness, insist on a pure home life, and less dissipation and intemperance, to have fewer picnics and save more money for a rainy day. Tell the young people in the South not to come to northern cities, but to go to the smaller towns of the West, where they can have a fair chance. Unless something is done to change existing conditions, to stop this movement to our northern cities, to provide proper habitations and surroundings for those who are already here, it will be only a question of time until the problem of the American Negro will reach a solution not at all desirable from our point of view. Of course, a doctor always sees the pathological side of life, and his view is likely to be pessimistic. I saw much of the tragedy of the slum Negroes in the cities of the North, and yet many Negroes have been able to survive. Many have learned how to live in towns, and are making a success of their lives, as I shall show more particularly in the next chapter. It must not be forgotten that Negro families in Boston and Philadelphia, mostly mulattoes, it is true, as well as in Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans, have lived and thrived under city conditions for many generations. Not a few Negroes in Indianapolis whose homes I visited are housed better than the average of white families. Sickness Among Northern Negroes Not only is the death rate high in the North, but the Negro is hampered by sickness to a much greater degree than white people. Hospital records in Philadelphia show an excess of Negro patients over whites, according to population, of 125 percent. About 5,000 Negroes passed through the hospitals of Philadelphia last year, averaging a confinement of three weeks each. Mr. Warner, in American Charities, makes sickness the chief cause of poverty among colored people in New York, Boston, New Haven, and Baltimore. The percentage of sickness was twice or more as high as that of Germans, Irish, or white Americans. Such are the pains of readjustment which the Negroes are having to bear in the North. A question arises whether they can ever become a large factor of the population in northern latitudes. They are certainly not holding their own in the country or in the smaller cities, and in the large cities they are increasing at present, not by the birth rate, but by constant immigration. 
hostile physical conditions of life in the North are not the only difficulties that the Negro has to meet. He thought he left prejudice behind in the South, but he finds it also showing its teeth here in the North. And, as in the South, a wide difference is apparent between the attitude of the best class of white men and the lower class. HOW NORTHERNERS REGARD THE NEGRO One of the first things that struck me when I began studying race conditions in the North was the position of the better class of white people with regard to the Negro. In the South, every white man and woman has a vigorous and vital opinion on the race question. You have only to apply the match. The explosion is sure to follow. It is not so in the North. A few of the older people still preserve something of the wartime sentiment for the Negro, but the people one ordinarily meets don't know anything about the Negro, don't discuss him, and don't care about him. In Indianapolis, and indeed in other cities, the only white people I could find who were much interested in the Negroes were a few politicians, mostly of the lower sort, the charity workers, and the police. But that, of course, is equally true of the Russian Jews or the Italians. One of the first white men with whom I talked at Indianapolis said to me with some impatience, "'There are too many Negroes up here. They hurt the city.' Another told me of the increasing presence of Negroes in the parks, on the streets, and in the streetcars. He said, I suppose sooner or later we shall have to adopt some of the restrictions of the South. He said it without heat, but as a sort of tentative conclusion, he hadn't fully made up his mind. Race Prejudice in Boston In Boston, of all places, I expected to find much of the old sentiment. It does exist among some of the older men and women, but I was surprised at the general attitude which I encountered. It was one of hesitation and withdrawal. Summed up, I think the feeling of the better class of people in Boston, and elsewhere in northern cities, might be thus stated. We have helped the Negro to liberty. We have helped to educate him. We have encouraged him to stand on his own feet. Now let's see what he can do for himself. After all, he must survive or perish by his own efforts. In short, they have cast the bantling on the rocks. Though they still preserve the form of encouraging the Negro, the spirit seems to have fled. Not long ago, the Negroes of Boston organized a concert at which Theodore Drury, a colored musician of really notable accomplishments, was to appear. Aristocratic white people were appealed to and bought a considerable number of tickets. But on the evening of the concert, the large block of seats purchased by white people was conspicuously vacant. Northern white people would seem to be more interested in the distant southern Negro than in the Negro at their doors. Before I take up the cruder and more violent expressions of prejudice on the part of the lower class of white men in the North, I want to show the beginnings of cold shouldering, as it exists in varying degrees in northern cities, and especially in Boston, the old center of abolitionism. Superficially, at least, the Negro in Boston still enjoys the widest freedom, but after one gets down to real conditions, he finds much complaint and alarm on the part of Negroes over growing restrictions. Boston exercises no discrimination on the streetcars, on railroads, or in theaters, or other places of public gathering. The schools are absolutely free. A colored woman, Miss Maria Baldwin, is the principal of the Agassiz School of Cambridge, attended by 600 white children. I heard her spoken of in the highest terms by the white people. Eight Negro teachers, 
chosen through the ordinary channels of competitive examination, teach in the public schools. There are Negro policemen, Negro firemen, Negro office holders, fully as many of them as the proportion of Negro population in Boston could warrant. A Negro has served as commander of a white post of the Grand Army. End of Part 1 of Chapter 6part two of chapter six of following the color line an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray stannard baker this librivox recording is in the public domain prosperous negroes in boston several prosperous negro businessmen have won a large white patronage one of the chief merchant tailoring stores of boston with a location on Washington Street, which rents for $10,000 a year, is owned by J. H. Lewis. He has been in business many years. He employs both white and Negro workmen and clerks, and he has some of the best white trade in Boston. Not long ago he went to North Carolina and bought the old plantation where his father was a slave, and he even talks of going there to spend his old age. Another Negro, Gilbert H. Harris, conducts the largest wig-making establishment in New England. I visited his place. He employs colored girls, and his trade is exclusively white. Another Negro has a school of pharmacy in which all the students are white. Another, George Ham, has a prosperous news and stationery store. A dentist, Dr. Grant, who has a reputation in his profession for a cement which he invented, was formerly in the faculty of the Harvard Dentistry School, and now enjoys a good practice among white people. The real estate dealer who has the most extensive business in Cambridge, T. H. Raymond, is a Negro. He employs white clerks, and his business is chiefly with white people. Two or three Negro lawyers, Butler Wilson, in particular, have many white clients. Dr. Courtney, a colored physician from the Harvard Medical School, was for a time house physician for the Boston Lying In Hospital, in which the patients were practically all white, and has now a practice which includes both white and colored patients. Dr. Courtney has also served on the school board of Boston, an important elective office. The Negro poet, William Stanley Braithwaite, whose father took a degree at Oxford, England, is a member of the Authors Club of Boston. His poems have appeared in various magazines. He has written a volume of poems, a standard anthology of Elizabethan verse, and he is about to publish a critical study of the works of William Dean Howells. Several of these men meet white people socially, more or less. I give these examples to show the place occupied by the better and older class of Boston Negroes. Most of those I have mentioned are mulattoes, some very light. It shows what intelligent Negroes can do for themselves in a community where there has been little or no prejudice against them. But with crowding new immigration, and incited by all the other causes I have mentioned, these conditions are rapidly changing. A few years ago, no hotel or restaurant in Boston refused Negro guests. Now several hotels, restaurants, and especially confectionery stores will not serve Negroes, even the best of them. The discrimination is not made openly, but a Negro who goes to such places is informed that there are no accommodations, or he is overlooked and otherwise slighted, so that he does not come again. A strong prejudice exists against renting flats and houses in many white neighborhoods to colored people. The Negro in Boston, as in other cities, is building up quarters, which he occupies to the increasing exclusion of other classes of people. 
the great negro center is now in the south end a locality once occupied by some of the most aristocratic families of boston and yet as elsewhere they struggle for the right to live where they please a case in point is that of mrs mattie a mcadoo an educated colored woman almost white who has traveled abroad and is a woman of refinement she had a flat in an apartment house among white friends one of the renters a southern woman finding out that mrs mcadoo had colored blood objected the landlord refused to cancel mrs mcadoo's lease and the white woman left but the next year mrs mcadoo found that she could not re-rent her apartment the landlord in this instance was the son of an abolitionist he said to her you know i have no prejudice against colored people i will rent you an apartment in the building where i myself live if you want it but i can't let you into my other buildings because the tenants object an attempt was even made a year or so ago by a white woman to force miss baldwin the colored school principal to whom i have referred and who is almost one of the institutions of boston to leave franklin house where she was living no one incident perhaps awakened boston to the existence of race prejudice more sharply than this churches draw the color line one would think that the last harbor of prejudice would be the churches and yet i found strange things in boston there are and have been for a long time numerous colored churches in boston but many negroes especially those of the old families have belonged to the white churches in the last two years increased negro attendance especially at the episcopal churches has become a serious problem a quarter of the congregation of the church of the ascension is colored and the vicar has had to refuse any further colored attendance at the sunday school st peter's and st philip's churches in cambridge have also been confronted with the color problem a proposition is now afoot to establish a negro mission which shall gradually grow into a separate colored episcopal church a movement which causes much bitterness among the colored people i shall not soon forget the expression of hopelessness in the face of a prominent white church leader as he exclaimed what shall we do with these negroes i for one would like to have them stay i believe it is in accordance with the doctrine of christ but the proportion is growing so large that white people are drifting away from us strangers avoid us our organization is expensive to keep up and the negroes are able to contribute very little in proportion to their numbers think about it yourself what shall we do if we allow the negroes to attend freely it means that eventually all the white people will leave and we shall have a negro church whether we want it or not in no other city are there any considerable number of negroes who attend white churches except a few catholic churches at new orleans i have seen white and colored people worshiping together at the cathedrals white ministers sometimes have spasms of conscience that they are not doing all they should for the negro let me tell two significant incidents from philadelphia the worst negro slum in that city is completely surrounded by business houses and the homes of wealthy white people within a few blocks of it stand several of the most aristocratic churches of philadelphia miss bartholomew conducts a neighborhood settlement in the very center of this social bog twice during the many years she has been there white ministers have ventured down from their churches one of them said he had been troubled by the growing masses of ignorant colored people can't i do something to help miss bartholomew was greatly pleased and cheered of course you can she said heartily we're trying to keep some of the negro children off the streets 
There is plenty of opportunity for helping with our boys and girls clubs and classes. Oh, I didn't mean that, said the minister. I thought, in cases of death in their families, we might offer to read the burial service. And he went away and did not see the humor of it. Another minister made a similar proposition. He wanted to establish a Sunday school for colored people. He asked Miss Bartholomew anxiously where he could hold it. "'Why not in your church in the afternoon?' "'Why, we couldn't do that,' he exclaimed. "'We should have to air all the cushions afterward.' But to return to Boston. A proposition was recently made to organize for colored people a separate YMCA, but the white members voted against any such discrimination. Yet a colored man said to me, hopelessly, "'It's only delayed. Next time we shall put off with a separate institution.'" Color Line at Harvard Even at Harvard, where the Negro has always enjoyed exceptional opportunities, conditions are undergoing a marked change. A few years ago, a large class of white students voluntarily chose a brilliant Negro student, R. C. Bruce, as valedictorian. But last year, a Negro baseball player was the cause of so much discussion and embarrassment to the athletic association that there will probably never be another colored boy on the university teams. The line has already been drawn, indeed, in the medical department. Although a colored doctor only a few years ago was house physician at the Boston Lying-In Hospital, colored students are no longer admitted to that institution. One of them, Dr. Welker, an Iowa colored man, cannot secure his degree because he hasn't had six obstetrical cases, and he can't get the six cases because he isn't admitted with his white classmates to the Lying-In Hospital. It is a curious fact that not only the white patients, but some Negro patients object to the colored doctors. In a recent address which has awakened much sharp comment among Boston Negroes, President Eliot of Harvard indicated his sympathy with the general policy of separate education in the South by remarking that if Negro students were in the majority at Harvard, or formed a large proportion of the total number, some separation of the races might follow. And this feeling is growing, notwithstanding the fact that no Negro student has ever disgraced Harvard, and that no students are more orderly or law-abiding than the Negroes. On the other hand, Negro students have frequently made distinguished records for scholarship. Last year, one of them, Alain Leroy Locke, who took the course in three years, won the first of the three Bowdoin Prizes, the most important bestowed at Harvard, for a literary essay, and passed for his degree with a magna cum laude. Since then he has been accepted, after a brilliant competitive examination, for the Rhodes Scholarship from the state of Pennsylvania. Such feeling as that which is developing in the North comes hard, indeed, upon the intelligent, educated, ambitious Negro, especially if he happens to have, as a large proportion of these Negroes do have, no little white blood. Many colored people in Boston are so white that they cannot be told from white people, yet they are classed as Negroes. Accompanying this change of attitude, this hesitation and withdrawal of the better class of white men, one finds crude sporadic outbreaks on the part of the rougher element of white men, who have merely a different way of expressing themselves. WHITE GANGS ATTACK NEGROES In Indianapolis, the Negro comes in contact with the bungalow gangs, crowds of rough and lawless white boys who set upon Negroes and beat them frightfully, often wholly without provocation. Although no law prevents Negroes from entering any park in Indianapolis, 
they are practically excluded from at least one of them by the danger of being assaulted by these gangs. The streetcars are free in all northern cities, but the Negro, nevertheless, sometimes finds it dangerous to ride with white people. Professor R. R. Wright, Jr., himself a Negro, and an acute observer of Negro conditions, tells this personal experience. I came out on the car from the University of Pennsylvania one evening in May, about eight o'clock. Just as the car turned off 27th to Lombard Street, a crowd of about 100 little white boys, from six to about 14 years of age, attacked it. The car was crowded, but there were only about a dozen Negroes on it, about half of them women. The mob of boys got control of the car by pulling off the trolley. They threw stones into the car, and finally some of them boarded the car and began to beat the Negroes with sticks, shouting as they did so, "'Kill the nigger! Lynch him! Hit that nigger!' etc. This all happened in Philadelphia. Doubtless these urchins had been reading in the daily papers the cry, "'Kill the Negro!' and they were trying to carry out the injunction. While I was in Indianapolis, a clash of enough importance to be reported in the newspapers occurred between the races on a street car, and in New York, in the San Juan Hill district, one Sunday evening I saw an incident which illustrates the almost instinctive race antagonism which exists in the northern cities. The street was crowded. Several Negro boys were playing on the pavement. Stones were thrown. Instantly several white boys sided together and began to advance on the Negroes. In less time than it takes to tell it, thirty or forty white boys and young men were chasing the Negroes down the street. At the next corner the Negroes were joined by dozens of their own race. Stones and sticks began to fly everywhere, and if it hadn't been for the prompt action of two policemen, there would have been a riot similar to those which have occurred not once but many times in New York City during the past two years. Of course, these instances are exceptional, but nonetheless significant. Bumptiousness as a Cause of Hatred Some of the disturbances grow out of a characteristic of a certain sort of Negro, the expression of which seems to stir the deepest animosity in the city white boy, and that is the bumptiousness, the airiness of the half-ignorant young Negro, who feeling that he has rights, wants to be occupied constantly in using them. He mistakes liberty for license. Although few in numbers among thousands of quiet colored people, he makes a large showing. In the South they call him the smart Negro, and an almost irresistible instinct exists among white boys of a certain class to take him down. I remember walking in Indianapolis with an educated northern white man. We met a young negro immaculately dressed. His hat band was blue and white. His shoes were patent leather with white tops. He wore a flowered waistcoat, and his tread as he walked was something to see. "'Do you know,' said my companion, I never see that young fellow without wanting to step up and knock his head off. I know something about him. He is absolutely worthless. He does no work, but lives on the wages of a hard-working colored woman and spends all he can get on his clothes. I know the instinct is childish, but I am just telling you how I feel. I am not sure it is a racial prejudice. I presume I should feel much the same way toward a Frenchman if he did the same thing. And somehow I can't help believing that a good thrashing would improve that boy's character. I'm telling this incident just as it happened to show a sidelight on one of the manifestations of the growing prejudice. One more illustration. 
Miss Eaton conducts a social settlement for Negroes in Boston. One day a teacher said to one of the little Negro boys in her class, "'Please pick up my handkerchief.' The boy did not stir. She again requested him to pick up the handkerchief. Then she asked him why he refused. "'The days of slavery are over,' he said. Now, this spirit is not common, but it exists, and it injures the Negro people out of all proportions to its real seriousness. In certain towns in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, on the borders of the Old South, the feeling has reached a stage still more acute. At Springfield, Ohio, two race riots have occurred, in the first of which a Negro was lynched and in the second, many Negroes were driven out of town, and a row of colored tenements was burned. There are counties and towns where no Negro is permitted to stop overnight. At Syracuse, Ohio, Lawrenceburg, Elwood, and Salem, Indiana, for example, Negroes have not been permitted to live for years. If a Negro appears, he is warned of conditions, and if he does not leave immediately, he is visited by a crowd of boys and men and forced to leave. A farmer who lives within a few miles of Indianapolis told me of a meeting held only a short time ago by thirty-five farmers in his neighborhood in which an agreement was passed to hire no Negroes nor to permit Negroes to live anywhere in the region. STORY OF A NORTHERN RACE RIOT I stopped at Greensburg, Indiana, on my way east, and found there a remarkable illustration showing just how feeling arises in the North. Greensburg is a comfortable, well-to-do, conservative, church-going old town in eastern Indiana. Many of the residents are retired farmers. The population of 7,000 is mostly of pure American stock largely of northern origin. And yet last April this quiet old town was shaken by a race riot. I made careful inquiries as to conditions there, and I was amazed to discover how closely this small disturbance paralleled the greater riot at Atlanta, which I have already written about. Negroes had lived in Greensburg for many years, a group of self-respecting, decent, prosperous men and women. They were known to and highly regarded by their white neighbors. One of them, named Brooks, owned a barber shop and was janitor for the Presbyterian Church and for one of the banks. Another, George W. Edwards, whom I met, has been for years an employee in the Garland Mills. "'There isn't a better citizen in town than Edwards,' a white lawyer told me, and I heard the same thing from other white men. Another Negro, George Guess, is an engineer at the electric light plant. Of the local Negro boys, Robert Lewis, the first colored graduate of the local schools, is now teaching engineering at Hampton Institute. Oscar Langston, another Negro boy, is a dentist in Indianapolis. These and other Negroes live in good homes, support a church, and have a respectable society of their own. I found just such a body of good colored people in Atlanta. Well, progress brought an electric railroad to Greensburg. To work on this and on improvements made by the railroad, hundreds of laborers were required and they were Negroes of the ignorant, wandering, unlooked-after sort, so common in similar occupations in the South. When the work was finished, a considerable number of them remained in Greensburg. Now Greensburg, like other American cities, was governed by a mayor who was a good fellow, and who depended on two influences to elect him, party loyalty and the saloon vote. He allowed a Negro dive to exist in one part of the town, 
where the idle and worthless Negroes congregated, where a murder was committed about a year before the riot. Exactly like Decatur Street in Atlanta. A rotten spot always causes trouble sooner or later. Good citizens protested and objected to no purpose. They even organized a good citizenship league, the purpose of which was to secure a better enforcement of law. But the saloon interests were strong and wanted to sell whiskey and beer to the Negroes, and the city authorities were complacent. "'Who cares?' one of them asked. "'About a few worthless Negroes.' But in a democracy people must care for one another. A NEGRO CRIME IN THE NORTH One day last April, a Negro laborer who had been working for Mrs. Sefton, a highly respected widow who lived alone, appeared in the house in broad daylight and criminally assaulted her. His name was John Green, a Kentucky Negro. He was not only ignorant, but half-witted. He had already committed a burglary and had not been punished. He was easily caught, convicted, and sentenced. But the town was angry. On April 30th a crowd of men and boys gathered, beat two or three Negroes, and drove many out of town. They never thought of mobbing the city officials who had allowed the Negro dives to exist. And, as in Atlanta, the decent Negroes suffered with the criminals. A crowd broke windows in the home of George Edwards and threatened other respectable colored men. As in Atlanta, the better white people were horrified and scandalized. But, as in Atlanta, the white men who made up the mob went unpunished, though Atlanta did mildly discipline a few rioters. As in Atlanta, the newspaper reports that were sent out made no distinction between the different sorts of Negroes. The entire Negro population of Greensburg was blamed for the crime of a signal ignorant and neglected man. I have several different newspaper reports of the affair from outside papers, and nearly all indicate in the headlines that all the Negroes in Greensburg were concerned in the riot and were driven out of town, which was not, of course, true. As a matter of fact, the respectable Negroes are still living in Greensburg on friendly terms with the white people. Human Nature, North and South In fact, the more I see of conditions North and South, the more I see that human nature north of Mason and Dixon's line is not different from human nature south of the line. Different degrees of prejudice, it is true, are apparent in the two sections. In the south, the social and political prejudice, the natural result of the memories of slavery and reconstruction, of the greater mass of Negro population and of the backward economic development, is stronger. In the North, on the other hand, comparatively little social and political prejudice is apparent, but the Negro has a hard fight to get anything but the most subservient place in the economic machine. Over and over again, while I was in the South, I heard remarks like this. Down here we make the Negro keep his place socially, but in the North you won't let him work. This leads me to one of the most important phases of race relationship in the North, that is, the economic struggle of the Negro, suddenly thrown, as he has been, into the swift-moving, competitive conditions of Northern cities. Does he, or can he, survive? Do the masses of Negroes now coming North realize their ambitions? Is it true that the North will not let the Negro work? These questions must, perforce, be discussed in another chapter. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Following the Color Line 
an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray stannard baker this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the negro's struggle for survival in northern cities one of the questions i asked of negroes whom i met both north and south was this what is your chief cause of complaint in the south the first answer nearly always referred to the jim crow cars or the jim crow railroad stations after that the complaint was of political disfranchisement the difficulty of getting justice in the courts the lack of good school facilities and in some localities of the danger of actual physical violence but in the north the first answer invariably referred to working conditions the negro isn't given a fair opportunity to get employment he is discriminated against because he is colored professor kelly miller one of the acutest of negro writers has said the negro in the north is compelled to loiter around the edges of industry southern white men are fond of meeting northern criticism of southern treatment of the negro with the response but the north closes the doors of industrial opportunity to the negro and yet in spite of this complaint of conditions in the north one who looks southward can almost see the army of negroes gathering from out of the cities villages and farms bringing nothing with them but a buoyant hope in a distant freedom but tramping always northward and they come not alone from the old south but from the west indies where the colored population looks wistfully toward the heralded opportunities of america a few are even coming from south africa and south america in new york boston and philadelphia thousands of such foreign negroes know nothing of america traditions some of them do not even speak the english language and why do they come if their difficulties are so great is it true that there is no chance for them in industry are they better or worse off in the north than in the south in the first place in most of the smaller northern cities where the negro population is not increasing rapidly discrimination is hardly noticeable negroes enter the trades find places in the shops or even follow competitive business callings and still maintain friendly relationships with the white people but the small towns are not typical of the new race conditions in the north the situation in the greater centers of population where negro immigration is increasing largely is decidedly different as i traveled in the north i heard many stories of the difficulties which the colored man had to meet in getting employment of course as a negro said to me there are always places for the colored man at the bottom he can always get work at unskilled manual labor or personal or domestic service in other words at menial employment he has had that in plenty in the south but what he seeks as he becomes educated is an opportunity for better grades of employment he wants to rise it is not then his complaint that he cannot get work in the north but that he is limited in his opportunities to rise to get positions which his capabilities if it were not for his color would entitle him to he is looking for a place where he will be judged at his worth as a man not as a negro this he came to the north to find and he meets difficulties of which he had not dreamed in the south at indianapolis i found a great discussion going on over what to do with a large number of idle young colored people some of whom had been through the public schools but who could not apparently find any work to do as an able colored man said to me what shall we do here are our young people educated in the schools capable of doing good work in many occupations where skill and intelligence are required and yet with few opportunities opening for them 
They don't want to dig ditches or become porters or valets any more than intelligent white boys. They are human. The result is that some of them drop back into idle discouragement, or worse. In New York I had a talk with William L. Bulkley, the colored principal of public school number 80, attended chiefly by colored children, who told me of the great difficulties and discouragements which confronted the Negro boy who wanted to earn his living. He relates this story. I received a communication the other day from an electric company, stating that they could use some bright, clean, industrious boys in their business, starting them at so much a week and aiding them to learn the business. I suspected that they did not comprehend colored boys under the generic term, boys, but thought to try. So I wrote asking if they would give employment to a colored boy who could answer to the qualification stated. The next mail brought the expected reply that no colored boy, however promising, was wanted. I heaved a sigh and went on. The saddest thing that faces me in my work is the small opportunity for a colored boy or girl to find proper employment. A boy comes to my office and asks for his working papers. He may be well up in the school, possibly with graduation only a few months off. I question him somewhat as follows. Well, my boy, you want to go to work, do you? What are you going to do? I'm going to be a door boy, sir. Well, you will get two dollars and fifty cents or three dollars a week, but after a while that will not be enough. What then? After a moment's pause he will reply, I should like to be an office boy. Well, what next? A moment's silence, and I should try to get a position as bell boy. Well, then, what next? A rather contemplative mood, and then, I should like to climb to the position of head bell boy. He has now arrived at the top. Further than this, he sees no hope. He must face the bald fact that he must enter business as a boy and wind up as a boy. And yet, in spite of these difficulties, Negroes come north every year in increasing numbers, they find living expensive, they suffer an unusual amount of sickness and death, they meet more prejudice than they expected to meet, and yet they keep coming. Much as Negroes complain of the hardship of northern conditions, and though they are sometimes pitifully homesick for the old life in the south, I have yet to find one who wanted to go back unless he had accumulated enough money to buy land. "'Why do they come?' I asked a Negro minister in Philadelphia. "'Well, they're treated more like men up here in the North,' he said. "'That's the secret of it. There's prejudice here, too, but the color line isn't drawn in their faces at every turn, as it is in the South. It all gets back to a question of manhood.' In the North, prejudice is more purely economic than it is in the South, an incident of industrial competition. In the South, the Negro still has the field of manual labor largely to himself. He is unsharpened by competition. But when he reaches the northern city, he not only finds the work different and more highly organized and specialized, but he finds that he must meet the fierce competition of half a dozen eager, struggling, ambitious groups of foreigners who are willing and able to work long hours at low pay in order to get a foothold. He has to meet often for the first time the Italian, the Russian Jew, the Slav, to say nothing of the white American laborer. He finds the pace set by competitive industry immensely harder than in most parts of the South. No life in the world, perhaps, requires as much in brain and muscle of all classes of men as that of the vast northern cities in the United States. 
I have talked with many colored workmen, and I am convinced that not a few of them fail, not because of their color, nor because they are lazy. Negroes in the North are, of the most part, hard workers. They must be, else they starve or freeze, but for simple lack of speed and skill. They haven't learned to keep the pace set by the white man. A contractor in New York who employs large numbers of men said to me, "'It isn't color so much as plain efficiency. I haven't any sentiment in the matter at all. It's business. As a general rule, the ordinary colored man can't do as much work nor do it as well as the ordinary white man. The result is I don't take colored men when I can get white men.' Yet I have several colored men who have been with me for years, and I wouldn't part with them for any white man I know. In the same way, I would rather employ Italians than Russian Jews. They're stronger workers. Not unnaturally, the Negro charges these competitive difficulties which he has to meet in the North, as he has been accustomed to do in the South, to the white man. He calls it color prejudice, when, as a matter of fact, it is often only the cold business-like requirement of an industrial life which demands tremendous efficiency, which in many lines of activity has little more feeling than a machine that is willing to use Italians or Japanese or Chinese or Negroes or Hindus or any other people on the face of the earth. On the other hand, no doubt exists that many labor unions, especially in the skilled trades, are hostile to Negroes, even though they may have no rules against their admission. I heard the experience of an expert Negro locomotive engineer named Burns, who had a run out of Indianapolis to the south. Though he was much in favor with the company, and indeed with many trainmen who knew him personally, the general feeling was so strong that by soaping the tracks, injuring his engine, and in other ways making his work difficult and dangerous, he was finally forced to abandon his run. If there were space, I could give many accounts of strikes against the employment of Negroes. The feeling among union labor men has undoubtedly been growing more intense in the last few years owing to the common use of Negroes as strike-breakers. With a few thousand Negroes, the employers broke the great stockyard strike in Chicago in 1904, and the Teamsters strike in the following year. Color prejudice is used like any other weapon for strengthening the monopoly of the labor union. I know several unions which are practically monopolistic corporations into which any outsider, white, yellow, or black, penetrates with the greatest difficulty. Such closely organized unions keep the Negroes out in the South exactly as they do in the North. A Negro tile-setter, steam-fitter, or plumber can no more get into a union in Atlanta than in New York. Of course, these unions, like any other closely organized group of men, employ every weapon to further their cause. They use prejudice as a competitive fighting weapon. They seize upon the color of the negro, or the pigtail and curious habits of the Chinaman, or the low living standard of the Hindu, to fight competition and protect them in their labor monopoly. And yet, although I expected to find the Negro wholly ostracized by union labor, I discovered that where the Negro becomes numerous or skillful enough, he, like the Italian or the Russian Jew, begins to force his way into the unions. The very first Negro carpenter I chanced to meet in the North, from whom I had expected a complaint of discrimination, said to me, "'I'm all right.' I'm a member of the union and get union wages. And I found, after inquiry, that there are a few Negroes in most of the unions of skilled workers, carpenters, masons, iron workers, even in the exclusive typographical union, 
and in the railroad organizations, a few here and there, mostly mulattoes. They have got in just as the Italians get in, not because they are wanted or because they are liked, but because by being prepared, skilled, and energetic, the unions have had to take them in as a matter of self-protection. In the South, the Negro is more readily accepted as a carpenter, blacksmith, or bricklayer than in the North, not because he is more highly regarded, but because, unlike the North, the South has almost no other labor supply. In several great industries, North and South, indeed, the Negro is as much a part of labor unionism as the white man. Thousands of Negroes are members of the United Mine Workers, John Mitchell's great organization, and they stand on an exact industrial equality with the whites. Other thousands are in the Cigar Makers Union, where, by virtue of economic pressure, they have forced recognition. Indeed, in the North, in spite of the complaint of discrimination, I found Negroes working and making a good living in all sorts of industries, union or no union. A considerable number of Negro firemen have good positions in New York. A contracting Negro plumber in Indianapolis, who uses colored help, has been able to maintain himself not only against white competition, but against the opposition of organized white labor. I know of Negro paper hangers and painters, not union men, but making a living at their trade and gradually getting hold. A good many Negro printers, pressmen, and the like are now found in Negro offices. Over two hundred newspapers and magazines are published by Negroes in this country, who are getting their training. I know of several girls, all mulattoes, who occupy responsible positions in offices in New York and Chicago. Not a few colored nurses, seamstresses, and milliners have found places in the life of the North which they seem capable of holding. It is not easy for them to make progress. Each colored man who takes a step ahead must prove, for his race, that a colored man can, after all, do his special work as well as a white man. The presumption is always against him. Here is a little newspaper account of a successful skilled pattern maker in Chicago. A few days ago, a large box containing 21 large and small patterns was shipped to the Jamestown Exhibition by the McGuire Car Company of Paris, Illinois one of the largest car companies in the West. Before the box was shipped, scores of newspapermen, engineers, and businessmen were permitted to inspect what is said to be the most complete and most valuable exhibit of the kind ever sent to an exhibition in this country. The contents of this precious box is entirely the work of a colored man named George A. Harrison. Mr. Harrison is one of the highest salaried men on the payroll of the company. He makes all the patterns for all of the steel, brass, and iron castings for every kind of car made by this company. He graduated at the head of his class of sixty members in a pattern-making establishment in Chicago. Cases of this sort are exceptional among the vast masses of untrained Negro population in the cities, and yet it shows what can be done, and the very possibility of such advancement encourages Negroes to come north. Trades which Negroes dominate. So much for the higher branches of industry. In some of the less skilled occupations, on the other hand, the Negro is not only getting hold, but actually becoming dominant. The asphalt workers are nearly all colored. In New York they have a strong union, and although part of the membership is white, chiefly Italian, the chosen representative who sits with the Central Federated Union of the city is James H. Wallace, a colored man. 
In Indianapolis I found that the hod carrier's industry was almost wholly in the hands of Negroes who have a strong union, with a large strike fund put aside. So successful have they been that they now propose erecting a building of their own as a clubhouse. Although there are white men in the union, the officers are all colored. Not long ago, some of the colored members began to rush a white man at his work. It was reported to the union and hotly discussed. The colored members finally decided that there should be no discrimination against white men, and fined one of the Negro offenders for his conduct. He couldn't pay and had to leave town. Where the Negro workman gets a foothold in the North, he often does very well indeed. R. R. Wright, Jr., calls attention to conditions in the Midvale Steel Company, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, employer of Negro labor in Philadelphia. Charles J. Harra, the president of this company, said before the United States Industrial Commission in 1900, we have fully eight hundred or a thousand colored men. The balance are Americans, Irish, and Germans. The colored labor we have is excellent. They are lusty fellows. We have some with shoulders twice as broad as mine, and with chests twice as deep as mine. The men come up here ignorant and untutored. We teach them the benefit of discipline. We teach the colored man the benefit of thrift and coax him to open a bank account, and he generally does it, and in a short time has money in it, and nothing can stop him from adding money to that bank account. We have no colored men who drink. Asked as to the friction between the white and black workmen, Mr. Harrow replied, Not a bit of it. They work cheek by jowl with Irish, and when the Irishman has a festivity at home, he has colored men invited. We did it with trepidation. We introduced one man at first to sweep up the yard, and we noticed that the Irish and Germans looked at him askance. Then we put in another. Then we put them in the boiler room. And then we got them in the open hearth and in the forge, and gradually we got them everywhere. They are intelligent and docile, and when they come in as laborers, unskilled, they gradually become skilled, and in the course of time we will make excellent foremen out of them. Mr. Harrah added that there was absolutely no difference in wages of Negroes and whites in the same grade of work. I have pointed out especially in my last article how and where prejudice was growing in northern cities as it certainly is. On the other hand, where one gets down under the surface, there are to be found many counteracting influences, those quiet constructive forces which, not being sensational or threatening, attract too little attention. Northern people are able to help Negroes where Southern people are deterred by the intensity of social prejudice for in most places in the South, the teaching of Negroes still means social ostracism. HELP FOR NEGROES IN THE NORTH Settlement work, in one form or another, has been instituted in most northern cities, centers of enlightenment and hope. I have visited a number of these settlements, and have seen their work. They are doing much, especially in giving a moral tone to a slum community. They help to keep the children off the streets by means of clubs and classes. They open the avenues of sympathy between the busy upper world and the struggling lower world. Such is the work of Miss Bartholomew, Miss Hancock, Miss Wharton in Philadelphia, Miss Eaton in Boston, Mrs. Celia Parker Woolley in Chicago, Miss Ovington in New York. Miss Hancock, a busy, hopeful Quaker woman, has a broom squad of Negro boys 
which makes a regular business of sweeping several of the streets in the very worst slum district in philadelphia it gives them employment and it teaches them civic responsibility and pride but perhaps i can give the best idea of these movements by telling of the different forms of work in a single city indianapolis in the first place the flanner guild projected by mr flanner a white man is maintained largely by white contributions but it is controlled wholly by colored people millinery classes were opened for girls of which there are now many practicing graduates eight of whom are giving lessons in indianapolis and in other cities and there are clubs and social gatherings of all sorts it has been indeed a helpful social center of influence in the south as i have shown negroes receive much off-hand individual charity food from the kitchen gifts of old clothes and money but it is largely personal and unorganized in the north there is comparatively little indiscriminate giving but an effort to reach and help negro families by making them help themselves one of the difficulties of the negro is improvidence but once given a start on the road to money saving it is often astonishing to see him try to live up to cash in the bank the charity organization society of indianapolis has long maintained a dime savings and loan association which employs six women collectors one colored who visit hundreds of homes every week these form indeed a core of friendly visitors the work of collecting the savings furnishing them an opportunity of getting into the homes and so winning the confidence of the people that they can help them in many ways last year over six thousand depositors were registered in the association two-thirds of whom were negroes and over twenty five thousand dollars was on deposit not less than twenty-five cents a week is accepted but many negroes save much more as soon as they get into the habit of saving they usually transfer their accounts to the savings bank and once with a bank book they are on the road to genuine improvement another work of great value which mr grout of the charity organization society has organized is vacant lot cultivation by securing the use of vacant land in and around the city many negro families have been encouraged to make gardens thus furnishing healthful and self-respecting occupation for the old or very young members of many negro families who otherwise might become public charges the plots are ploughed and seeds are provided the negroes do their own work and take the crop the work is supported by voluntary contributions from white people a number of negro women have raised enough vegetables not only to supply themselves but have had some to sell negro children are closely looked after in indianapolis compulsory education applies equally to both races every family thus comes also under the more or less active attention of the school authorities an officer miss sarah colton smith is employed exclusively to visit and keep watch of the negro children her work also is largely that of the friendly visitor helping the various overworked mothers with suggestions taking an interest in negro organizations for example the colored woman's club working with miss smith has organized a day nursery which cares for some of the very young children of working negro women thereby allowing the older ones to go to school indianapolis which has one of the most progressive and intelligent school systems wholly non-political in the country is also thoroughly alive to the necessity of industrial education for both races significantly enough the negro schools were first fitted with industrial departments so that for a time 
the cost of education per capita in Indianapolis was higher for colored children than for white. When I expressed my surprise at this unusual condition, I was told, Of course the immediate need of the Negro was greater. Night schools are also held in the public school buildings from November to April, two schools for Negroes especially, where colored people of all ages are at liberty to attend. It is a remarkable sight. Negroes, fifty and sixty years old, mingle there with mere children. The girls are taught sewing and cooking, the men carpentry, besides the ordinary branches. One old man from the South was found crying with joy over his ability to write his name. For the very young children, Negro equally with white, there is Mrs. Eliza Blaker's kindergarten. For the aged colored women, a home is now supported principally by the colored people themselves. End of Part 1 of Chapter 7「Part Two of Chapter Seven of Following the Color Line: An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Morals of Negro Women I saw a good deal of these various lines of activity and talked with the people who come close in touch with the struggling masses of the Negro poor. I wish I had room to tell some of the stories I heard. The black masses of poverty, disease, hopeless ignorance, and yet everywhere shot through with hopeful tendencies and individual uplift and success. In Indianapolis, as in other northern cities, I heard much to the credit of the Negro women. If the Negro is saved here in the North, Miss Smith told me, it will be due to the women. They gave me many illustrations showing how hard the Negro women worked, taking in washing or going out every day to work, raising their families, keeping the home, sometimes supporting worthless husbands. A Negro woman of the lower class, one visitor said to me, rarely expects her husband to support her. She takes the whole burden herself. And the women so the loan association visitors told me, are the chief savers. They are the ones who get and keep the bank accounts. I have heard a great deal south and north about the immorality of Negro women. Much immorality no doubt exists, but no honest observer can go into any of the crowded colored communities of northern cities and study the life without coming away with a new respect for the Negro women. Another hopeful work in Indianapolis is the juvenile court. A boy who commits a crime is not immediately cast off to become a more desperate criminal and ultimately to take his revenge upon the society which neglected him. He comes into a specially organized court where he meets not violence but friendliness and encouragement. Mrs. Helen W. Rogers is at the head of the probation work in Indianapolis, and she has under her supervision a large corps of voluntary probation officers, thirty of whom are colored men and women, the best in town. These colored probation officers have an organization of which George W. Cable, who is the foreman of the distributing department of the Indianapolis Post Office, is the chairman. A Negro boy charged with an offense is turned over to one of these leading Negro men or women, required to report regularly, and helped until he gets on his feet again. Thus far the system has worked with great success. Boys whose offenses are too serious for probation are sent, not to jail or chain gang, where they become habitual criminals, but to a reform school where they are taught regular habits of work. Why the Negro Often Fails As I continued my inquiries, I found that the leading colored men in most cities, 
though they might be ever so discouraged over the condition of the ignorant, reckless masses of their people, were awakening to the fact that the Negro's difficulty in the North was not all racial, not all due to mere color prejudice, but also in large measure to lack of training, lack of aggressiveness and efficiency, lack of organization. In New York, a Committee for Improving the Industrial Condition of Negroes has been formed. It is composed of both white and colored men, and the secretary is S. R. Scotron, an able colored man. The object of the committee is to study the condition of the Negroes in New York City, find out the causes of idleness, and try to help the Negro to better employment. This committee has experienced difficulty not so much in finding openings for Negroes as in getting reliable Negroes to fill them. Boys and girls, though educated in public schools, come out without knowing how to do anything that will earn them a living. Although the advantages of Cooper Institute and other industrial training schools are open to Negroes, they have been little used either from lack of knowledge of the opportunity, or because the Negroes preferred the regular literary courses of the schools. So many unskilled and untrained Negroes, both old and young, have discouraged many employers from trying any sort of Negro help. I shall not forget the significant remark of a white employer I met in Indianapolis, a broad-gauge man, known for his philanthropies. I've tried Negro help over and over again, hoping to help out the condition of Negro idleness we have here. I have had two or three good Negro workers, but so many of them have been wholly undisciplined, irresponsible, and sometimes actually dishonest, that I've given up trying. When I hear that an applicant is colored, I don't employ him. Upon this very point, Professor Bulkley said to me, the great need of the young colored people is practical training in industry. A Negro boy can't expect to get hold in a trade unless he has had training. R. R. Wright, Jr., who has made a study of conditions in Philadelphia, says, It is in the skilled trades that the Negroes are at the greatest disadvantage. Negroes have been largely shut out of mechanical trades, partly because of indifference and occasional active hostility of labor unions, partly because it has been difficult to overcome the traditional notion that a Negro's place is in domestic service, but chiefly because there have been practically no opportunities for Negroes to learn trades. Those Negroes who know skilled trades and follow them are principally men from the South who learn their trades there. The poorest of them fall into domestic service, the best have found places at their trades. For the Negro boy who is born in this city, it is difficult to acquire a trade, and here, I say, the system has been weakest. With the idea of giving more practical training, School No. 80 in New York, of which Professor Bulkley is principal, is now opened in the evenings for industrial instruction. Last year, 1,300 colored people, young and old, were registered. In short, there is a recognition in the North, as in the South, of the need of training the Negro to work. And not only the Negro, but the white boy and girl as well, as Germany and other European countries have learned. THE ROAD FROM SLAVERY TO FREEDOM At Indianapolis I found an organization of Negro women called the Woman's Improvement Club. The president, Mrs. Lillian T. Fox, told me what the club was doing to solve the problem of the colored girl and boy who could not get work. She found that, after all, white prejudice was not so much a bugaboo as she had imagined. The newspapers gave publicity to the work. The commercial club, the foremost businessmen's organization of the city, offered to lend its assistance. 
several white employers agreed to try colored help, and one, the Van Camp Packing Company, one of the great concerns of its kind in the country, even fitted up a new plant to be operated wholly by colored people. Last fall, after the season's work was over, one of the officers of the company told me that the Negro plant had been a great success, that the girls had done their work faithfully and with great intelligence. Just recently, a meeting of colored carpenters was held in New York to organize for self-help, and they found that, by bringing pressure to bear, the Brotherhood of Carpenters was perfectly willing to accept them as members of the Union on exactly the same basis as any other carpenters. In short, the Negro is beginning to awaken to the fact that if he is to survive and succeed in northern cities, it must be by his own skill, energy, and organization. For, like any individual or any race, striving for a place in industry or in modern commercial life, the Negro must, in order to succeed, not only equal his competitor, but become more efficient. A Negro contractor said to me, "'Yes, I can get any amount of work, but they expect me to do it a little better and a little cheaper than my white competitors.' Then he added, "'And I can do it, too.' Those are the only terms on which success can be won. For so long a time the Negro has been driven or forced to work, as in the South, that he learns only slowly in an intense impersonal competitive life like that of the North, where work is at a premium, that he himself, not the white man, must do the driving." It is the lesson that raises any man from slavery into freedom. Pullman Porters So much for industry. The Negro in the North has also been going into business and into other and varied employment. The very difficulty of getting hold in the trades and in salaried employment has driven many colored people into small business enterprises grocery stores, tailor shops, real estate, or renting agencies. If they are being driven out by white men as waiters and barbers, they enjoy, on the other hand, growing opportunities as railroad and Pullman porters and waiters, places which are often highly profitable and lead, if the Negro saves his money, to better openings. A Negro banker whom I met in the South told me that he got his start as a Pullman porter. He had a good run, and by being active and accommodating, often made from $150 to $200 a month from his wages and tips. But the same change is going on in the North that I found everywhere in the South. I mean a growing race consciousness among Negroes, the building up of a more or less independent Negro community life within the greater white civilization. Every force seems to be working in that direction. Business Among Boston and Philadelphia Negroes As I have showed, many Negroes in Boston, and indeed in other cities, have made a success in business enterprises which are patronized by white people or rather by both races. Colored doctors and lawyers in Boston have more or less white practice. Of course, colored men who can succeed without reference to their color and do business with both races wish to continue to do so. But the tendency in the North, as in the South, is all against such development and toward Negro enterprises for the Negro population. Even in Boston, numerous enterprises are conducted by Negroes for Negroes. I visited several small but prosperous grocery stores. A Negro named Basil F. Hutchins has built up a thriving undertaking and livery establishment for Negro trade. Charles W. Alexander has a print shop with colored workmen and publishes Alexander's Magazine. 
a new hotel called the Astor House, conducted by Negroes for Negroes, has 250 rooms with telephone service in each room, a large restaurant, and many of the other attractions of a good hotel. But in this growth the North is far behind the South. Scores of Negro banks are to be found in the South, not one in the North. Cities like Richmond, Virginia, Jackson, Mississippi, Nashville, Tennessee, have a really remarkable development of Negro business enterprises. Perhaps I can convey a clearer idea of the great variety of employment of Negroes in northern cities by outlining the condition in a single city, Philadelphia, information for which I am indebted to R. R. Wright, Jr. The census of 1900 shows that out of 28,940 Negro males, boys and men, 21,128 were at work, and out of 33,673 girls and women, 14,095 were wage earners. Here are some of the more numerous occupations of Negro men. Common laborers, 7,690. Servants and waiters, 4,378. Teamsters and hackmen, 1,957. Porters and helpers in stores, 921. Barbers and hairdressers, 444. Messengers and errand boys, 346. Brick and stone masons, 308. Most of these are, of course, low-class occupations the hard wage work of the city in which the men often sink below the poverty line. On the other hand, the census gives these figures. Negro professional men, 415, and women, 170, including doctors, clergymen, dentists, teachers, electricians, architects, artists, musicians, lawyers, journalists, civil engineers, actors, literary and scientific persons, etc., 585. Retail merchants, men, 297, women, 22, 319. Hotel keepers, 13. One Negro runs a men's furnishing store, another a drug store, others, groceries, meats, etc. The Beneficial Society has grown to a regular insurance company. The renting agent has become a real estate dealer. Within the past 12 months, Negroes have incorporated two realty companies, one land investment company, four building and loan associations, one manufacturing company, one insurance company, besides a number of other smaller concerns. The civil service has proved of advantage to the Negro of Philadelphia, as of every other large northern city. In the post office there are about 150 clerks, carriers, and other employees, on the police force about 70 patrolmen, and 40 school teachers, and about 200 persons in other municipal offices. WHEREIN LIES SUCCESS FOR NEGROES I have thus endeavored to present the conditions of the Negro in the North, and show his relationship with white people. I have tried to exhibit every factor, good or bad, which plays a part in racial conditions. Many sinister influences exist. The large increase of ignorant and unskilled Negroes from the South the growing prejudice in the North, both social and industrial, against the Negro, the high death rate and low birth rate among the Negro population, which is due to poverty, ignorance, crime, and an unfriendly climate. On the other hand, many encouraging and hopeful tendencies are perceptible. 
individual negroes are forcing recognition in nearly all branches of human activity entering business life and the professions a new racial consciousness is growing up leading to organizations for self-help and while white prejudice is increasing so is white helpfulness as manifested in social settlements industrial schools and other useful philanthropies all these forces and counterforces economic social religious political are at work we can all see them plainly but we cannot judge of their respective strength it is a tremendous struggle that is going on the struggle of a backward race for survival within the swift moving civilization of an advanced race no one can look upon it without the most profound fascination for its interests as a human spectacle nor without the deepest sympathy for the efforts of ten million human beings to surmount the obstacles which beset them on every hand and what a struggle it is as i look upon it and see this dark horde of men and women coming up coming up a few white men here and there cheering them on a few bitterly holding them back i feel that port arthur and the battle of manchuria bloody as they were are not to be compared with such a conflict as this for this is the silent dogged sanguinary modern struggle in which the combatants never rest upon their arms but the object is much the same the effort of a backward race for a foothold upon this earth for civilized respect and an opportunity to expand and the negro is not fighting russians but americans germans irish english italians jews slavs all those mingling white races each indeed engaged in the same sort of a struggle which make up the nation we call america the more i see of the conflict the more i seem to see that victory or defeat lies with the negro himself as a wise negro put it to me forty years ago the white man emancipated us but we are only just now discovering that we must emancipate ourselves whether the negro can survive the conflict how it will all come out no man knows for this is the making of life itself end of chapter seven end of part two the negro in the north Chapter 8 of Following the Color Line, An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy, by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3. The Negro in the Nation. Chapter 8. The Mulatto. The Problem of Race Mixture. I had not been long engaged in the study of the race problem when I found myself face to face with a curious and seemingly absurd question. What is a Negro? I saw plenty of men and women who were unquestionably Negroes, Negroes in every physical characteristic, black of countenance with thick lips and kinky hair, but I also met men and women as white as I am whose assertion that they were really negroes i accepted in defiance of the evidence of my own senses i have seen blue-eyed negroes and golden-haired negroes one negro girl i met had an abundance of soft straight red hair i have seen negroes i could not easily distinguish from the jewish or french types i once talked with a man i took at first to be a chinaman but who told me he was a negro and i have met several people passing everywhere for white who i knew had negro blood nothing indeed is more difficult to define than this curious physical color line in the individual human being 
legislatures have repeatedly attempted to define where black leaves off and white begins especially in connection with laws prohibiting marriage between the races some of the statutes define a negro as a person with one-eighth or more of negro blood southern people who take pride in their ability to distinguish the drop of dark blood in the white face are themselves frequently deceived several times i have heard police judges in the south ask concerning a man brought before them is this man colored or white just recently a case has arisen at norfolk virginia in which a mrs rosa stone sued the norfolk and western railroad company for being compelled by the white conductor who thought her a negro to ride in a jim crow car having been forced into the negro compartment it remained for a real colored woman who knew her personally to draw the line against her this colored woman is reported as saying lord miss rosa this ain't no place for you you belong in the cars back yonder it appears that mrs stone was tanned curious story of a white man who was expelled as a negro here is a story well illustrating the difficulties sometimes encountered by southerners in deciding who is white and who is colored on march sixth nineteen o seven the atlanta georgian published this account of how a man who it was said was a negro passing for a white man was expelled by a crowd of white men from the town of albany georgia peter ziegler a negro was last night escorted out of town by a crowd of white men ziegler had been here for a month and palmed himself off as a white man he has been boarding with one of the best white families in the city and has been associating with some of albany's best people a visiting lady recognized him as being a negro who formerly lived in her city and her assertion was investigated and found to be correct last night he was carried to forrester station a few miles north of here and ordered to board an outgoing train ziegler has a fair education and polished manners and his color was such that he could easily pass for a white man where he was not known immediately after suffering the indignity of being expelled from albany mr ziegler communicated with his friends and relatives a delegation of whom came from charleston orangeburg and somersville south carolina and proved to the satisfaction of everyone that mr ziegler was in reality a white man connected with several old families of south carolina of this return of mr ziegler the albany herald says the herald yesterday contained the account of the return to albany of peter b ziegler the young man who was forced to leave albany between suns on the night of march fourth the young man upon his return was accompanied by a party composed of relatives and influential friends from his native state of south carolina nothing surely could throw a more vivid light on color line confusions in the south than this story another extraordinary case is that of mrs elsie massey decided in tipton county tennessee after years of litigation in which one side tried to prove that mrs massey was a negro the daughter of a cotton planter named ed barrow and a quadroon slave and the other side tried to prove that she was of pure caucasian blood on june thirteenth nineteen o seven a jury of white men finally declared that mrs massey was white and that she and her children might inherit two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of property such instances as these a few among almost innumerable cases will indicate how difficult it often is to decide who is and who is not a negro the definition of negro here being that used in the south a person having any negro blood no matter how little 
How many mulattoes there are? Few people realize how large a proportion of the so-called Negro race in this country is not really Negro at all, but mulatto or mixed blood, either half-white or quadroon or octoroon, or some other combination. In the last census, 1900, the government gave up the attempt in discouragement of trying to enumerate the mulattoes at all, and counted all persons as Negroes who were so classed in the communities where they resided. The census of 1870 showed that one-eighth, roughly, of the Negro population was mulatto. That of 1890 shows that the proportion had increased to more than one-seventh. But these statistics are confessedly inaccurate. The census report itself says, These figures are of little value. Indeed, as an indication of the extent to which the races have mingled, they are misleading. From my own observation, and from talking and corresponding with many men who have had superior opportunities for investigation, I think it's safe to say that between one-fourth and one-third of the Negroes in this country at the present time have a visible admixture of white blood. At least the proportion is greater than the census figures of 1870 and 1890 would indicate. It is probable that three million persons out of the ten million population are visibly mulattoes. It will be seen, then, how very important a matter it is, in any careful survey of the race problem, to consider the influence of the mixed blood. In the North, indeed, the race problem may also be called a mulatto problem, rather than a negro problem, for in not a few places the mixed bloods are in excess of the darker types. Many mulattoes have a mixed ancestry reaching back to the beginning of civilization in North America, for the Negro slave appeared practically as soon as the white colonist. Many Negroes mixed, and are still mixing in Oklahoma, with the Indians, and one is today often astonished to see distinct Indian types among them. I shall never forget a woman I saw in Georgia as perfect of line as any Greek statue, erect, lithe, strong, with sleek straight hair, the high cheekbones of the Indian, but the lips of the Negro. She was plainly an Indian type, but had no memory of anything but Negro ancestry. A strain of Arab blood from Africa runs in the veins of many Negroes, in others flows the blood of the Portuguese slave-traders, or of the early Spanish adventurers, or of the French who settled in New Orleans, to say nothing of every sort of American white blood. In my classification I have estimated three million persons who are visibly mulattoes. The actual number who have some strain of blood, Arab, Portuguese, Spanish, French, Indian, other than Negro, must be considerably larger. It is a curious problem, this of color. Several times, in different parts of the country, I have been told by both white and colored observers that Negroes, even without the admixture of white blood, were gradually growing lighter, the effect of a cold climate, clothing, and other causes. A tendency toward such a change, an adaptation to new environment, is certainly in accord with the best scientific beliefs, but whether a mere century or two in America has really operated to whiten the blackness of thousands of years of jungle life must be left for the careful scientists to decide. It is certain that the darkest American Negro is far superior to the native African Negro. STORY OF A REAL AFRICAN WOMAN At Montgomery, Alabama, Mr. Craik took me to see a real African woman, one of the very few left who were captured in Africa and brought to this country as slaves. 
She came in The Wanderer, long after the slave trade was forbidden by law, and was secretly landed at Mobile about 1858. She is a stocky, vigorous old woman. She speaks very little English, and I could not understand even that little. She asserts, I am told, that she is the daughter of a king in Africa, and she tells yet of the hardships and alarms of the ocean voyage. Her daughter is married to a respectable-looking Negro farmer. Mr. Craik succeeded, in spite of her superstitious terrors, in getting her to submit to having a picture taken. And yet all these strange-blooded people are classed roughly together as Negroes. I remember sitting once on the platform at a great meeting at the People's Tabernacle in Atlanta. An audience of some twelve hundred colored people was present. A prominent white man gave a brief address in which he urged the Negroes present to accept with humility the limitations imposed upon them by their heredity, that they were Negroes, and that therefore they should accept with grace the place of inferiority. Now, as I looked out over that audience, which included the best class of colored people in Atlanta, I could not help asking myself, what is this blood he is appealing to, anyway? For I saw comparatively few men and women who could really be called Negroes at all. Some were so light as to be indistinguishable from Caucasians. A bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church who sat near me on the platform, was a nephew of Robert Toombs, one of the great men of the South, a leader of the Confederacy. Another man present was a grandson of a famous senator of South Carolina. Several others that I knew of were half-brothers or sisters or cousins of more or less well-known white men and I could not hear this appeal to heredity without thinking of the not-at-all humble southern blood which flowed in the veins of some of these men and women. How futile such advice really was, and how little it got into the hearts of the audience, was forcibly impressed on me afterward by the remark of a mulatto I met. "'They've given us their blood, whether we wanted it or not,' he said." and now they ask us not to respond to the same ambitions and hopes that they have. They have given us fighting blood and expect us not to struggle. Attitude of the Mixed Blood Toward the Black Negroes In the cities of the South, no inconsiderable communities of mulattoes have long existed, many of them highly prosperous. Even before the war, thousands of free persons of color resided in charleston richmond and new orleans in places like charleston they had and still have to some extent an exclusive society of their own which looked down on the black negro with a prejudice equal to that of the white man the census of 1860 shows a population of 3441 free persons of color in charleston alone of whom two thousand five hundred and fifty four were mulattoes in new orleans on the same year lived nine thousand and eighty four free negroes of whom seven thousand three hundred and fifty seven were mulattoes and they were so far distant in sympathy from the slave population that they even tendered their support to the Confederacy at the beginning of the war. But with the Emancipation Proclamation, the aristocratic free person of color, who had formed a sort of third class as between the white above and the black below, lost his unique position. The line was drawn against him. When I went south, I expected to find a good deal of aloofness between the mulatto and the black man. It does exist, but really less today in the South than in Boston. The very first mulatto, a preacher in Atlanta, with whom I raised the question, 
surprised me by denying that the mulatto was in any degree potentially superior to the real negro that if the black man were given the same advantages and environment as the mulatto he would do as well that the prominence of the mulatto is a result of the superior advantages he has long enjoyed being the house servant in slavery times with opportunities for education and discipline that the black man never possessed this was his argument and to support it he gave me a long list of black negroes who had achieved success or leadership i found booker t washington and professor dubois themselves both mulattoes arguing along the same lines in other words the prejudice of white people has forced all colored people light or dark together and has awakened in many ostracized men and women who are nearly white a spirit which expresses itself in the passionate defense of everything that is negro and yet with what pathos what is this race the spirit and the ideals are not negro for the people are not negro even the darkest of them in the sense that the inhabitants of the jungles of africa are negroes the blackest of black american negroes is far ahead of his naked cousin in africa but neither are they white one evening last summer i attended a performance at philadelphia of a negro play called the shoe fly regiment it was written both words and music by two clever mulattoes cole and johnson and it was wholly presented by negroes the audience was large mostly composed of colored people and the laughter was unstinted the point that impressed me was this that the writers had chosen a distinct negro subject the play dealt with two questions of much interest among colored people the matter of industrial education and the negro soldier that it seemed to me was significant it was an effort to appeal to the class consciousness of the negro and yet as i sat and watched the play i could not help being impressed with the essential tragedy of the so-called negro people the players of the company were of every color from the black african type to the mulatto with fair hair and blue eyes in spite of this valiant effort to emphasize certain racial interests one who saw the play could not help asking what after all is this negro race what is the negro spirit is it in this black african or in this white american with the drop of dark blood in a recent address a colored minister of san francisco j hugh kelly said my father's father was a black hawk indian seven feet tall my father's mother was an irish woman my mother's father was an american white man her mother was a full-blooded african woman what am i pathetic desire of negroes to be like white men even among those negroes who are most emphatic in defense of the race there is deep down the pathetic desire to be like the dominant white man it is not unreasonable nor unnatural for all outward opportunity of development lies open to the white man to be colored is to be handicapped in the race for those things in life which men call desirable I remember discussing the race question one evening with a group of intelligent colored men. They had made a strong case for the Negro spirit and the need of the race to stand for itself, but one of them said in a passing remark, what the investigator overhears is often of greater significance than what he hears, speaking of a mulatto friend of his, his hair is better than mine. He meant straighter, more like that of the white man. The same evening, another Negro, referring to a light-complexioned colored man, said, 
Thank God he is passing now for white. At Philadelphia, a dark negro made this comment on one of the colored churches where mulattoes are in the ascendancy. You can't have a good time when you go there unless you have straight hair. This remark indicated not only the ideal held by the speaker, but showed the line drawn by the light-colored man against his darker brother. In the same way, it is almost a universal desire of Negroes to marry whiter, that is, a dark man will, if possible, marry a mulatto woman, the lighter the better. The ideal is whiteness, for whiteness stands for opportunity, power, progress. Give a colored man or woman white blood, educate him until he has glimpses of the greater possibilities of life, and then lock him forever within the bars of color, and you have all the elements of tragedy. Dr. Dubois, in his remarkable book The Souls of Black Folk, has expressed more vividly than any other writer the essential significance of this tragedy. I read the book before I went south, and I thought it certainly overdrawn, the expression of a highly cultivated and exceptional mulatto. But after meeting many Negroes, I have been surprised to find how truly it voices a wide experience. EXPERIENCE OF A HIGHLY EDUCATED MULATTO Dubois tells in this book how he first came to realize that he was really a Negro. He was a boy in school near his home in Massachusetts. Something, he writes, put it into the boys' and girls' heads to buy gorgeous visiting cards, ten cents a package, and exchange. The exchange was merry, till one girl, a tall newcomer, refused my card, refused it peremptorily with a glance. Then it dawned upon me with a certain suddenness that I was different from the others, or like, mayhap, in heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil. I had therefore no desire to tear down that veil, to creep through. I held all beyond it in common contempt, and lived above it in a region of blue sky and great wandering shadows. That sky was bluest when I could hear my mates at examination time, or beat them at a foot race, or even beat their stringy heads. Alas, with the years all this fine contempt began to fade, for the worlds I longed for, and all their dazzling opportunities, were theirs, not mine. With other black boys, the strife was not so fiercely sunny. Their youth shrunk into tasteless sycophancy or into silent hatred of the pale world about them, and mocking distrust of everything white, or wasted itself in a bitter cry, Why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in mine own house? The shades of the prison house closed around about us all. Walls straight and stubborn to the whitest, but relentlessly narrow, tall, and unscalable to sons of night who must plod darkly on in resignation, or beat unavailing palms against the stone, or steadily, half-hopelessly, watch the streak of blue above. If space permitted, I could tell many stories illustrative of the daily tragedy which many mulattoes are meeting in this country, struggles that are none the less tragic for being inarticulate. Here is a letter which I received not long ago from a mulatto professor in a western Negro college. I wonder how you will treat that point to which you have thus far only referred in your studies, where does the color line really begin? What is to become of that large class of which I am a part, that class which is neither white nor black, and yet both? There are millions of us who have the blood of both races, and if heredity means anything, who have the traditions, feelings, and passions of both. Yet we are black in name, in law, in station, 
in everything save face and figure, despite the overwhelming white blood. And why? Certainly not because we have to be. America is a big country. It is easy to get lost, even in a neighboring state. Some of us do, and the process has been going on so long in certain large cities of the North until we cease to think about it. But the majority of us stay and live and work out our destiny among the people into whom we were born, living oft times side by side with our white brothers and sisters. When I go back to Atlanta after an absence of two years, I can, if I wish, go back in a Pullman, go out of the main entrance of the station, get my dinner at the Piedmont Hotel, and when I am tired of being Mr. Hyde, I can stroll down Auburn Avenue with my friends in the full glory of Dr. Jekyll. As a matter of fact, I shall doubtless avail myself of the privilege of a sleeper, sneak out the side entrance, get on the last seat of the car, despite the conductor's remonstrance, go on to my friends at once, and be myself all the time I am there. I wouldn't be a white man if I had to. I want to be black. I want to love those who love me. I want to help those who need my help. And I know hundreds just like me. I know others who are not. I wonder if you can decide where does the color line really end? A Negro Who Lived First as a White Man, Then as a Negro When I was in Philadelphia, I met an intelligent Negro named A. L. Manley, who is at present the janitor of a large apartment house. He has been connected with the good government movement in Philadelphia, being the leader of a club of colored men who have supported the Reform Party. When I first met him, I should not have known him for a Negro, he is so white. His white grandfather was a famous governor of North Carolina, Charles Manley. He was educated at Wilmington, North Carolina, and at Hampton Institute. For a time he published a Negro newspaper at Wilmington, but during the race riot in that city a number of years ago, he was driven out and his property was destroyed, his office being burned to the ground. After a year or two in Washington, he came to Philadelphia, where he endeavored to get work at his trade as a painter and decorator, but the moment he informed employers that he was a colored man, they refused to hire him usually excusing themselves on the ground that union labor would refuse to work with him. "'So I tried being white,' he said. "'That is, I did not reveal the fact that I had colored blood, and I immediately got work in some of the best shops in Philadelphia. I joined the union and had no trouble at all.' But during all this time he had to live, as he says, the life of a sneak, he had to sneak out of his home in the morning and return to it only after nightfall, lest someone discover that his family, he had a wife and two children, was colored. The thing finally became unbearable, he said. No decent man could stand it. I preferred to be a negro and hold up my head rather than to be a sneak. So he dropped his trade and became a janitor. In other words, he stepped back, as so many Negroes in the North are forced to do, into a form of domestic service, although in his case the position of one of responsibility and good pay. Such stories of the problem of the mulatto are innumerable, and yet I do not wish to imply that the life is all shadow, for it isn't. The Negro blood, wherever it is, supplies an element of light-heartedness which will not be wholly crushed. It is this element, indeed, that accounts in no small degree for the survival of the Negro in this country. Where the Indian perished for want of adaptability, the Negro has survived by sheer elasticity of temperament. 
it is perhaps the highest natural gift of the negro race one hears much of the unfavorable traits of the negro but certainly judging from any point of view the power of adaptability displayed by the negro in a wholly foreign environment under the harshest conditions and his ability to thrive and increase in numbers even meeting the competition of the dominant race and to keep on laughing at his work is a power which in any race would be regarded as notable end of part 1 of chapter 8